figured we might, you know, spend the first 10 minutes or whatever talking about that funny thing with that, that Resident Evil 4 video, yeah? I thought you were going to say we're going to spend the first 10 minutes talking about 65 and then move on <laughs> to the other movies. We could possibly talk about that movie for that long, Rags. What do you mean? I'm sure we can think of something. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll, it'll be talked about, no problem. Um, because, yeah, we, it, I don't think there needs to be much uh, chatter about the old... Um, like, like Mercenaries Mode was going to be talked about. It's... Um, Maybe maybe that could be sequestered here along with that other topic. Because I was going to say that like is good. Yeah, if you want, I haven't, you know? I haven't played it yet, so it's good. It's 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 what you'd expect, and I want more stuff in it. That's it all works. Fun with it. Yeah, um, I think I've S plus everybody. I've only uh, S plus. Well, I was about to say only. The only person I haven't S plus plus is Luis. Um, the Reality was that um, I really like playing as uh, Krauser and Hunk, and to the point where I wouldn't mind having them unlocked for campaign just to see how the game plays with their their uh, crazy approach. That's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. But uh, Luis, it's cool that he's in there and that you can play as him. But I don't know. I was like, he's a bit slow, uh, and I think that's deliberate, right? Like to try and mix it up in terms of what power everyone has. Um, but I didn't feel I like his. His damage compensates for that. He has, um, you might have the biggest damage move out of everybody that that TNT drop, but it's um, yeah, it's but rare. I, I found the melee attack kind of weird as well. It kind of locks you in a bit too much. Like it feels um, the pipe. Like it kind of, yeah, it kind of locks into like a lengthy animation that doesn't seem to have as great of it. Like it, yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, because, like, Leon's obviously, like, a great all-rounder, and then Krauser is super-duper fun, especially with his, like, power-up. Um, and his knife is really useful as well. And then Hunk was cool as well. Yeah, I thought um, Hunk was like, cool. Just sort of, it's just all about, like, blasting people with as many bullets and and oh, having the, the instant um, kill for melee attacks is, like... It's kind of traded off because, like, Leon and Krauser, like, the good thing with the melee attack is the area of effect, getting multiple enemies. Yeah. Uh, Hunk only gets one, but but it means that you can stun and instantly kill, like, um, uh, big sort of mini-boss enemies. So that's that's super useful. Mm-hmm. Um, I find that uh, the, the helps... It's, it's kind of a funny trade-off in terms of how long it takes to kill the average ganado but then like it's, like it's been said uh any of the main bosses you can insta kill but the krauser's um krauser's special ability is amazing it can kill most of the specials in like four hits uh mm. slices through them and that's a huge area of effect as well so plenty of fun also, to be his had bow, his bow is awesome his bow is awesome that's true and that's it, like a totally new thing not yeah in, it's uh, stuff campaign. like that i'm like man don't you want to put that in like the main campaign in some way in special well, mode right? you made it you yeah. designed it, you know, you created it, might as well. Got a good shot and everything. So, yeah, um, I guess you could say that's like the addendum to talking about how Resident Evil 4 Remake was a banger. Good stuff. Well, hopefully they add some uh, more characters, right? Like, it wouldn't surprise me if they add Ada as, like, a playable character. Mm-hmm. Now, the reason what this has been set as a foundation is that uh, someone else happens. I've already seen it. It's already been mentioned in Super Chats. I think, I think it's making its rounds of the internet. I saw it thanks to... um. I think it's an account on Twitter called she's Susie Hunter. She's she's done a lot of Resident Evil Four stuff. She had a lot of. Um... That, would ex that would explain why I haven't seen many Susies around here lately. Yeah, she's been hunting them. But I think that she was like very very happy with the game, and she's done a lot of coverage and a lot of cool Easter eggs been covered by her. And she posted a picture of um, Probe Cat's YouTube channel, saying, "Oh great, now I'm gonna get shit tons of comments about how wrong I am about the game," which seemed something like that. It seemed a little bit defensive, and I was like, "Hey, you know, what's this?" We check the good old, uh, good old name of it. For those who don't know, Crow Cat makes really awesome videos. That's the uh, a strong summary. Yeah, he, he, he's like commentaryless, right? Like that's the idea. Usually, it's um, the commentary comes through in the editing and the choices of like footage being displayed. You know, like one-to-one -one comparisons, um, like developer interviews and stuff, like sort of filtering in. Yeah. So you'll um. You like show the one that I remember. I think you you showed me it was like um, Halo, how it was made before. Yeah, it was, made it was now. Uh, Bungie. Yeah, like Bungie uh, compared to three four three Industries, and it was just showing like uh, the way that the developers would talk about development 
um, and how like Bungie would often talk about the rationale behind the choices, whereas 343 would just kind of like say the choice that they made and why and that it was good. Mm. <laughs> like and um and then obviously like a lot of a lot of really like great statements about um just like attitudes on video game development and like the attitude that Bungie had versus 343. And it's like, yeah, I really like that video. Um, I like a lot of the videos he's made. So, you know. Why ever would you mention Crobcat? Well, the... the Maker of amazing those, videos. Those awesome videos with, with clips and contexts that can be compared and you can you see points being made. I remember watching his one on... Um, I, th I can't remember if it, if it was all about Far Cry or if it was about... Uh, it was about Far Cry 2 versus 5 and how, like, Far Cry 2 has a lot of, um, like, baked into the engine kind of interesting gameplay details of, like, the way that you could affect the environment. Like, just attention to detail and level of detail that's kind of missing mm -hmm. in later games. Though yes. later games, like, look better visually, a lot of the interactivity is reduced. And, and you can see that in a lot of the comparisons between, like, Dead Rising 1 versus 4, of just, like, really, like, pulling back the, the amount of, like, interactivity and, like, physics and crazy stuff in there. And so, it was a bit of a surprise to know that he was making a video that tries to, um, all I'd heard without any seeing any of it was that he's, uh, he's going after RE4 Remake. And it's like, okay. And even, even in, mm. with that thought in mind, it's like, well, we went after it a little bit. You know, we, we, we went hard on certain parts, you know, so maybe, it's maybe... Got some, yeah, it's got some things that could definitely change to tighten up. And I could see Crowcat being someone who might highlight similar things to us. And then I, uh, I see maybe. what the video is called, which is this. It's, uh, Soul versus Soulless. Resident Evil 4 uh -oh. comparison. And we were like, oh no. Oh, Soulless. No. That's not. Uh, I don't know about that. That seems a bit much. And um, funnily enough, we did actually watch it. Uh, just checked it out, and it's it's a similar vein of his, his other videos. But the idea is just every moment in the game that's in both of them. You know, in terms of where you go or what dialogue is said, he just plays them back to back. Now, the description said this is a one-sided critical analysis, basically of you know Resident Evil Four good, Resident Evil Four remake bad. It was like oh. And you get critical the critical analysis is interesting phraseology. Well, it's also like very obvious. If anyone's familiar with both games, he'll like uh, he's presented everything that is in Resident Evil Four that is not in the remake as like an option, be it in terms of levels or uh, interactions. He hasn't presented anything that's new and added. Hasn't presented anything in the sense that like there's an improvement. And the big thing uh, that G Man Lives pointed out on Twitter that was a little bit worrying was if you look at the comments of the video. At least they were. I don't know if they still are. A lot of people were like, "Wow, you know, it's such a downgrade in terms of the ambience and the, you know, sound effects and stuff. Sound design is incredibly important in video games, and it's like they've lost that in the new one." But it was really odd because I don't remember there being like no ambience in the remake. It was. It was I don't remember. Like, I was I was playing it seconds ago, just fiddling around, and there was definitely ambience in it. It was just it was odd because there'd be you you'd have like a scene from the original where like the. Uh, the ambient sound is like very noticeable. Mm. You can hear like the wind; it's very loud. Or like the I think one of the best comparisons would be when he's out near the church. The rain is heavy. Yeah. There's thunder strikes, and it's just it's it's very it's very good. Is is kind of where I was going with that. Yeah. Then he'll show the remake, yeah. and it'll just be like silent. It's like that is strange. Yeah, um, like I don't remember it being silent. <laughs> and then uh, yeah, G Man lives just like he just fucking pulled it all down like by twenty decibels. Is a uh, yeah, the decibels uh, levels don't seem to just match between the clips. And so, like, he cranks it like, back up, and you play the same scenes, and you're like, oh, there's the ambience, yeah. All right, well, this is uh, <laughs> this is becoming really know, awkward. I'm not sure what to make of that. And then, uh, you know, like, near the end of the video, he'll be like, look at this room that we didn't get, this room that we didn't get, from, like, RE4. And it was funny, because uh, being as familiar as uh, certainly myself and Rags are, we, we started being like, well, I don't miss that room. <laughs> it's like that's okay. Mm -hmm. That it was like the room with the fucking swinging. Um, I don't even know what weapons they're called, but let's the just pendulums. Yeah, like those the little pendulum blades. Um, it's such a goofy ass room, and it's not like mechanically interesting. You just have to wait, move forward, wait, move forward. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we lost that soulless. It's like what? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, yeah. So something that was really strange watching it is that like. You, you compare it to a lot of the other sort of one-to-one -one comparison videos he's done where it's, like, very apparent, like, what has changed and what has been missing, like, Gears 1 versus yeah. Gears 5. 
Mm. And and particularly because of the the title of that video was Gears Five Lacks Intensity, I believe. And like the the main comparison is that the animations and a lot of the effects in the original game are very weighty. And in the new one, it's a lot quicker. It's not as it's not as weighty. It's all been like sped up, and and something's been lost, and it's very apparent. Whereas here would be like an area in Resident Evil Four original that looks really cool, and then the same area in Resident Evil Remake that looks really cool, but it looks different because it's a different you know engine, different um, lighting in a lot of the scenes. And it's just like wait, like I don't know. They both look good. Like they both look good in their own ways. Um, and then you know there are times when it's like the original sort of retains like a, a has like a look that's more striking but then there are times when the remake has a look that's more striking mm -hmm. and so you're sitting there like like i don't understand the soulless part like well imagine both really good. <laughs> imagine saying uh soul versus soulless but reversing it being like they finally added soul into resident evil 4 and then they showed like I don't know, Luis's story, of being like, you see, they've added soul to it now. I'd just be like, what are you, well, what are you doing? Well, because there were parts where the comparisons were like, the crowds are fighting the original versus the remake, and like, it compared the part where Ada saved uh, Leon from Krauser, and, and, then, and then it cut to the part where Luis saved Leon, and it's like, dude, like, the, that's better than Luis payoff, like, it's, in the crowd. It's so much more fight. coherent the uh louise storyline like um well exactly. and, and uh take for example the end credits they've taken what their idea was with the showing what happened to the village and they've they've like perfected it it's it's pretty much at the point now you don't need to change it at all because it was it seemed like probably a, a really cool series of art but it's like a smaller element in the um the og game in the new one it's like fully cinematic they've done a really good job of like uh yeah. making sure that atmosphere hits um and it's just like but no, nothing nothing in terms of like what you could say the remake's done better is uh it's funny, some of them are present in the video, like you just said, but they're presented as though it's still worse somehow. It's like, okay. Well, the problem is that the problem is that when it's called Soul versus Soulless. Yeah. And there's the, a very the clear the implication. Way, but we look at the original, then we look at the remake. Like that that's generally the way that it's presented. Like obviously that's the way I'm gonna be looking at like the <laughs> points of comparison. Yeah, and as someone just mentioned in chat, I forgot to say, like in his description, he was like, you know, come to your own conclusion. And it's like you, we uh, usually, usually <laughs> the poison make, the well there on that one. Yeah. Well, usually, usually he'll make a statement. Like usually he makes a statement um about the comparisons that he's doing. It's it's a bit much for me to be like one of them is soulless. Come to your own decisions. It's like why do you even put that in there if you're gonna do it that way? And yeah, the uh, the way that the clips are edited together is not, for lack of a better term, objective. He's not simply presenting them. He's uh, you have to pick and choose exactly what ones you're going to include if the video is half an hour. And yeah. they're very deliberate. Um, well, so and, and, I mean, it's called a one-sided. It was called a one-sided comparison, and and highlighted by the fact that at the end it only shows the stuff that was missing from the remake, and it doesn't show the new things that the remake added, like brand new sequences. Yeah. Um, there was no comparison for target practice as well, which is funny because I think I said when we were watching it, mm. the majority of people would say that's been improved. <laughs> we would likely be the only people to say it's actually been fucked up, <laughs> but no. like. I think if you play it casually, you'd probably be like, it's very much improved. But he didn't even bring it up at all. Um, I think it's because it would be hard to present them both and say the remake is the soulless one, you know? Uh, it's it's yeah. not going to really fit, is it? So, mm. this video didn't go over well with a lot of people, and you started getting... Uh, very poorly, yeah. A big chunk of dislikes, oh, as well as... For, uh, a crowd cat. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, and it's, it's annoying, too, because you got a lot of people on Twitter being like, well, yeah, it's crowd cat. He makes shit videos. It's like, no, he doesn't. No, <laughs> like, no, he, no doesn't. he doesn't. He does not. So, yeah, I was seeing, like, a huge circle jokes about how uh, bad the video is. But at least, right, it's his perspective. He's presented it. He still could argue that he maybe balked a bit of it, blah, blah, blah. But at least, you know, that's his opinion, and he's sticking to it. Only, I just found out today. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit different now, the uh, the old video. I'll send, uh, mm -hmm. I should have sent you guys the before as well, I will now, but I'm showing Wait it on the screen. Wait a second. That's Wait what it says second. now. It used to say this, um, oh, but now no. it says this, which no. is Resident Evil 4 Remake is a masterpiece. <gasps> so, well, that's not what you said before. That's like the opposite <coughs> of what you said before. In this video, we're looking at how the Resident Evil 4 Remake improved over the original while still keeping the soul. So he's obviously very mad. <laughs> the people thought the video was unfair. I don't know what to make of that. 
Like I'm not sure. I feel like I feel like there's I don't know. <laughs> that is an odd one. I uh I guess he just thought that I don't know if he was I'm Crobe Cat, I can do no wrong. Look at all my videos. Everyone always agrees with me, so I can put this out about the remake. Or maybe he just really doesn't like the remake for whatever reason. Or maybe people are caught up in the new I equals bad. So. The thing, that's what I'm interested in. That's what, because, like, a lot of his videos are, like, a point of comparison of, strangely enough, on, like, less powerful technology, an older game, like, managed to get these things that, like, the newer game lost. And, like, that's, like, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, like, I, I guess I'm, like, because I am baffled on this one, of, like, saying that the remake is soulless. I, I just don't Yeah, I don't it's a really that strange perspective to have. Like, if there are ways that you think it's worse, like, sure, obviously. I mean, we even talked about it, right, like, in the coverage. Like, it's not, it's not like, a strict improvement on the original. Um, in a lot of ways, it's quite a different game. But, like, Soulless is not a way that I would describe that game. Like, that game was clearly made with well, the, love for the original. Oh, yeah. This, a lot of people have taken this to mean that he's, like, trying to cover from, cover his own ass, right? Like, escape. Like, I, I never said it was Soulless. It's great. It's great. But, like, I don't think... I, I think it's a little bit too blatant for that. Seems to me like more of a very defensive, like, oh, fuck you guys. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, sure, it's a masterpiece. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, sure, yeah. The remix are a masterpiece and improves upon the original, know. sure. It's really tough to say. I don't know what I think about it. I don't know if this is like a... Because, like, I, like in, in a sense, it doesn't come across as, like, buckling, but maybe? I don't know. <laughs> um, But, it, I mean, it'll definitely staunch the... um. The, the bleeding of reputation, at least. Uh, yeah, or or a, it's, could it backfire? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't see this as, like, something that will benefit him. I'd no. Say. I, th I, I, th I think he's uh, he probably considers himself quite an enormous, passionate fan of RE4 and that the remake no fucked up in a whole bunch of ways and that he would categorize it as it's lost its soul. Um, that probably is genuinely how he feels. I just don't think he's got very good arguments for it. Yeah, well, I don't even know what the arguments were. Coming through in the comparison, because, yeah, it's just like a lot of the time, it's like, yeah, they both look good. Like, this yeah, is a... I, I mean, this, this is, yeah, that one's not as good. Oh, well, that one's better. <laughs> like, you yeah, know. <laughs> it's a whole collection, and you almost yeah. need his commentary to help explain to me that's... what I'm supposed to be seeing. Yeah, that's the mm -hmm. thing. This is a time where the lack of, like, narration... Which is or, rare, you know, you know, like, it's really one of the most... Just... Like, I don't know what he's thinking. What do you mean? What are you trying to tell me? Which is, which is so interesting because, like, when it, something that I found so impressive about his video making is that he doesn't need commentary. Like, the editing is so precise and the, and the usage of references is so precise that you know what's being communicated. Yeah. Um, he often doesn't need even, like, text to explain what, uh, like, what, he, what, he's, what point he's trying to make. But here, it was just like, I was lost. Like, I didn't understand the comparisons at all. In terms of th through the lens of one is soulful and one is soulless, you know. Yeah, if he had contextualized it as um, you know, it lost a little bit of its soul along the way or something, I think people would be fine with it. But oh well, soulless. Yeah, it's yeah. But I guess I guess now I'm curious, like what? Because because the video was uploaded yesterday, I saw it in my feed yesterday. Now it's only a day later and this has already happened. What is the continually evolving <laughs> conversation going to look like or subsequent videos? Well, and, and the thing about it is, like, no matter what the motive was, how does it look? It's like, well, it looks like uh, he's spineless, unfortunately. It looks bad, yeah. Um, it, it, because, because at first you, it would just be like, you know, like, oh yeah, you, you, I guess you didn't make, like, a very good video, which, you know, like, that happens. Um... Okay, so if we could have a look, right? You know, Top comment. One thing I sure do miss is the diegetic and creative menu systems. So many games these days just have black rectangles. It's like, yeah, that's fair. I think that's mm -hmm. fine. Sure. Next one. I love oh. how the original description said, come to your own conclusions. And after people disagreed with his, he changed the title and description completely. Right. Like, that's what, what the is... takeaway is. Well, yeah, it's, it's hard probably... for that not to be what your mind instantly jumps to. The reality is that this was going to be, this was always going to be, like, a, a difficult one, because everybody really likes this game. This isn't like Dead Rising 4, where it seemed like people were not, like, excited or happy about that one. Uh, or, like, Gears, where a lot of people have a lot of attachments to the older games, and the newer ones not so much. Like, not, not to say that it's, like, an instant slam dunk, right? You need good references and everything, but, like, in this case, 
Like, everybody's really, for the most part, really enjoying the remake. This was always going to be a hard case to argue. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's a hard case to argue because I just don't think it's soulless. <laughs> like, it, it definitely think. isn't soulless. There's definitely things it, I don't like about I, the remake, but you, you just can't argue that it's soulless, I don't think. That's why I'll... Just been, I think it just would have been better off, like, just doing, like, a, a, just, just having a Resident Evil 4 versus remake comparison. Old you know, versus new, or like I don't think there's anything remake, wrong with, yeah. uh, with the desire to have a comparison of the games, like especially considering they're twenty years apart. Um, in a lot of ways, they're quite different, and then it could be interesting to see what's the same, what's different, the ways that it's you know like for like in terms of quality, better or worse at times. I think that's worthwhile. But yeah, soul versus soulless. I don't. Which it's so yeah. many comments are pointing that out, and then you got uh, I disagree with the original video, but changing the title and description is just absolutely pathetic. That's uh, yeah, kind of. Um, I think so. If you can still think you're right, that's fine. But I would legitimately, like, want to know why you think the new one's soulless. It's so strange, like, though. Really? I really would like Tell to know me. why he called it soul versus soulless and then said, draw your own conclusions. Like, if you wanted to draw people to draw their own conclusions, wouldn't it just be Resident Evil 4 comparison? That's what the title should have been. And even then, you would have been able to tell which one he preferred because of the way that he edited the clips. Um... But maybe if he really wanted it to seem as if it was draw your own conclusions and maybe you, you wouldn't be able to tell. Well, I was going to say we would because of the fact that he, he included all of the things that are in the original that aren't in the remake, but he didn't include oh, the things that are that in the remake part. that aren't yeah, in the yeah, original. Yeah, yeah the, I mean, if he really he really liked that minigun room in the castle, I guess, but I don't know. That's probably the the one out of all the ones he showed that I would not want to return. I did not like the mini. Didn't care mini for it, part. no. If you kill that... um. That priest, before he makes it downstairs, you don't have to do that. and Yeah, you know, and that can be very difficult to do if you don't have a rifle. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'd just be curious to know what, what else he has to say about, about this, because uh, he doesn't usually miss at all, right? That's like his thing. No, this is, uh, this is the odd crow cat uh, big L, as we say. Unfortunate. Hey. That's all right, mm. you know. That's okay, the man. The RE4 remake discourse has been strange. I don't think anyone expected it to be as good as it is. I think that might have been, uh, or threw everyone off a little bit. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Because uh, I'm still happy to say the original's better. It's just that, like, I mean, especially after the RE3 they... remake, a lot of people were like, this is going to be bad. Especially because RE4 is just such a fucking great game. Like, how do you, how do you remake it's that? It's a really well? good game. That one's really tough to top. And I prefer the original, and I think the original's better, but there's so much care and effort and, dare I say, soul, that really did well go into soul. the remake. I'd hate, I'd, I'd hate to I, just I write really, it off. I really like and respect both of those games. Mm -hmm. as a, I mean, very, very relative newcomer to Resident Evil 4 specifically. Both of those games are cool. And now, move on to... <laughs> Topic one, I guess, so the little platoon can speak <laughs> instead of just being yeah. like, "What the fuck's going on? What are these video games these kids are playing?" Oh no, it, it's it's my fault. I have never touched a Resident Evil game in my life ever, which is I'm aware a big deficiency. Um, you probably so like RE4 remake, to be honest. With you yeah, be... the the original and the remake are quite good. We jump right. You have in. to have played the other ones. I assume that you would have to. No. <laughs> oh. Oh, no. well, in that case... I had a friend who was like, so I gotta play all the Resident Evils, all their remakes to get to Resident Evil 4 Remake, and I was like, nope, you can just go right to it. There's no reason that... And he's like, yeah, but what about the story? It's like, um... <laughs> I mean, you know, knowing, knowing who Leon and Ada are, I guess, is something. Knowing something. something. Uh, You're all right. You knowledge. don't need to. You'll be fine. Uh, anyway... We're gathered here today to discuss a very interesting set of three movies, three new ones. One that is the talk of the town, one that is not at all the talk of the town, and that's unfortunate, and one that is not at all the talk of the town, and that's fine. And nobody, nobody, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the way to sum it up, I guess. Because, uh, uh, yeah. They have so much in common, these movies. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Basically two of them so. are about video games. Well, one of them is about video games, one of them is based on a video game, and one of them is not none of those. But yes, <laughs> They're different movies. you've heard it discussed previously, very likely, but number one is the Mario movie. Something that we've mm -hmm. been, um, I don't know, not looking forward to for a long time on this podcast. Partial mentions, we, we just assume it's going to get annihilated, destroyed, especially after the voice acting roles were revealed. And so here it is. 
we're just going to talk a little bit about what it was, what it did, mm. and where it sits. I because I, like, I'm I'm half and half interested in talking about the movie itself, but also what it means going forward, like the meta surrounding this thing. Same here. Um. So I don't know. Where do we start? Do we go with? Uh, Why don't Plot we start with like? Well, would, do, do we might it be worthwhile to start with like familiarity with Mario? Uh, sure. I mean, I don't know if because it, it, uh, it could be dumb. Like, I I don't think we need to do like a huge breakdown on this thing in terms of like uh everyone's histories and stuff. I I'm also looking to you know cover three movies in one thing, so <laughs> okay, to cool. make sure yeah. we can right. be. I I'll probably just go with like the a lot of people have seen this thing. Apparently, it's um. Uh yes, it is the already in a week the highest grossing uh video game adaptation. It is the biggest opening for an animated film ever. Uh, I just saw by the way, it's estimated to make eighty million domestic second weekend, which is uh forty five percent drop. So That's this, a... film is, this film is Smaller going to make average. a lot of money. It's smaller than a Marvel movie, that's for sure. Um, I mean, it yeah. was it was it was always gonna make a lot of money. Now it's more of a question of just how much money we is this film gonna make. Uh, billion is like a guarantee, but it, it always really was. So the question is like, well, now how much money is it gonna make? And how long will they keep it in cinemas as well? Uh, and of course, what does this kind of success? mean for video game adaptations going forward uh it's it's a big deal is what it is yes uh so before it came out we we assumed it would be making a lot of money and then after i watched it i was yeah. like oh shit yeah. they've done they've done all the things they needed to do to um make this thing probably a foundation for a shit ton of things to come but uh it's still getting yeah, different right. kinds of responses from all different parts of the internet for uh, example uh, of uh, critics have famously not been very interested in this one, like Rotten Tomato um, level critics. They and people have been like, like they're always wrong or right or what. It, like it's always so funny to see the scramble over. Um, they'll use like past examples. See, critics said this movie was bad when the audience knew it was good, and then people were like, yeah, but there's been films where critics said it was bad and the audience said it was good and the critics were right. And then it's just like, mm. you, you know, you eventually realize like, oh yeah, it doesn't mean anything. Um, not really. There's <laughs> there's interesting things to be gleamed from them, but not in terms of like a meaningful, like a thing that should actually inform like your perspective, you know, and like yeah. you figuring out what you think about the film in terms of its quality. Because a lot of the reviews, like a lot of the more negative reviews, tend to just sort of like hit the same beats. It's too focused on Easter eggs and the the, the plot's thin. Um, like it's it's there's not much being said really. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the very straightforward that you have the Grace Randolph being like that Tanuki oh, suit God, what wasn't explained say? or something. Oh that's what I'm yeah. <laughs> Either, I mean, I'd be like, geez, if honey, we, if we do not say that, that not on the internet. That's going to get you in so oh. much trouble. Don't say it. <laughs> like the cat suit wasn't properly set up. It's just like she's going to get fucking minced. Uh, video game movie about Italian plumbers. It's true. So it's um it's a wacky what does this count as? Fantasy? Um Um Yeah, probably. I mean right. you probably just call it like adventure, right? Action adventure fantasy. Surely you gotta involve something to account for all of the insane magic and uh creatures. Uh, from I don't world. know that I've ever I don't know that I've ever thought about whether Mario was like fantasy or science fiction, to be honest. Well like Star <laughs> Fox and Metroid are sci fi, aren't they? Uh, well, sure, but like you know, those Mario Karts and all you know, like all the all the crazy technology and stuff, <clears throat> like Super Mario Galaxy, is that fantasy or is that science fiction? I'd say that's probably science fiction, right? Yeah, it might be. I mean, it's not like Mario yeah. can't be both. Science fantasy, maybe. Maybe well, it's a space opera. <laughs> People like that word. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, so for people who don't know, the basic plot summary is just. Mario and Luigi are plumbers in Brooklyn, and they're trying to make money and start up their business. And then they get sucked into the Mushroom Kingdom. Bowser kidnaps Luigi. Mario teams up with Peach to save the day, and they do. Yep, that's more. Yes, yeah, pretty uh, much. That's more or less it. Um, that's, uh, I, that's about right. I guess DK's there as well, and he, he does join the team, like <laughs> and Toad. Mm -hmm. You know, like there, there's other stuff, but that Toad and Donkey Kong, yeah. It's um an incredibly straightforward storyline uh, that. Is probably on purpose. They they were probably like making sure they don't want to do anything too complicated. Just make it 
very consumable. Mm. Um, and the, I guess a question is, is that, was that the correct decision to go to? Not only for like making the most money, but for also just an artistic point of view. Is Mario not capable of more? And just how well did they manage to pull off that storyline? I believe, Little Platoon, you have, um, you have a vaguely controversial take on the film, right? Or at least it has been in terms <laughs> of, of how it was to, received. To like uh, the one sentence statement for everybody. Well, well I, I, was, I was that was just a prompt for him to <laughs> talk about his video. No, you know, I'll, I'll plug the video all the way. No, it, it was one of those videos that sort of said, "Well, look, okay, if all you want from this is fun little sort of member berry stuff, Easter eggs, and basically no plot." then okay, it's good mindless fun. But given the potential of the source material and given what it will almost certainly be leading to in this huge slate of Nintendo films coming down the line, I don't think that it was enough. I think it wasted a huge amount of its potential. It burned through probably four or five films worth of storytelling potential in just one film mm. in the bid, in, in a bid to get as many Easter eggs on screen as possible. And I don't think that it's particularly memorable. So, that, you know, there's a reason that Mario games are iconic and there's a reason that they are so well beloved and they're so memorable. And that's because a lot of thought, time, care, and attention went into how they were created to make them very distinct. You've got narrative storytelling devices used in level design. I think it's the Kisha Tenketsu example, which is the one I sort of went to, but there are others as well. A lot of thought goes into making these things feel very distinctively like Mario. And then the Mario film comes out, and it feels very distinctively like any other generic animated film in terms of its story, which is a shame. And it means that while we'll still like remember happily playing Mario 64 back in the 90s, I reckon if anyone gets to Christmas and this film is really fixed in the front of their mind and attached to a lot of you know really loving memories, I'd be very surprised if that happened. I don't think people will actually remember the film, except for the fact that they saw it and it was kind of enjoyable, mindless fun. But apparently that means I hate fun, and <laughs> so yeah, I'm wrong, obviously. Well, yeah, we got uh, the... You don't be having a good time talking about this film with everybody. You said if you're not having a good time. A lot of like, it sounds like you've got a lot of pushback. Is all. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, I kept going out of my way to say, look, it's it's fine. I can see that bits of it are really fun. I enjoy bits of it. Great, that's okay. That doesn't sort of countermand the the main point, which is that mindless fun is, you know, it could have been so much more than just mindless fun, that you could have had a really, really enjoyable film. It's not enough to say most people, you know, go to the same set of arguments, and because they do this, I put them in the introduction to the video so I could tell whether commenters had actually watched the video before commenting. Um, and the usual arguments are, it's just fun, you sh why can't you just enjoy it? It's a kid's film, so it doesn't need story. Um, why do you expect so much from a video game adaptation? The game had no plot, so the film doesn't need plot. Um, what were the others? There were a few others like that, um, which, you know, they're, they're all pretty easy to bat away. And people, yeah, people just sort of assume that you, know, you have to either absolutely love this thing or you absolutely hate it. You can't simply say, okay, it was okay for what it was, but it should have been better. That is interpreted as you hate the film, which I didn't. I didn't hate the film. There wasn't enough in the film for me to hate it. Um, that's kind of the problem. It didn't really elicit any strong feelings either way. Soul versus soulless is probably a more <laughs> accurate uh, description for I, this one. I think that's uh, that is interesting too because like uh, I've presented like lukewarm defenses where I find like arguments I don't think are very great against the film, but it'll be interpreted as I love the film. It's like no, not even mm. close. Um, I think it's love neat, is a very but... strong word in this uh, in this podcast circle. We we put a lot of a. Uh... Put a lot of stock on the word love. Yeah. Put a lot of stock on the word great. Um, yeah, when we say something's and, good, that's like... Oh. And it's it's something that you've already touched on a little platoon, but like, the, the you know, you compare this to like The Incredibles or, mm -hmm. you know, Finding Nemo or like Shrek 2 or something or The Iron Giant or The Lion King, right? Like, it doesn't, let's be real, like it's not, it's not stacking up like super well compared to those films. Um, I get the impression that it was, uh, the, the way that it seems like it's often, this film is spoken about positively is, um, kind of like the statement, uh, it could have been better, but it could have been worse too. I just like flip the order in terms of like the tone that I'd like to have. It could have been worse, but it could have been better, you know? Like it, this, this could have been better. Uh, of course it could have been better, but, um, it's, uh, like... I, I think, like, when, when a lot of people have heard it's, like, it's going to be Illumination, it's like, ah, right. Because, like, Illumination, like, make very, um, 
they like they know how to make movies that like people go to and enjoy and make lots of money but like i don't know that they've really made like any films that have like a lasting impact or legacy beyond like commercial aspects you know um compared to the likes of uh like pixar or dreamworks or what you know whatnot it's kind of funny um, the, so, like, <clears throat> the league of defensive arguments that come out for it aren't dissimilar from even like star wars ones where it's like this is just a fucking crazy thing with a bunch of nonsense like why do you need to lock it down into any kind of like cohesive or coherent story this is a thing like even patrick Williams is like famous it's meant for children star wars therefore what mm -hmm. And it sounds to me like it's two wires being crossed at once is the best faith interpretation I could have. It's almost like when they hear you criticizing it for whatever reason, be it story or uh, whatever, they're, they're thinking to themselves, like, kids aren't going to care about that. They're going to enjoy it anyway. Why are you, like, making these comments as though this will affect children's enjoyment? It's a kid's film. And you're sitting there thinking, like, I'm not even commenting on whether how much ki kids will enjoy it. It's, not, like, it's got nothing to do with what I'm trying to say. I'm just, I'm just talking about, like, how well executed the story was. And... If everyone comes to concede, like, who cares? Kids will like it anyway. You should be like, well, then, do you actually say that when we have something like a um, an Incredibles come out? You watch it and go, man, that story was really good, but who cares? Yeah, like, that, exactly. that, that, that doesn't happen. Nobody says that. <laughs> like, they say, like, oh, wow, it's good. I think it's it's a low estimation of kids, um, which, mm. you know, it's it, it can be have, fair. But you, to be fair, that. yes. I mean, kids are little <laughs> psychopathic monsters, but... Um, I, I remember knowing kids who had a bit more taste than that, but the, the, the difference though is that, you know, kids generally speaking aren't going to be taking themselves to see this film. Uh, kids generally speaking don't take themselves to the cinema anyway. It's not themselves to whom they're talking when they go back from the cinema having seen the film. It's not to themselves that they'll be thinking, hey, remember going to see that, that Mario film with me on my own. No, it's, it's a family experience first and foremost. Like you're, you're going with your friends and you're going with your family. And whether or not a film transcends mere sort of pointless kid stuff to becoming sort of family film mainstay depends on whether the film has done something more than merely appealing to kids sort of baser instincts and trying to make them laugh like, soullessly. Uh, it, it's about you know, are the, what are the parents taking away from this? Mm. Um, is it exciting the parents just enough Oh no, my mom said. Is it exciting the parents just enough to um uh to make them talk about it with their kids, to make them want to go and see it again, to make them uh to make them care about it? It's a family film, not a kids film. Mario, I don't think does that though. It was definitely trying to. I mean, like all the references. It, that was the other sort of crossed wires thing, which is that people will say simultaneously that it's a movie made for kids, and also I really enjoyed the references to the Super Mario games in the 1980s. I said, well, okay, but th those two things don't coexist, do they? Because the kids won't remember those references. Kids this, have no concept uh, of what the fuck a lot of this is getting made. referenced in this game. Film, sorry. Well, this <laughs> was definitely made for like, people like me, right? Who are like very, very, very familiar with Mario and Nintendo broadly and played like the games going back, you know, um, like back to, you know, Super Nintendo and uh, N64. Like, there's so many, there's, like, like, Mario's playing Kid Icarus, like, the original Kid Icarus, like, on, on his, N, like, on his NES. How many kids are going to know what that is? Yeah, and when you, you think know? about when they decided to put that in there, instead of having him play a fucking Switch, which they, I guess, could have, yeah, I don't know what time this is set in, oh, but. A lot, of, a lot of things, right? Like, Duck Hunt, they've got, um, they've got the, uh, like, Spike from Wrecking Crew. That's from, like, 1983. Um, I saw an R wing up on uh, on Mario's TV. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, most people who are aware of uh, Star Fox are not kids. Like, it's mostly adults at this point because of how few games they've released for that series lately. And so, why um, is it there? Because the creators were like, "Well, we want to. This this isn't just for kids. This is for the well, the, the lads who've been playing this since it came out." Yeah, they're in the same position, right? The people who made it and the artists and the animators who worked on it. Because if there's one thing to be said about this film that is like definitely undeniably a positive it's like the the artists and animators uh did a fantastic job of mm -hmm. like yeah it's, it's a wonderful the looking Mario, the animations like to the point that they've got very specific animation uh like run cycles from specific games from like 3d world or like um like you know like when they're invincible and like mario like throws his arms to his side as he's running like through specific like like grabbing bowser by the tail and spinning him around to throw him away like in 64 it's like yeah it's uh, these guys like they are they did an incredible job they've got um, in all of mario's run animations you can pick out which games they're taking it from and yeah, what, what references right. they are it's like good job like you you could easily have yeah 
not done very that at all. subtle very subtle details that a lot of people who are fans of mario don't even pick up on that you can't it's difficult to do that by accident it's difficult to do that in a sort of a soulless way or difficult to do that in a sense that makes you think they didn't care about mario or didn't put a lot of work and effort into learning about mario um, no that well, I, in this case i would imagine that for a lot of people it's like they didn't need to put effort into learning about mario they know what mario is they played the games and they love the games yeah so, like, definitely comes like, across that uh, as that because um at, i think at this point we're very much firmly in that era of when it comes to video game adaptations they're not going to run away from like the aesthetics and and like the specific charm of uh of uh of the things that they're adapting at this point i think like this in particular it's like yeah we're we're in the era where it's like oh yeah like we kind of need to take video games seriously um because video games are bigger than the film industry uh and I mean, now they've, they've, they've like switched the tap on for that money and it's just like whoa uh, yeah, exactly like somebody finally realized and, and this film is now probably going to make like one and a half billion dollars <laughs> so probably yeah. it's uh and and we boy i mean yeah we've said it before but honestly this we could have done so much worse um mm -hmm. worse, i was expecting it to be worse i think much worse yeah I thought, it i definitely thought it was going to be worse than this i didn't think it I was surprised gonna me in a positive way yeah, I, did I did think that it was going to be worse than this i thought mm -hmm. it was just going to be like standard illumination meh to mediocre to the but it just feels like there was a lot more I don't know. Like they well, cared. so something that's worth noting is that this film was a co-production with Nintendo. Shigeru Miyamoto is uh, one of the producers. I think it's safe to say that Nintendo was looking over Illumination's shoulder like every step of the way. Um, yes, that. But, but the thing yes, is, is that like, yeah. in in a lot of ways, you can still tell that this film is like a formula film, like that a computer could have potentially come up with. Like, how do we make like a really safe Mario film that like a lot of people will enjoy? This is probably as close as you were going to get to, like, that version of the film, which I don't know is necessarily the best version of this film. Um, like it's, it's very safe, uh, but not necessarily a good way. It's just um, very standard and basic kind of plot beats. And the plot is, the way. Uh, Nobody was surprised by anything in the basic. movie, I, I'd imagine. No, no, no yeah, no. nothing, nothing shocked me. All the stuff that surprised me in this was, yeah, it was, it was all the little details and references, and you know, little animation quirks. Some of the humor is being legitimately subtle, um, and and that, uh, I, I really well, liked those kinds of things. But that's all that really surprised me. I mean, something that's uh, worth talking about is I think that there was probably never a version of this film that was meaningfully entertained that was, like, presented in the same way as a Mario game story is, with minimal dialogue. I don't know that that was ever entertained as an option. I, it probably was, like, from the beginning. They're gonna talk a fair bit, and we're gonna have, like, celebrity voice actors play them. And, like, I, I'm surprised by how much I was able to sort of move past that, like, when the film started. Because before I wasn't sure how I was gonna, like, just have Chris Pratt yeah. as Mario. I didn't, I didn't see that, like, me moving, or Seth Rogen as Donkey Kong or whatever. Um, there are other choices that always sort of made a bit more sense to me, like Jack Black as Bowser. It's like, yeah, yeah, I can say that, right? Um, but yeah, I was able to move past that pretty quickly, but at the same time, it's like, damn, man, like, I feel like there is a version of the Mario film that is presented in a similar way to the games with minimal dialogue, and it's mostly through visual storytelling and visual humor and everything, mm -hmm. um, that, like, moves it along, and that that could be really cool. Um, like, if, and I guess, um... It's, it's something that's been mentioned plenty, right? Like, there's a lot of people who've almost come into it with, like, well, it's Mario, who cares, right? It's like, well, I mean, I care. Like, a lot of people I, I do, care. I do, I, do really, I do really like Mario, and I like the, um, I like the idea of doing something a little bit more with it, especially in a case where you have no gameplay that's going to be filtering into it, right? It's like, you don't, you don't have to design the story to facilitate levels. Um, in the same way that you do when you're making, like, Super Mario Galaxy or, you know, like, uh, it, it, it's um but then you look at something like super mario galaxy and oh there there are like attempts at doing things that are kind of interesting here because you've got like rosalina's like story that she's telling um like that that's kind of like an interesting way of injecting narrative into mario and then like super mario galaxy kind of has broader themes almost that it's going for about like the the nature of like life and death in the universe and like the the rebirth and the cycle of life like in the in the universe and it's like that's kind of interesting I don't know why we presume, like, Mario can't do something 
that's like a little bit more narratively hefty just because a lot of people's perception of Mario comes down to the just like, oh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, Princess Peach got. They, they probably uh, ruled that out. And they were like, gotta... we're going to do, you know, sticking together and looking after your family or whatever and saving the world. Just very normal, like, happy, good stuff. Oh, and a lot Extremely of people pointed safe out, kinds well, of things, like, yeah. I haven't played Paper Mario, which I need to get onto, but as I understand it, like, Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door in particular, like, is like going for storytelling meaningfully. Of like a, a plot with like yeah. character with the, the very distinctive traits and like little arcs that they're going on. Super Mario RPG as well. I hear that about. It's like there's material and and stuff like within Mario that is beyond what I think is like the most baseline sort of uh, view of Mario, which is like New Super Mario Brothers, like you know that series as like the 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 most like stripped down to its bare bones like aesthetic and style that mario kind of has ever had uh in terms of presentation and narrative mm -hmm. um but I, I oh and of course like the mario and luigi rpgs as well like there's a lot of that i i don't like the feeling that people look at mario and are like well what did you expect you know it's mario it's like it's it's just really simple and and whatever, you know. It's like uh, give it a little bit more credit than that, you know. Stay yeah, out of Mario's my, my comment section then, because you you wouldn't like it in there. That's, that's a pretty nasty place. <laughs> you uh, probably wouldn't. Okay. Well, it, it's okay. Like I'm I because the I the thing is um I I don't think that there was ever a world where I was going to get the kind of Mario film that I would have really really wanted to see. But at the same time, there's like a worse version of this film that could have existed that would have made me miserable. Uh, and we didn't get that because, like, you know, not like I I enjoyed this film. I don't I don't think it's very good. Um, it's like very, eh, you know, like it's it, like if you were actually delve into like plot and character development, but like it's entertaining. Um, and it's and it's and it feels like uh, and it's entertaining in a lot of ways because of like the clear sort of love that the artists and animators have for uh for the games. Like that's that's worth a that's worth a good deal to me. That uh, at the very least. I think it would be argued that the heart of the movie, if there is one, would be Mario and Luigi. Uh, yes. The, the there's extended relationships in different places as well, but like that one was what they put them out the time in for foundation. They are brothers. They take care of each other, and that uh, there's plenty of little references to it going forward. And and there's even um, insecurities on Mario part Mario's part about how he may be not only ruining his own life because he's not capable of the things he wants to be capable of, but also dragging Luigi down with him. Um, mm -hmm. you know, by the by the end, we've got a uh, a through line of together they can't be beaten. You know, they'll they'll take care of each well, other because they're brothers. It's a through line in the sense that they actually explicitly state that once, and then they explicitly state it once again at the end of the film. And there are more references, kind of though. Yeah, there I are, have to give it more credit more than references. that. Yeah. Um, are like, there though? I mean, they, I, I get the are, point about the, the the setup and the premise. I did enjoy. I thought that that was good. When you have it's, it's Mario's dad, isn't it, who accuses him of dragging Luigi down with yeah. him with his hairbrain schemes and ideas, and that that's good character setup. And I like that that establishing relationship. Uh, I didn't detect a huge amount more by way of connecting tissue between though those two lines, which basically just states the premise for you. I mean, obviously, that there's the one scene where. He's looking a bit miserable, and Peach consoles him. Peach having just decided that his mission is hers anyway, because reasons. Um, I don't remember another scene apart from that one, though. And even that's not really. That's just like, well, yeah, you care about your brother. We're going to rescue him, aren't we? Yes, we are. Okay, moving on. So you know, we have the scene where Mario they, talks uh, with Donkey Kong, and they set it up. A part they use it to set up, you know, part of a joke where they have similar uh, potential familial issues and. Well, Louis, when Luigi's being interrogated by Bowser, the way he speaks about Mario and how he looks up to him, and when you have the baby Mario and Luigi scene as well. Well, yeah, because yeah, um, mm -hmm. this is what I would say is like what they were going for storytelling wise. And I think it's actually like pretty decent. The Mario and Luigi is like a pairing. Mario's much more of the go getter guy who never gives up, like very much like a scrappy sort of underdog. Uh, and Luigi's always like the more timid, kind of reserved um like uh brother but but like he will sort of he will follow mario and he will uh do things that are brave but do so very nervously and anxiously and there's um th like the when when mario says like as long as we're together you know like we'll, we'll always be okay there's like a lot of references in the film that what what that means before like their their big arc is complete is as long as we're together i'll protect you 
Um, as long as we're together, you don't have to worry because I'll stand up for you. I'll stand up to bullies. I'll help you. I'll, uh, I'll make sure that you're okay. Like, it's very clearly in the, the flashback, right, where, like, Luigi's little, uh, like, uh, toy castle gets yeah. destroyed and then Mario jumps in to protect him. But then this time when he's on his own, he gets captured. Like, the, the feeling of being pretty much useless on his own. Um, and, like, in the, uh, in the scene when they're doing the plumbing in that house and they're getting attacked by the dog, there's, like, an interesting, there's an interesting visual where, uh, he's using the mirror, mirror. as, like, a shield, yeah. but he's using it just to protect himself. Um, well, he's, but then, of he's course, he's inching toward of, Mario, though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Inching towards, like, which, that has to be deliberate, because, you know, when it comes to animation, right? Everything's every single deliberate. Thing screen, <laughs> yeah. Somebody animated. And then the fact that that all leads into the payoff of... Mario's going for the invincibility star. He's about to get, you know, scorched by Bowser. And then Luigi jumps in using a similarly shaped shield, in the case of a manhole, to protect Mario and then restate, as long as we're together, you know, we'll be okay. It's like a better understanding of what that means and a much more, uh, uh, like, they're going to protect each other. They, they both have something to, ser like, to give to each other. And so then it makes sense then, right, that once they work together... You know, that working together means that they become invincible, both, you know, literally and metaphorically. It's like, that's, that's, you know, it's like that, I think that's, I think that's, that's it's decent, a thing. actually. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a thing that I don't think is an accident at all. Yeah, I, like, I really like that payoff of Luigi. I, now, I, I'm a big fan of Luigi. I, yeah, I like Luigi's him more than Mario, great. personally. Um, so that might be biasing me. Whoa. Here, like, that's. That's uh, that's like, like that's decent. Like I, I like that. Um, it kind of did hit me in the feels. Um, I don't know. If, uh, what do you think, Albertoon? Do you think it's uh? Yeah, I'm just like. Do you think it's for, overblown, or, or do you think that's fair? If you, if you want to. Um, no, I think most of that's fair. But it's a lot of this is is incredibly sort of front weighted, though, right? Which is why I mean, and I'm completely with you, and I think they set up the characters pretty well at the beginning of the film. My problem isn't so much that it's just that. You do some quite good work at the beginning. Uh, you pay off at the end with... And there, there is the slightly complicating matter of the, of the Power Star as well, given that it will never lose as long as we're together is... Okay, but you'd also never lose if one of you got the Power Star anyway. Um, it's it's just the rest of the, the middle ground stuff. I don't really remember a huge amount of this being... Yeah, set, set up and pay off, great. Bare minimum standards, and I'm, I'm happy that they're in the film. That's why I, one of the reasons I don't hate it. Mm -hmm. um, but keeping a much stronger through line from that character basis, rather than writing Luigi substantively out of the script for a large part of the film because he's captured, um, is it just it's yeah, it's done the basics well, I think, well enough anyway. But kind of disappointing in that it it could have been more than just that. Like it's more than just. Yeah, they 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 have a brother brother relationship, and there's a, there's a bit of character growth, kind of, and then and I then the end. What you've what you've sort of honed in on is kind of like a it, it's kind of a there is actually a difficult choice in terms of like the way that they present the story here, um, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. Um, they had two they had kind of two clear choices, right? Um, either Luigi gets like captured and we got to save luigi or you do what a lot of the games do where peach gets captured and we got to go save peach and so like your options are mario and luigi are separated for most of the story or mario and luigi go on the adventure together um i i think um it's they both present different opportunities um for storytelling like if you have mario and luigi together for most of the film like working together you can uh, sort of like see see what it looks like when those two are working, like operating together and failing before succeeding, right? Yeah. As an option, but at the same time, then you lose like the the payoff of them reuniting, right? At some so point that's, in the film, that's the thing in, in defense of their choices. Like that's probably one of my favorite bits when they connect back together, and it's like that wouldn't I like that hit as hard too. at all if they're to, you know if 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 you if for every moment you shorten the time they're away from each other, the less that that moment hits. And then, of course, you have the problem of um, if we run it so that they're rescuing Peach, a person that, you know, Mario doesn't even really know at all. In fact, he wouldn't have met her if she got kidnapped. Maybe he meets her and then she gets kidnapped. I'm not sure. But, like, him having the goal of saving Luigi and, by extension, the Mushroom Kingdom and, by extension, Brooklyn is like, I don't know. I feel like that is a little bit more focused than him and Luigi saving Peach. 
the well the, when when they don't have a relationship with page in unless of course setup, we change it all right? and that they're in you know we're yeah, not doing the brooklyn thing there. we just do the they're very aware of peach you know they all right. live in the mushroom kingdom that sort of thing i think that the basic structure of it works well enough and I'm, I'm with you in that it makes more sense to be rescuing the ouija if you're not going to set up a relationship with peach first I, i'm not I don't recall anyway being convinced about Peach's relationship with Mario's ultimate quest line. That did that did seem a little bit too convenient. This is like when well, he meets the princess. Princess decides, okay, I'm good. I'll help you out in the course of helping me out. And I've never met you before, but but we're kind of quite closely attached now, and our goals are, are so closely attached. My problem more with with Luigi's being written substantively out of the script though is that you can use the prison sequence, I think, to tell you more about Luigi's character than the film That's actually true. did. Um, that there is plenty of examples of you know capture sequences being used to actually reveal more about character rather than simply to have it the character on it, a holding pattern while they're in a cage um you know we learn a lot about princess leia when she's captured on the death star um it's just the, the most sort of proximate example so and that yes yeah, so when, when luigi goes into the cage i might be being on on duly harsh on the film but i don't remember after he's in the cage learning a huge amount about him yeah, I think it's on. mostly that like a... jokes that get done while he's in the cage. I don't remember there being much in terms of character. So what just said, by the way, why are you breaking down a children's, like a kid's movie? It's like, uh, what, what? <laughs> I don't understand. Did, did, did you guys feel okay. that way about The Last Wish? Like, fuck me, I enjoy mm, breaking down wish. stuff like that. Yeah, Last Wish is phenomenal. And it would be, I mean, it's like, where do you start? Um, I, Maybe this person's new. Um, Maybe. So here on, here on EFA, I'm Rags, hi. Um, <laughs> On EFAP, we think just because something is appropriate for children or even intended for children, that doesn't mean that it should be poorly written. We think that kids can actually, you know, they, you know, dumb as kids are, there is something in those little noggins that can, ref, you know, that can recognize characters doing things and stories and cause and effect. And also we want to build up at that impressionable young age, this appreciation for stories that are well constructed, that have good cause and effect that have good internal logic if anything it's it, it's arguably even more important that movies that are for these younger people are you know really well you know really well made it gives them you know high standards from an early age which is probably a really good thing especially nowadays but just because something is for kids that doesn't mean you should be lazy and say fuck it when it comes to the story kids are dumb we don't have to care we'll just make flashing lights and colors um, I think we need to give more credit, and we need to, uh, I think we kind of owe it to kids to give them better stories. You know, almost equally funny about all that, too, is that when they were making this, they weren't going like, I don't know, the fucking red hat man, he he rescues the green hat man, it's for kids, who cares? Like, no, they probably would have done this meticulously, all kinds of storyboarding, <laughs> whiteboards everywhere, yeah. many meetings, all kinds of, like, back and forth and corrections, and they were all adults that were doing that, by the way. When kids running that, around <laughs> making this film. I'm bored of statements like that. Go away. We're talking about the movie. Sorry. I, I want to talk about it. And so, let us continue. I uh, th think that's probably the strongest element of the movie, and it's not particularly amazing or anything. Like, the Mario Luigi thing. It's like, okay. It's like, what else has it got? It's like, well, uh, uh, I guess we, we, could go, we could go Peach next. Probably the weakest part of the film. She's kind I would of just... agree. She's, Peach she's is not just there. Um, very, very bland. Very well, I think bland. That, yeah. Is kind of um everybody else is fairly well defined, it, you know. Well, I say fairly well defined, right? Like it's 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 kind of it's pretty easy to distinguish everybody from one another and like their strengths and weaknesses. Peach is just like pretty dull, I'd say. She 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 has a lot of the same traits as Mario, but less because Mario has a few more than just determined. Um, yeah. Did yeah. I read somewhere, and it might, it might be completely wrong, all the rumour was complete nonsense, and many rumours are. I thought I read somewhere that the original plan was to have Peach much more sort of front and centre of the film, and much more heavily involved, and that that was subsequently changed um, in order right to Mario as well, be, yeah. yeah, slightly um, more important in his own film. I well, so the thing is with Miyamoto as a producer, like I could imagine that Miyamoto was was like would talk, like just basically say this is like kind of the 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 hierarchy that the characters should have in terms of like importance in the role that they play in the story and i feel like he's always going to advocate pretty hardcore for like mario being the hero who saves the day um so yeah maybe that was the case um i mean I, like i don't i don't mind like peach like tagging along for the adventure and being a part of the adventure 
and like working together with Mario to like complete the objective, I just wish that they gave her a little bit more than she has because she doesn't have that much. Yeah, she it's it's thin and bland. There's nothing you could really pull out of a lot of her, her dialogue is too sort of like yeah. let's go. We let's need to save the Mushroom Kingdom. Come on, it's everyone. Opportunities that sort of stuff. is all that it. it it's just it's all, all these lines could have been something neat and interesting, or they could have been said or stated in a way that's more that that implies more of a character underneath it. But it's so it's just so direct, and it is what it is, and. There's nothing else, you know, going but, on there. It's bad. It's just not. It's not nothing. It's not much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just. I can't like feel passionate lane. about anything to do with it. That's something that I think is in a couple of parts to this film. I don't feel anything about it. It's fine. It's there. It does its thing. Um, Peach. There's hints of good ideas. So they, they they do that little bit with Peach and Toad, where it's revealed that you know the Toad who goes on the mission with them, whose name I don't. Does he actually have a distinctive Toad, name? Right? I just called him He's Toad talking. Prime to distinguish him. Toad Prime. Um, Prime. But, like, but he, he, there's that little character exchange where he's revealed to be, have that really rare quality among Toads, which is that he's brave enough to go on the mission to begin with. And as you can, there's a starting block. That, that's not too bad because that's something, that's information that's being shared. It's establishing a relationship with Peach, between Peach and Toad, who are otherwise kind of secondary or even tertiary characters in the film. Uh, it's a beginning. It's just that once they sort of establish that this Toad is uncommonly brave, they don't really do anything else with that, or indeed with that relationship. So it explains his presence, and it allows them to do the, the walkout scene toward the end when Peach picks up the axe and Toad picks up his frying pan. Um, yeah. But it's it's kind of shallow. Like that's that's the problem with a lot of the stuff about this film. Like it, it does like premises really well. There's a lot of potential there. It, it recognizes some of that potential, but it doesn't ever really flesh it out very much. So it's not memorable for those reasons. And for anybody who's like, uh, you know, what are you to do with someone like that? You try and like look at all the the elements of her character. So like she's she was from presumably Earth or whatever Brooklyn, but you know, <laughs> she was Earth or Brooklyn. I agree. One of those places. She she was she was presumably from there, and she came here, and the Toads raised her, and then they uh, chose her for her their queen, and that's been her life. It's like, so what what do you do with that? And it's like, well, I don't know. Maybe the fact that this event could be the first time that she is like operated in a more political way, like actually had to try and do outreach with other lands and. You know, she could be really Rolls insecure about it. Symbolic she's, up to now, maybe. Yeah, and, and she has no idea what she's doing, and she has like a bit of a breakdown in terms of like, I shouldn't fucking be doing this at all. This is insane. And, and make her a little bit more insecure about her role as princess. And you, you know, the problem is, it's just there's there's nothing there. Uh, she's she's mostly like, uh, with almost every character, she's just reassuring and assertive. It's just like they, there she goes. Peachy. Well, yeah, it's like, um, because I think if you have her sort of have that feeling of like, maybe, maybe I'm not cut out for this, it, it kind of like, I feel like that's a good parallel to Mario, right? Where like everybody's telling him that he's screwing up and like he's not, like he's he's not that worthwhile, like he's not that interesting, he's not going to amount to big things. That if you have those two together and she has her own concerns about the role that she's going to play in all of this. And, you know, like, Mara could just be like, whoa, I mean, like, you're doing your best, right? And that's all that you can do. And I don't think you're doing a bad job so far or anything, right? Like, that sort of reassurance that they can sort of reassure each other rather than yeah. rather than just Peach reassuring Mario. Doesn't have to be part. complex or super part, deep. Yeah. Could just be a nice little, you know, we are going to use each other to encourage each other. And, you know, we both got our, you know, kind of problems. Really, really, uh, really simple, really basic. Would have been something. Mm -hmm. Would have been something. Uh, but yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting things they could have done with Peach. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think they chose yeah. uh, the dull, boring option. Well, the thing that's kind of interesting to me is if we were to have a conversation about how well are each of these characters adapted, if we move past the fact that they all talk a lot more than they do in the games, um, I'd say that Peach is like quite different in terms of just her temperament. Um, like, uh, like, and and I think that um I think that like if they had it'd gone for like a version of Peach who still tagged along for the adventure but l was like more uh similar to Peach in the games it would have served as like a greater amount of contrast uh in terms of the characters because I feel like a like she's got so much in common with with like Mario in terms of I guess her like attitude in a lot of ways um that like if if she was more uh, I guess you could say like regal elegance um kind of like soft-spoken 
but still, you know, like, it's part of the action. Kind of like you imagine Peach, like, in Smash Brothers, right? Um, like, there's there's a lot of examples I can think of in that game, like, in the subspace emissary mode, where, like, I remember there was a part where I think it was, like, like Fox is fighting, um, is fighting, um, like, Sheik. And then Peach just decides to stop it to have, like, a little tea party. <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's kind of fun while she's here in the midst of the action as well. But I feel like if you had her more like that while going on the adventure with Mario, it just would have added a bit more variety to the characters. And you can add a thrust uh, by having not just Luigi captured, but Toad as well. Her Toad sort of thing. Oh, well, yeah. because then you have Toad and Luigi thing. able to yeah. do their thing you know, while they're in prison cells together. or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, you could even I have them I'm... um nearly escape. You know, a scene like that. Mm -hmm. They manage to find some some way of getting mm -hmm. out of the cell and they nearly make it but they don't quite do it. You just just something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um because because yeah, their core motivation is basically to protect the mushroom kingdom and the toads that raised her, and it's like, yeah, um you can do more with that though. And like in mm -hmm. terms of tying it directly into the story, because really the, the the key example of that was when Bowser shows up. And then is like uh, torturing Toad, and then that's the thing that makes her buckle. Essentially, is like, yeah, don't hurt him, and you know, then I'll I'll do whatever you want, basically. Yeah. Um, if you could have like more of those sorts of moments in the story, because it's like it's kind of like she she sort of serves more of like a, a plot element than a character element in a lot of instances because she's the guide for Mario through the mushroom, like through the kingdoms. And like revealing information to him and explaining the dynamics of the world. It's like because yeah. she has that role to play, it's like a, a matter of well, how, how many lines of dialogue can we devote strictly to character on her part compared to progressing the plot in a way that really isn't the case for Mario because Mario is constantly getting to react to like new situations. Um, yeah. So, DK. Uh... Is yeah, it safe to say lot. that before the movie came out, this is the voice actor that had us the most concerned? Um, or yeah. Yep. would that yeah, be Mario? Yeah. Uh, I think I was more concerned. I, I assumed that uh, he would pull me out of the movie more, the, the most, hearing Seth Rogen as DK. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it could have been any of them, really, right? It's, it's always dependent on how they do it's everything. Uh, I've already seen plenty of people saying it, but, like, somehow, I don't know what spell they cast, but you like typically, you get kind of used to Chris Pratt as Mario pretty quickly. It doesn't take yeah. too long. Yeah, it was very. I was quickly over any like apprehension that I had, and he just sort of like, yeah, that's fair and enough. Yeah, it feels like they had a defensive performance. I wouldn't. It's not notable, which is probably a success because if it were notable, people would be probably criticizing it. But he he does a good enough job, and you kind of just accept that this is this is just how Mario is going to sound for the next ninety minutes. Um, DK was. Like, well, voice acting, like, yeah, just loud and slightly irritating. On a character level, kind of like everybody else, pretty, pretty shallow. Pretty straightforward, yeah. Cranky Kong was more of a disappointment, I thought. Because Cranky Kong kind of sums up the film's approach to character in that it, it doesn't really have very much of that. So Cranky Kong, like, think of how cranky you could make Cranky Kong. Cranky Kong is supposed to be cranky, it's in his name. And... There's a, there's a couple of lines which are kind of Cranky Kong-ish that I recall, but for the most part, it, he sounds very much like pretty much everyone else in the film, and doesn't have a huge amount by way of personality, and that can be said of an, almost any character in the film. Like they're all diluted. Which, yeah. And Donkey Kong's kind of no exception. He's a bit louder and brasher. Um, it might have even been an opportunity discussing earlier, you know, Peach's role in the plot. If you can more clearly differentiate her her role as like the diplomat or the emissary um, in negotiating with, say, Cranky Kong, obviously we end up we have to do a Smash Brothers reference at some point in this film, and so Mario just has to punch DK a bit, and then, then we move the plot along. But you could probably have, have stressed a bit more Peach's diplomatic credentials in that scene, I suppose, and. That it might have been funnier as well had you had quite a prim and proper diplomatically spoken princess meeting an incredibly grumpy, cynical, rude old Cranky Kong um, who has no airs and graces about him. That It'll might be have been quite funny. a good first challenge for a princess who's finally having to do some you know, real diplomatic duties. This is the hmm. first person she has to deal with, and that's where Mario can help her find her confidence, and she could do it. Yeah. Good job, look at you go. How about that? Because there is a another dynamic happening here of uh, Mario and Donkey Kong have a they they have more in common than they realize and yet beat each other up and, and it's only near the end that they finally come together sort of thing. But what you what I just described is almost 
I don't know, half the amount of screen time that's devoted to all of that. And I don't even, I don't, I don't hate it. It's just really like straightforward and you'd have to say thin, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I quite like the conversation in the, um, in the whale fish, whatever it is. It's just that you end up thinking like, it would have been neat to have more, it would need to have more of all of the more relationship stuff. There's a couple of subversions well, as well. Um, I guess specifically um... with dialogue. The because I show up like about halfway into the movie, like Donkey yeah. Kong, Cranky Kong, and everything. Um, and it's only kind of the dynamic between them because I don't like Diddy Kong and Dixie Kong show up, but like only briefly. Um, like there's there, there's no family dynamics for them beyond a very sort of small thing for you know, uh, Cranky Kong. I, I don't feel like he values me all that much, like for for you know, for me and as as my whole being. Um, that's, that's it, really. <laughs> and then it's like, no, he does. He thinks, he thinks you're a good lad. Uh, yeah, there we go. It's like, yeah, it's something. I guess it's better than nothing at all, but it's, it's not much. Um, there's that line, right, where they, they're, they're sharing with each other, like, their, their worries. Like, I think it's like, you know, my dad will always think I'm like a, a failure or, or not very good. And then Mario's like, yeah, my dad too. He just, he doesn't think that I have a, and then there's like a gap and it's set up to be like most movies where he'll offer like, something consoling oh. from Donkey Kong. You'd be like, they're like, you're not so different. You and I, you know, we got this thing that we share in common. Well, like dads, huh? Yeah. That yeah. sort of thing. But, um, he just goes, yeah, well, your dad was right. And it's just like, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a good setup. The, um, Little little Speak bits like that throughout give, give me a sense of like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, I was pleasantly surprised by the humor in this. Uh, I was smiling often, and there were plenty of times that I laughed. Uh, I think a lot of the it, it's very uh, very varied humor. I would say there's some stuff that is totally just there. It is that's the joke. Some of it was awkward, and I didn't care for it. Some of it was nice and subtle, and it was left to be subtle. Um, some of them was just in expressions. Some of it was nothing more than just changes in, um, changes in like sound effects that we've gotten used to. There's a wide variety of different things that they did in terms of comedy. And I think a lot of it worked for me. And I know it's super subjective, but I didn't expect to enjoy this nearly as much as I did. And I think the humor played a, a big role in that. It just, it just really worked for me. I think the visual inclined. humor works slightly better than the verbal stuff. I, I'm trying to remember, because th there's a couple of the, the more verbal jokes which they tended to telegraph a bit far in advance, so when you sort of set up Mario doesn't like mushrooms at home, that you know exactly what the punchline of that joke will be when he gets to Mushroom Kingdom. That You can see that. Yeah, there's a lot of, of the very line. easy jokes that you're just kind of like, yep, get that one out of the way. Um, but, yeah, but like Rack said, I mean, there are others which are... Which are better than that and, and the visual stuff i thought was probably slightly more funny but that's that might be just because it's it's a game reference i mean they've been hit by so many blue shells to see the blue shell being so incredibly destructive and mm -hmm. ruining everyone's mm -hmm. day that was kind of funny um because at least it wasn't me for a change but it's yeah it, it, it was funny funny enough i guess in places um without ever being sort of uproariously sort of riotously funny it yeah it's almost like of... the comedy is the exact same place as the storytelling where it's like yeah there's some stuff in there you know also some limb stuff. Like, like, yeah. In terms of joke production, it's all, uh, most of the jokes are pretty conventional. It'd be like one of the safest movies ever made. Uh, it's yeah. extremely safe, and it will um, reap the rewards for that, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. Probably a bit of both. I mm. thought Dungeons and Dragons was going to be one of the safest films I saw in, in, in a year, but the Mario, I think, is pr probably much safer even than Dungeons and Dragons tried to be. But and th that was probably my main gripe with it, which is that we are pretty much inevitably going to get some sort of expanded universe with all of this stuff. Whether the films connect or not is, I suppose, open to question. But yeah. it's it's inevitably... You know, Nintendo has created Nintendo Pictures for a reason. There's going to be more of this stuff. And if they're given sort of the, the lesson that, okay, all we need to do is to do loads of Easter eggs and member berries and then play this plot writing as simply and as safely as we possibly can, and that's all it takes to be incredibly successful... Then you've got okay, maybe maybe you have this expanded universe of just sort of faintly pleasant films that nobody really remembers. But you can't help but compare it to say like the origins of the MCU back when the MCU still tried to tell stories. And there's a reason that people remember Iron Man in a way that they probably won't remember this specific Mario film, and that's because they didn't settle for just saying, "Hey, look, you read the comics. This looks familiar to you. Isn't this fun? Move on." They did actually try and make him into a character and tell a character and. 
and to, to bring you along on, on a journey that the character could be said to have gone on, which I, I would be disappointed and kind of sad if this, this NCU in whatever form it takes doesn't at least try and tell a story with its characters with, that's more than surface level. Because it will um, sacrifice the opportunity to be something that's really, really brilliantly memorable for save bucks, which is kind of depressing. I guess I guess the question... I, I like how it's already a foregone conclusion that there's going to be Super Smash Brothers, basically. <laughs> like, that's the expectation, but... The thing that I wonder is, would they take the same approach with something like Zelda? I don't know if they would. Um, I don't know if I don't know if you you take the same approach with like that and Metroid or, or Star Fox if, if those were things that they went to next, or like even that. I, I guess the question is like, are they all going to be animated? Uh, is it all going to be Illumination or because DreamWorks is owned by Universal? Are they going to do them all with Universal? Right, like these sorts of questions kind of, uh, like part of the discussion. Um. I'm not sure what lesson they learned from this. Um, Probably the sure, wrong one, sure typically one is. <laughs> uh, it seems that way, yeah. So, uh, music, soundtrack, what do we have to oh, say should we on talk that? about Bowser? We have, I'm... Oh, oh so yeah, let's talk about Wifringy. Bowser. Bowser's probably uh, oh, yeah, of yeah, course. We should, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's actually we a good way to get to music him. after him, too. We should talk about yeah. who, what we will all agree is the best character yes. uh, in, in, the, in the movie. Isn't well, that right, Little Platoon? <laughs> Whatever you say. All right, I, I don't even know. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I like Bowser quite a lot. He was really a joy to watch. He was just being a big, evil Jack Black guy. Uh, I really liked the voice acting. I think he nailed it more than anyone else did. Yeah. Um, he was clearly having fun. They put his talents to use. Uh, I like what they did with the character, just his inflections and, you know, just being evil, trying to marry Peach, take over the world, that sort of thing. Super standard and basic, but it was executed really well. Yeah, don't... Uh, nice, fun villain. Don't let Mandalorian convince you that Jack Black has no talent, <laughs> okay? Like, or, or Lizzo. I heard she's a phenomenal flute player, but I... I it's, just, it's really yeah. interesting to see the back-to-back, because -back, um, he was obviously either poked to, or that he actually really gave a shit about this, like... Is Bowser? He's he's trying. It, it, I get the impression that he was the person on the celebrity voice cast who cared the most about Mario. There's a good chance yeah. he's fucking played it, or his kids have, or you know, there's that element uh, that could very well be involved. Well, I mean, he has. He's been involved in video games before, yeah, yeah. as brutal legend and yeah. that sort of thing. Um, he knows but what this he means. He seems to be. Yeah, he seems to be decently on the pulse of like modern culture and you know the internet and video games that sort of thing and. Strikes me as the kind of guy who would really take well to having a company like Nintendo and Illumination. Really, it seems like they worked with him a lot. They didn't just say, here's what you do. Go do it. All right, here's your check. Thank you. We will call you if you need, you know, we need you. But it seems like they actually really put a decent amount of effort in saying, oh, yeah, this is Jack Black. He sings a lot. Let's give him these singing sections. And he's got this kind of voice. And so we're going to really going to let him inflect and be, you know, active in the way that he talks. And so he probably just really appreciated that, you know, being respected as a human being. So that's neat. And yeah, it's, it's that kind of performance that you feel the energy. And so you're like, eh, all right. Kind of, yeah. yeah, I'm okay with this. Like, you know. Because I think when he was announced, Jack Black is Bowser. That was just that's just really funny. It's like what, what are we, what, what's know. happening? I I actually had a different. That was like the one that felt like it made the most sense to me. I think they're all funny. I, I the it's it's just such a surreal situation that all these it because it's not what it it almost comes across at first that they're going to be cast in some kind of like live action way, uh, which is, is you... obviously what the the previous nightmare was. Um, Dennis Hopper as Bowser in that case. But um, you can still imagine it that way, and then you can be like, "Well, it's voice actors," and then it's still the absurdity remains for a shit ton of the uh, the ideas. But even still, like, it's just not something that was expected uh, from anybody. Yeah. I still remember like wow. the different reaction. There was those like clips posted of just everyone laughing their ass off with the uh, the announcement. But who's laughing now? <laughs> like box office. Mm. But that well, it's, I'm now thinking about when Bowser talked in our Super Mario Sunshine. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Mario, was... how dare you interrupt our family vacation? <laughs> Mario. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> Just having Bowser talk is kind of like, it's kind of funny. It's, it's, it's probably like the hardest, in a, in a sense, it's both the hardest one, but also like with Jack Black doing it, it's like, eh, I feel like we'll that's see what the could happen. like the easiest to get past. You know, if they make like three of these movies where he's voicing him, it might end up being that they hire him to voice him in the next game, you know? Um, that would be interesting. I, I, what I do you wonder... feel about that, Fringy? I 
so I will say, I don't think I want, like, any of that to ever, like, sort of rub off on the games. Like, oh, I wasn't saying whether or not it's good, not. saying it could happen. I could... No, I, I guess what I'm saying is I, I don't I don't want that to happen. Like, I don't want, um, I don't want that kind of influence on the, the games. Remember, like, the, characters. The, um, the comics, like, superheroes ended up, they start to follow along and get influenced by all the movies that come um, out. Sure, but like I don't know. Does this film make more money than Odyssey that sold like thirty-five million copies? No, you know? or like Arcade but, Eight that sold. Uh, if they see it as only a benefit rather than a detriment, then they might just do it. Uh do they see it as only a benefit? I guess that's the question. Well, why the fuck do they put them in the movie if they don't see it as a benefit? Um, a benefit for a film. I don't. I don't know what they think in terms of like their objectives when it comes to the video games. We'll I, don't, I, don't, I don't actually. I don't know if I see Nintendo ever like significantly deviating from from a lot of the choices that they've made consistently with like Mario, especially mainline Mario games, by way of presentation. It's always a possibility. You never. Yeah, know. it's always a possibility. Um, I don't think it's happening, and I don't want it to happen. <laughs> oh, I think we're in for a lot of misery with the uh, video games getting more yeah. and more popular and moving into like the movie industry in a way. Mm, um, yeah. It's definitely gonna like fast forward ten years and the comic people will be like first time, like yeah, well, not really, right, but yeah, yeah. Because video game adaptations have been shit anyway, well before this. Um, mm. the, the funny thing as well is this is so suitable for this conversation, being that the Mario adaptation is what killed Mario being adapted into movies. It killed everything for Nintendo for like thirty years. Um, oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure that film is already definitely why they not first do. time. Yeah, they don't want to do it with anything, pretty much. <laughs> But now, yeah, Halo Season 2 is coming. Yeah, that's the thing. We're in misery already, but we, are, yeah. we may get some stuff we can enjoy. Yeah, exactly. Like The Last of Us. Oh, oh. Oh. What's ringy? <laughs> For how could you say something like so that? Controversial yet so brave. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You um, are very brave, Fringy. I, uh,. The, the the peaches song is is I like it. I like the peaches song. Well. <laughs> it's really hard to not just like, like everything around Bowser. It's almost like a, you're very... either the movie and you're like, man, it's a shame you're an evil bastard because you're really likable well, and fun. The imagery of Bowser sitting at a piano singing like a soliloquy about Princess Peach. It's like that's a, that's I like that. Well, and and yeah, we talked about like the shame with him is that they didn't really do him justice at the. End. So I'm, I'm with you guys in that I think he's easily the most characterful of all of the characters in the show, and he is funny, and Jack Black does a good job with the voice acting. Um, his plan is is goofy, but, you know, it's kind of well acknowledged that Bowser's a bit of a simp, so that makes some sense. It's more that they, having done all of that and him being probably one of the more fun bits of the film, then you get to the end, and it's kind of perfunctory the way that, oh, we've got the power on us, so we're going to beat the shit out of him now, and we lock him in a, in a jar, and, and that's him done forever. Well, not forever, but for now. Uh, and that just kind of felt a bit like yeah, you you could have you could have done a bit more with him I think giving him a bit more credit than that just sort of dismissing him in a short fight montage. Um, I think that they actually something I would say is I do think that they make him in a lot of instances sufficiently threatening. Um, there's like a lot of moments where through like the framing, um, the animation, the lighting and everything like, uh, that he can come across as like, uh, intimidating, about as mm. intimidating as I think you can make him. Oh, his, yeah. entrance, uh, I mean, his entrance was particularly yeah. good, I think, in that sense. Yeah. You know, the, yeah, um, exactly. the masked armies and the, the backlit. That, that was done. That was well done. I think going I think straight for what... torturing Luigi, dunking prisoners mm. in lava. I mean, Just he's uh... about how he's going to like destroy the Mushroom Kingdom or, you know, kill Luigi and stuff like that. And I feel like with Bowser, it always sort of ends in like a kind of a humiliating defeat. Like it always, like it, it's Super Mario Odyssey. Like, <laughs> like that was a that was kind of a humiliating defeat for him in a lot of ways. Because that was the one. I, I'm wondering if they, they probably would have gotten it from Odyssey. Because I think they had the uh, the same design for his uh, like wedding costume that he had in that game. Because that game ended with a wedding, and then Mario crashes the wedding and saves the day. Um, yeah. I think that was part of his plan that made the least sense. So the the power star generally was kind of tricky. Like one of the first questions watching is like, if it's so good and if it's so powerful, why why the hell didn't the penguins use it when he invaded? But then obviously his his motive for for getting it is because he thinks that Pe Peach will be more likely to to say yes to his proposal. Um, but he's still going to invade Mushroom Kingdom anyway and and kill them all basically if if she says no. 
which you thought might have been more leverage than having the power star. It's not. Like, what, what's in Peach's mind uh, sort of at the forefront? Is it that Bowser has a shiny star or is it that he'll massacre your kingdom if you reject him? But then, since Mushroom Kingdom is shown to be completely defenseless because all the toads are too adorable, to use their own word, why hasn't Bowser just gone straight there and done this already? Um, and then why doesn't he use the Power Star himself when he might have benefited from using it? Uh, that I guess you can put that down to his arrogance, maybe, in the final scene, that he doesn't think that he needs to use it, but it still poses a few problems. I, like, I think the world-building stuff, which they accomplish almost exclusively through Easter eggs, is quite deficient in the way that these places actually interact with each other and with the items that are supposed to be very important. I think that the only thing that you could say in terms of the, the motive, because the, Bowser going to get the, uh, the the star and then going to the Mushroom Kingdom, like, aligns with Mario and Luigi showing up, but that them showing up was, like, independent. Like, it's an independent thing, right? It's just very, very convenient that they show up at the same time that this is happening. Um, so, you, you know, once you get past that, it's like, well, why is he going to get it? I think all that's to be said is he thinks it will impress Peach. He thinks he needs to do it to impress her. Um, I think that's more or less about it, um, because he's a little bit insecure in some ways. Um, that seems to be the motivation. Um, uh, Will Platoon, anything else? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. No, it's, the, it's the, the eternal problem with this film, is that I keep having to think of things that, like, what else is there to say about that? Yeah, it's, a, it's um, slim. Um, it's very slim. One might call it lean. Um, I think that might be too much of a compliment for it. <laughs> yeah, probably. Weakest elements of the film really are, yeah, characters and story. Not what? that there's in nothing the there, world? but yeah. Well, and it's a good segue uh, from Bowser's song into they've got a oh. an original soundtrack running. But they also have pop songs coming in every once in a while, which... Um, uh, everyone's got mixed feelings on, I'd imagine. There's some mm. songs where I'm like, okay, fine, yeah. And then some songs I'm like, what the fuck's that doing there? Especially compared to the incredible original music you can get from Mario. Like, why? Why would you do that? Yeah. And it's like, you know it's why so they did much it. In it. Yeah. It's it's That's kind of cynical and, and shallow. Like, this tune is a banger. That makes the film a banger, too. Oh, it's familiar to you, so you know what mood to be in when you hear it. It's... It's lazy, and it is a shame, because, I mean, the hell, they use the DK rap when you have the little first Smash Brothers reference. It's not even as though you would be limited to um, sort of purely instrumental scores. So there's more music in Mario than this one could possibly have made use of. Oh, yeah. Um, but, but you have the, that sort of expanded oeuvre as well, which is it's just didn't really... Yeah, why would you not have chosen that instead of Aha? Uh -huh? Why is Aha in there? I mean, the hell, the song's because fun, you but... like Aha, I like Aha, and everyone loves Aha, so that's why Aha. I'll take be, that uh, feeling uh, and associate it with this movie, please. And you're like, okay. I, as I understand it, they had created a lot of original compositions for those scenes, but then I don't know. At some point, they changed their mind. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I don't hearing take on me when they go to like the the Kong Kingdom. It's like, why? Why wouldn't you do like? Why wasn't it like the Donkey Kong Country, you know, like da 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 like as they're going through that mm -hmm. area, you know? I almost like, think it would have done wanna... better, as crazy as it sounds. Because like, they would be like, yeah, I know the music's good, but we want to appeal to audiences. And I'd be like, are you fucking kidding me? These, these songs do appeal to audiences. <laughs> they're great. Well, they, exactly, they do. Because, um, like, it's, it's really cool just listening to the music and hearing all of the motifs from various games. Because you got it from all sorts, from obviously Super Mario Brothers, the original game. Like Super Mario Brothers Three, Super Mario World, um, they have they. I know that in the the end credits they have Gusty Garden from Super Mario Galaxy. Of course, there's like a lot of um. Uh, they use the uh the theme for the original SNES theme for Rainbow Road when they show up on Rainbow Road. And it's like yeah, it's really cool to hear all of that in there. Like I'm never gonna be unhappy to hear more of the original compositions, partially because I think that there is an interesting contrast between the strength of the um, compositions based on the original themes compared to the original themes for this film. Because, um, like, the original theme that they have for this film is like, eh, yeah, 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 it's okay. Like, it's not bad. Um, it's all right. But then when it contrasts with the melodies from the games, it's like, oh, damn, man. Like, yeah, these are, these are really good. <laughs> the orchestral <laughs> uh... versions were very impressive. 
Um, yeah, yeah. They yeah. felt really great. They fit well with what was happening at the uh, you know, at the time. It was really nice to listen to these versions of you know the tunes that everyone recognizes. Mm, yeah, I, I, if anything, I'd say I wish we got more of it um, because I, I think agree. That, I think that there are parts when it's like, damn, I wish that lasted a little bit longer of like the original game music because like some because uh, if you listen to the soundtrack, like the way that it's um. The, the way that, like, it's it's all very timed to what's happening on screen, which <laughs> there are moments where it's like, damn, I wish I had a little bit more time to breathe. Like, the the composition, like, it will cut off just a little bit too soon for my liking. Um, I'm, I'm always going to want to hear more of the game music. Um, I always the, want to take that. A format of jokes that they have. Uh, I think there's either three or four instances of the track playing, like, almost blaring and then hard cut to off when the, the character gets hit by something, you know? Mm. a very common form of joke making that uh, can add to blandness or not depending on how you take it but I think that uh, I definitely would have committed to having all of the original music, fuck it I'll uh, say 80s well, music isn't awesome it is, a lot of it um, but you know well yeah, because I, I could imagine like, because I mean why would she use one of the athletic themes for when he's d completing the course that just makes a lot more sense to me to throw in one of those themes um, or, uh, yeah, obviously when they show up in, in the Kong Kingdom, like, have some Donkey Kong music in there. Um, what, what are some other instances where they had, uh... Wasn't well, well, but I'm Mario thinking... music tends to be very annoying. What, what are oh, you talking damn. about? Jeez. Man, oh, that, that wow. might be like, damn, that's like, you're... I don't it's even know a good what to opinion do with that. Have her over here. Oh I my don't goodness. even know what to do with that. <laughs> the whole point of those tracks is they're designed to be able to be heard again and again and again and again because exactly. you're playing levels yeah. so much. Well, um, and in particular, made for the NES when you had limited amount of instruments, they needed strong melodies. Um, they, they, all of those songs have like incredibly strong melodies. There's, everybody knows what the Mario theme is. Um, it's partially because it gets repeated like, a lot. Imagine... It's also because it is like a really strong core of melody. They went to fucking Isle Delfino at some point, and they didn't play the music. Doo, 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 doo. The, yeah, doo, 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 the hub world. That, yeah, that would exactly. be like sacrilegious. Well, I mean, if the next one is, if the next one is Super Mario Galaxy, which I don't know if, if it would actually be, and they don't play like every song that they possibly can from that soundtrack, I will be unhappy. I gotta say. Yeah, it's almost too, well. It's, Little platoon said, right? It's like you you can't even possibly shove all of the amazing Mario tracks into these movies. It's not gonna be possible. There's too many. Well, yeah, because when it comes to Rainbow Road, right? It's like you got a lot of options for Rainbow Road, and Rainbow Road has maintained a lot of um, like the the Rainbow Road for Mario Kart 64. Like that main theme has often carried through to a lot of the subsequent ones, but even then, like they all still have their own um they also have like their own unique elements like DS Rainbow Road versus Wii versus um like GameCube um and and even like picking music for Mario Kart right because they they use the uh the menu theme from Mario Kart 8 when they're uh they're building their carts oh that's right because they they had another they had another um pop song there as well mm -hmm. damn i can't remember which one um it's like why why can't you use like more Mario Kart music like please <laughs> I implore you. Like I said, I'd be curious to know if it's just like provably a better move for the box office or something. I just, um, I was that one day, you know? Mm. I want to see the alternate universe, yeah, where there were no pop songs and it was all just really neat uh, remixes or, you know, different versions of, you know, the music we all know and love, the classic stuff. So Thunderstruck was a weird choice, even if you, like, if you accept that you are going to use pop songs as opposed to original music. You're on a road... You're doing an ACDC song, and it's not Highway to Hell, which Maybe was... it's just used too much. But then again, they have fucking, you know, I need a hero in there, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah We're gonna have so... to talk about that song <laughs> later. We're gonna talk about it when we hit Tetris, that would make sense. We're gonna have to talk about that song, and how it's invaded my life. But they do do a big old Mario Kart reference. Ah, do-do. Yeah, they, they do. do. They do, indeed. They do a lot which, of Mario um, Kart references. Which was a smart move. Uh, Half of this yeah. movie felt like it was on the, on the go-kart, which is fine, but, like, damn. Well, Mario, Kart, Mario Kart sells better than, like, the mainline Mario series. So, like, it's, it's, it almost shouldn't even be a surprise um, that they, they did Mario Kart stuff.
I would say as part of what like... this film's going to benefit from, or it wouldn't if not for the games existing, is that people would be finding this a lot more jarring if they didn't know what it's adapting. Because it's just like, right, but, we need to go but from everybody does. the Donkey Kingdom to the Bowser place. We have to do it through a shortcut, which is a giant rainbow road. We'll go on our carts. It's such a like, what? <laughs> but it's like, well, <laughs> no, it all, it's, it, the people who know what Mario Kart is are all just like, yeah! <laughs> like, let's well, go that, that, was, think... that was one of the other really common arguments I heard as well, which is that this is a movie that's unashamedly pro-gamer, it's made for game fans, and it did a good job for them. Um, it doesn't matter that a general audience might not understand all of the references, or indeed any of the references, if they're certain other reviewers, um, but... You know, it, it does a good job by game fans. I, I can see that. I mean, hell, I've I played quite a few Mario games. It was nice being able to sort of scan the screen for references. That's fun for for a bit. It does sort of start wearing off. But I don't... I mean, would you would you agree that there has to be a distinction between pleasing game fans and pleasing a general audience? I mean, it's not, again, to use the, the inevitable comparison, it's not the approach Marvel took. It didn't say, well, we have to do something either for fans of comics or for a general audience. It did try and sort of blend the two, and it becomes more memorable for that reason, or more universally enjoyable for that reason. Um, it's um, also a good story and a r story that respects X thing aren't necessarily the same thing. Like, because uh, mm -hmm. I, I would, I would think I would concede. It's like, yeah, it's respect in its source and it's treating gamers without being like, you know, like uh, for a while, gamers are just like gross basement dweller type situation. While this, this movie is like embracing the game aspects, but I don't know if that has anything to do with how good the story is. Like this, this film is not spiteful toward its audience, which is what people feel about Marvel these days. You know, it doesn't hate us. It doesn't. It's good. Well, yeah, it doesn't. This movie doesn't mock the fact that Mario is a thing. It doesn't make fun of people who like it. It doesn't do any of that stuff. And it's I'd say like, something yeah, as well as they, they actually of it, if anything. They avoid a lot of opportunities to like make fun of Mario and like the wackiness of Mario. A lot of the time they just kind of play it off as like what it is without yeah, sort of being it's like very matter of fact. Oh yeah, you're a giant like walking turtle, right? Like they don't make those kinds of jokes often. They even make jokes about turtles, but like that felt restrained compared to what they could have done. Mm -hmm. um it's not like they're embarrassed by what this is um like other video game adaptations can be i was thinking Halo. how you could have like a really good story but if it shits on a particular demo like their audience then it can like absolutely flatten people's enthusiasm for the thing mm -hmm. but so, i don't think illumination does that ever though yeah they're too, not... it's too safe why would they ever yeah <laughs> like, yeah it's like illuminations going why the fuck would we ever do that that would be stupid Wh who would be foolish to denigrate the thing you're trying to monetize why would you do that and you got like even <clears> if they did <throat> nintendo would probably be like no we're actually chill with gamers <laughs> it's shocking i know but we actually think they're fine so because yeah, yeah there were there's one or two sort of knowing self-references but they are all quite sort of well-spirited. None of them are, are mean or, or ridiculing too much. So there's Bowser's speech near the beginning where he's listed, like, is it, what does he say? Is it Koopas, Goombas, and whatever the hell these things are um, with little spiky turtles. But that, yeah. was, that was kind of funny and, and nice. And then there's... I know that's like, makes every, sort of Mario's it's like, yeah, we don't know what those are either. We don't know what those are called. Hmm. You know, that's the, the joke is, you know, it's, it's not putting it down. It's, if anything, it's like a reach, it's like the audience. It's like a meta thing, you know? And Peach makes fun of Mario's height, but even he then... He is short. He is very short, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what other, if there are other comments in the film, particularly, that were sort of meta and self-knowing. I'm sure there are some, but they're, they're sort of slipping my mind. Um, Princess is in another castle, I guess. Oh, was yeah. that one. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a weird... That felt weird. Matt, it's just, it's, it's oh, one of weird. the most well-known memes, so you got to put it in there. That's all that felt like to me. It's like, oh yeah, yeah Princess of Another Castle. <laughs> oh, um, what else is there to say about the old Mario movie? Um, I can't. I like. I like it. It's hard to not like it. I think it's very. It's inoffensive. It's you know. It it doesn't shit on anything. It seems like it's got a lot of care and interest. By you know the people who made it, you know they have that for Mario, and you just, you can't help but see it. It's charming, it's fun, it's vibrant and colorful. It looks great. I I enjoyed a lot of the references and a lot of the little jokes. Um, we could have gotten a whole lot worse. We definitely couldn't gotten a whole uh, could have got a whole lot better. But 
this will pr hopefully all of the right messages will be learned from uh from this probably not so well i guess well, well i guess we'll see is this is this the but, peak yeah. it is what it is the film um <laughs> maybe i don't know um i don't even think this is the peak it is what it is of our night i assume you're talking about 65 i am yes that feels more it is what it is than this but I see why you'd say that. But maybe we're just thinking of that concept differently. Probably. Um, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. We could we could sort of wrap on the old Mario there, unless there's anything else anyone wants to say. Word. Uh, no. Uh, I I, I I'm that. interested to see another one. Yeah. Another I, and I'm sure. very curious how the what happens to the movie making landscape now that this has sort of decided to finally embrace a video game movie. Well, and it's, it's, gonna make it's, um, it's worth because putting it in the context of other video game adaptations recently because yeah. this film might end up being the highest grossing film of the year and The Last of Us was one of HBO's biggest shows. Um, that's kind of, you know, like that's, I feel like, I feel like that's, that's not something that goes uh, ignored pretty much when it comes to like trends. But I mean, in the, in the case of this film, the reality is you've seen a lot of films like this. There are a lot of films that are like this. They're just like, eh, you know? Like, well, yeah, um, um, I don't know. Don't forget to combo yeah. with the uh, Arcane, of course, when that finally has a second season. It has the benefit of being promoted by LOL and Arcane Season 1. And if it's good, that'll start to, you know, have a big old mm. control impact. And it's like, damn, man, we got video games leading the charge in a lot of different ways. What else is yeah. coming out? So this Fallout is in production, isn't it? Um, um, Borderlands, it... I think it's coming out this year. Um, Interesting. God of War is in development. Uh, Fallout show is, I think, isn't it's Bioshock already in development as well. Filmed. Yeah, Bioshock's being made. Uh, Horizon, I think, uh, is getting a Netflix series. Gears of War is getting a film and an animated series, I believe. Um, I'm trying to think about what else is on the. Uh, oh, well, they're making another Mortal Kombat. Which um, we will likely check out. The first one was something. Yeah, it certainly oh, was something. Uh, oh, Ghost of Tsush uh, Tsushima. Or Tsushima. That's, uh, that's being... I think the guy who directed uh, John Wick, all of the John Wick films, is doing and that Halo one. Season 2. Oh, oh God, yeah, you're Halo right. Um, the the list goes on, by the way, and it's insane. Like, video game adaptations are fucking... Rolling out of the woodwork. It's yeah, the we got shit tons for, coming. Uh, oh, Street Fighter recently got announced. They're getting a new live action film. Um, and the more oh, Five Nights at Freddy, Minecraft as well. There's a Minecraft movie with Jason Momoa. The more <laughs> they come out, and the more superhero movies are less reliable for the box office. I feel like the shift has finally arrived. Mm. And Oops, this is... but is the it a shift to anything good? I mean, I think that that was sort of my meta uh... comment on Mario, which is that. Mario, okay, it, it's it is and is what it is and it is what it is. Film, um, it's it's kind of enjoyable enough, I guess. But like, if you extrapolate this out and say, well, all you need to do to make a good, successful video game movie is just a lot of references and very little plot, um, like that will probably burn out. I would have thought more quickly. No, so, I mean, isn't that going to get think, tiring? I don't think so. One thing that I think video games will have as like an advantage over superhero films and Marvel in particular is the breadth and the diversity of the genres and tones and types of stories and formats of stories that you're going to get with video games is so broad compared to like what is done with a lot of superhero films that I, I, don't, I don't know how that well run, runs dry, right? Like the Mario film versus the Fallout television show, what, what they're going to have nothing in common. We or can even like the Fallout TV show versus like a Gears of War animated series versus Arcane or something, right? Yeah, like, look at the ones we just different. referenced. Mario movie, and, Arcane, and The Last of Us show. Like, look at the difference in those three alone. And, of course, a big thing that will probably help as well is that this is going to be done by all studios as opposed to like Marvel, yeah. which is one thing under Disney and Marvel Studios and, and DC, which is one thing under Warner Brothers. It's a crippled like... corpse trying to copy and paste them. You're not going to get that yeah. with this. Because it, it, let's say you only had the rights to God of War. You don't. You don't. You can't copy the Mario Bros. movie. Exactly. But... And and you pro and why would you want to? Right? Because the appeal yeah. of God of War, and particularly if they're doing the Norse stuff, is different from the appeal of a Mario movie. 
people because i mean we saw it with the last of us right like people entered into the last of us with a lot of expectations stemming from that game that are going to be very different from a lot of people's expectations of a mario movie um and i think it reflects right and in, in sort of the way that people talk about th those and it will reflect and i think in the way that people talk about like upcoming ones however it, it, like if you it yeah we are in for some shit for sure oh, oh absolutely but, the shit the shit must flow but and boy will it if you were to, Gee, if you dolly were gonna, willikers if you you know asking me like oh do you want which landscape if you had to have two which one would you want an abundance of video game movies or an abundance of uh of superhero films it's like yeah i'll i'll give the video game one a shot Dude, another 10 years of marvel's reign or switching over yeah. to the reign of video game adaptations it's like it's exactly. easy and I, honestly i think that's easy for everybody because even if it's going to be bad it's different at least it's a lot <laughs> it's of variety you different know? bad yeah. um it's the Marvel's to... trailer didn't reinvigorate your love of, uh, of superhero. <laughs> Gotta say, no, no actually. actually. Uh, well, I loved it. Doesn't look great. <laughs> I'll say that. You know, mm. that I can't wait to see the box office of that movie. Show me, give it to me. I'm curious, yeah, and Guardians too, I guess. What is the what is the influence of the decline at this? Because like Super Mario Brothers made more money in a week than Ant Man made in its entire theatrical run. Mm, like that's and by the way this film hasn't even released in japan yet or a bunch of markets as well a bunch of other markets so who knows how high it goes but i guess the the put a bow on it right the general sentiment is eh but entertaining yes yeah but entertaining is uh yeah mm -hmm. you've seen a lot of films like this oh here's a question but would mm -hmm. all four or four of us would you recommend it i would uh if you like Mario, I'd recommend it. If you didn't like Mario, uh, I I don't know why I would recommend this necessarily over any other like middling sort of animated film. Um, yeah, I guess that's pretty I, fair. I, I, yeah. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend against it. I don't think for basically like anybody who was. If anybody said I'm kind of interested in watching the Mario movie, I'd probably just say yeah, you might as well check it out. Better You'd than nothing. Toss it. it on if you've got a chance. Mm -hmm. It's no passionate recommendation for me. No, uh, and even as like a Mario fan, it's not a like a passionate recommendation either. I'd say. Mauler's argument but makes hey, no sense. It what does a Mario would. cinematic universe look like? It will be bad. No, Super Super Smash Brothers. I don't even um, know what's happening in that comment. Did I even talk about the guaranteed no, goodness we of a about... Smash Brothers? I don't even remember saying that. Oh, we, when we were talking about video game adaptations, we weren't talking about a connected like universe of like God of Mario War and Mario. And <laughs> in God of War. It's just that you know video game adaptations as a trend yeah like you know um, creators copying each other to try and bank on the current interest from the audience and um there are there are there's a world where a connected mario universe could be good there was there was a fucking world where a connected superhero movie universe was good mm -hmm. we didn't see yeah, it though what do we think uh actually that i'm curious what do we think the sequel for this because there will be one for this. what what do we think the sequel is going to be like which video game do you think it's going to derive most of its uh Inspiration they, what they might do is I wonder because they did a whole lot of cart stuff in this if they're gonna s try to stay away from the cart stuff in the next one and stick more on a more platforming adventure kind of thing with Yoshi um because yeah, you've got the post credits sequence you, which is Yoshi yeah. which yeah. That, that was kind of surprising to me as well because you would think now people are sort of trained to expect important post credits scenes my cinema was full during the film, half of it left before the mid credit scene, and there were three other people besides me who actually stayed for the last one. So Yoshi might actually come as a surprise to people if that's a more general pattern. I mean, um, show but up they in the did film. tease him. Yoshi's, you know. You'd, yeah, there, there yeah. were a few of them there, yeah, definitely. Briefly, which, um, that, that would have been a difficult choice, I have to imagine, of like, do we actually have uh, to... Yeah, restrain the Yoshi, yeah. I love Yoshi, love him a lot. He's a, he's a good boy. And I feel like everybody likes Yoshi as well. I would everybody expect the Bowser's going to uh, stay out for a movie, maybe, and we have Wario. I think, um, yeah, I think Wario is... I, I guess I'm, I'm interested in, like... Because I would say that even though this film kind of was, like, in, in some sense, kind of a hodgepodge, it was much more narrowing in on the most broadly recognized aesthetic of Mario and, like, the Mushroom Kingdom and everything. Which makes me wonder if next one's going to be Galaxy or Sunshine, or if they're going to, you know, Dinosaur Island, like Super Mario World, kind of uh, influence more directly. 
Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, if they're even adapting it that way. It could just be that they, they, might not they be, treat Mario yeah. as a grab bag of sources, and then they make their own thing out of whatever they want from each of them. Sure, it's, I, I guess the thing is, is that Galaxy in particular is quite well defined as its own thing. Uh -huh. Uh, and so is Sunshine too, which makes me wonder. Yeah. I, I feel like I feel like Sunshine ain't that that I feel like that one is least likely to get anything like significant. I um, think they probably consider it too limited in scope. If there was a film of yeah. like Mario goes on holiday and then he has to defeat a you know Google right monster. exactly. Whereas uh yeah Wario seems like the next. I don't think Bowser will be the villain in the next one. It will be Wario or it'll be uh, Bowser Junior or the Koopalings maybe. It'll be halfway through. Probably... Wario breaks Bowser out of. Castle, you know. Mm -hmm. like yeah, that. and they team up. Oh, and uh, also, the, actually, before we wrap it up, um, Charles Montney's uh, cameos. Um, I liked the choices that they made for the cameos that they gave him. Yes, if they weren't going to give him Mario, which they didn't. He he uh, he shows up as kind of like a proto sort of like jump man uh a guy in the i think it was like a punch out inspired because i'm pretty sure there was a picture of little mac up on the the wall in, in the restaurant they were in and he was playing uh i think he was playing the original donkey kong on the arcade machine and it's just like standard sort of normal mario voice that was the influence for that commercial where they put on the mario voice and they have like the the capes like the yellow capes that they're wearing uh, and then he also shows up as uh, Mario and Luigi's dad, which, um, yeah, it feels pretty appropriate. <laughs> Especially at the end when he's like, these are my boys. It's like, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. Geez. yeah. <laughs> Damn. That's, uh, I like that. I like that as much as I can when he didn't get to Frodo the Jumpman. Frodo Jumpman. Yeah, if... let's, let's use our ears here. It felt uh, like they knew that him not voicing Mario was kind of an unfortunate situation and that they did what they could right. to make up for it. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, there was probably... Because Illumination were probably like, <laughs> no, we're celebrities. Like, we're not, mm -hmm. we're not letting him play him. we got to get them big names up there on the, uh, on the, on the poster. Which is kind of... Um... Which is kind of funny, right? When it's like Mario, I feel like Mario. I don't know. I don't know that celebrity voice cast helps Mario make more that much more money, you know. But hey, who knows? Hey, indeed. So we could move on to one of two movies here. Should we leave it to chat? See which one they vote for more. Be interesting. I, might, Do I don't it. mind doing let's, either first. Let's come to the mob. You want us to first talk about the movie that is all about how Tetris was made slash, you know, released to the world, or the movie about dinosaurs with Adam Driver? I'm seeing a lot yeah. more 65. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot more 65 as well. Just I guess cool. it's more mainstream, sort of. I guess so. I don't even know, really. Yeah, it's an odd one. I saw that 65 was so bad. Maybe that's why people want us to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> I guess it's All right, 65. 65 it is. Yeah, sure. The people have Fuck spoken. It. Why not? Let's talk about 65 for all the things that there are to really dig into. Um, 65 is a movie starring mm -hmm. a guy and girl. And they there's dinosaurs. There are. And, oh, wow. That's... Wow, that's it. I was going to say, Rags, what the fuck? You just spoiled the whole movie and summarized the oh, entire yeah. plot. Well, I guess, you see, when I started talking, I thought it was going to go somewhere. And then I was like, oh, no, we're done. We found, the, we, we found the destination just right there. Look, there we go. It's like if Mountain Doom was next door to Bilbo's house. And he's like, oh, man, we got to go. Oh, no, it's right there. All right, well, that takes care of that. Um, and it doesn't do that well. <laughs> like, no, even it is that. Not only ex it's not only extremely simple. It's also extremely bad, and it wastes anything interesting that it could have done. I don't know if there's any real redeeming quality about this movie. I yeah, uh, guess Adam's driver's f acting fine with what he was told to do. Is that? There is that. Um, there's one kind of okay perspective shot right at the beginning with an asteroid flying ooh. towards the ship, but then the ship gets really big and the asteroid's really tiny by comparison. Like, the beginning looks kind of flashy, and then they get down to the planet and it looks terrible, and the creature design is awful, and they don't even seem to have read, like, the most basic book on dinosaurs ever. And they have no story Translate to tell there. Translator was broken. Translator was broken. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Well, I mean, we because we it won't take long to go through it. We'll probably go chronologically for the fuck of it. Uh, the, the film opens right, and, and this is the thing: a lot of people are watching this because of its premise. It's like he crash lands on a planet with dinosaurs because it's Earth. Oh my goodness! And it's like oh, so he's like an he's like a human, but he's an alien, right? And he's crashed on Earth before humans. He's like okay, so you go into the film thinking like, all right, that's why I'm here. What else have you got? You know, that's how films work sometimes. Stories work. It's like they yeah. hook you in and then they give you stuff you weren't even expecting. That is all the film has to give you. That is it. And they know that so fucking well that they're like, the opening, we're in space. And it's like, oh, these, these visuals are interesting. Blah, blah, blah. Then it goes, prior to the advent of mankind. It's like, oh. Uh, I thought that was going to be like, you know, something that we could gather. But okay. And then, and then in the vastness of space. Like... Yeah, I figured from the visual, like the infinity of space. It's like, okay, I got that. It's like, as films go, in terms of like an intro, it's like, this is not a great start, unfortunately, but it's, it's not addictive necessarily of anything. It's like, other civilizations explored the heavens. It's like, what are you doing? Why, why, why isn't it just no text? You didn't need text, but that's just like the... We had to tell the audience that as that. we were flying... We had to tell them that as we were flying through... <laughs> the the galaxy that we were flying through the galaxy we were exploring the universe they wouldn't have, you know when you're like watching a film for the first time and you have no idea what you're dealing with necessarily because i didn't even know i didn't check who wrote this and what they'd written before if i had i would have gone in with much less enthusiasm but uh you, know, you start out and it's like alien planet and uh good old tyler ren is chilling with his wife i guess and daughter and like the whole conversation he has with the wife is about how he needs to go on a on a trip for a while in order to make money to be able to pay for the treatment for his daughter so that she can live. And it's just like, okay, you told me all that very point blank. You could have you could have found a way so to so on the nose exposition. It's, it's like you could have found a way to do that interestingly. Who is ill, but I don't want to leave her. Well, you must leave this planet to save our daughter who is ill. Daughter gives performative cough, then he leaves. <laughs> yeah. The I hate her coughs. They were driving me nuts. Like, the pact has been sealed. <laughs> the plot has been established. We can now move forward with our lives. And, and, and yeah, it's just so blatant. But then he goes to talk to the daughter. He basically repeats all of that. And you're like, okay, got it again. Cool. Just making sure you understand. Yeah. And then it's okay. like, all right, now that that's done, skip to when he's in the ship. And you're just like, yeah, God, this is already feeling a little, little paint by numbers movie, but sure. And the first thing you see is the asteroid hit the ship. And like you're like, oh, no shields, no defensive measures, and no detection. That's all very strange. Like baby's first sci-fi. You think that's how that would work? And like you see this huge field very easily with the naked eye. Then the ship goes, hmm. There's an asteroid field ahead. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, probably yes, there probably is. Probably mention this to the pilot so that he can do nothing. You know, before you get there. Like, yeah, you, the ship doesn't even getting hit. like avert the direction in any way, shape, or it doesn't think to go like you know. We'll chill until the pilot wakes up, or we'll go around it. It just goes, no, we'll just go straight in and warn them. Hopefully they wake up. Later in the film, it's like, oh, it was unexpected. Yeah, even if it is unexpected, like, I don't know, can you not detect it? You can see it, it coming from so far away. Yeah. They show us, exactly. like I said, just normal eyes. You can see this shit coming from miles away. Yeah. So you, <sighs> Ship's radar should be able to detect it far, far ahead of the naked eye. But instead, it seems we have one of those spaceships that's... It's like one of those people who, when they're driving down the road, and maybe like a second before they change lanes, they put on their blinker, and then they just do it. Just to let you know that this <laughs> is what's about to happen. Prepare your anus. We are changing lanes. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it minces the ship completely. He loses, like, a shit ton of all the most important parts of it, and every passenger. They just get blown the fuck out. Uh, some of them are blown out when he's already crash landed onto Earth. Whoa, spoilers, Mahler. So that's the funny thing, right? Like, you you could you, you could. I, I think the film should have played with it a lot more. I would have made it possibly even try to make it so vague that it doesn't even get said at all in the film. You don't even necessarily know, like the creatures. Yeah, you don't, you just Maybe choose creatures together, that you... people don't know about that are actually real from yeah. ages ago. Dinosaurs from an age that are you know less well known and then maybe could you know people could be like oh maybe that was maybe that's earth that he landed on there doesn't affect the story in any way whatsoever what the name of the planet is but it would have been a nice little 
huh, maybe mm-hmm. that was Earth when the Dinothors were on the Earth and Dinothors mm-hmm. are cool. Um, yeah, right. and they keep flashing back to his daughter as well in like all scenarios. You're like, I know, you know, that's the <laughs> only thing you've really set. <laughs> so like, I know. Um, but yes, luckily one of the passengers survived. Well, their 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 um their uh hyper sleep thing survived, so he could get her out. And yeah, and that that's like a, your premise. He's trapped on a dinosaur infused world with a girl. And dinosaur they need to... infused. Well, we got, we got <laughs> this to world is infused the, um... with dinosaurs for extra flavor and a bit of fun. Hell yeah! We got to talk about the title thing. Right. That sorry. That that does happen straight after that sort of is established because <laughs> he he gets her and uh, to be fair, he has a wound and he uses sci-fi goo to to make it better. And it was kind of like a moment of, well, at least there's that. That feels like a yeah. thing that would happen. So yeah, and he's got a little sci-fi gun. It's like thank fuck. I hate it when they never have. Yeah, any he's weapons. got a sci-fi gun that doesn't have sights on it. Cause it's fuck it. It looks like it, it, <laughs> he moves it around like it weighs uh, one pound and it's a cheap plastic prop. It's like oh okay, all right, well. And right. uh, he does consider killing himself because of this awful scenario, but decides against it. Uh, the thing that happens though, just, I, I hate it so much, is he's walking around and he spots a big old footprint. And he's like, whoa. And doesn't the music get, like, hyper-overbearing at that point? The Isn't film... It? This film has shockingly little confidence in anyone watching it to know anything about what anything means. It was, um... They will not let you misunderstand. It's very bad that he is here and this is the scenario. But it was funny, because, like, uh... 65, a lot of people may not have caught straight away. It's a million years ago, that's the idea. This happens in the film at this point. I can probably show this. Yes, early, right? 65 is actually a reference uh, to the IQ of the writers. It's a very subtle hint so, uh, line for you to pick up. This happens like a fifth of the way in, funnily enough. It shows mm. this, and you're like, okay, fine. Like, intro movie credits, I guess. Just just the, you know, the le- 65 of the plan in the background. It's like, it's fine, it's fine. And then, uh, I don't know how fucking long this takes. It does that. It like, million long, years yeah. ago, you're like, yeah, I got it. Uh, oh I, my I, god, I, wow. <laughs> and, and see, it's like, the oh, we're done? Coming. We're done? Okay, cool. Yep, I got it. Yeah, But we're not done. And then it says, a visitor crash-landed on, and you're like, no, uh, you're not gonna do it. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, uh, you wouldn't, uh, no. <laughs> it's just, eh. uh, you don't think I'm on. that stupid, do you? <laughs> but the film does think you're that stupid. I'm glad that the film has the confidence in me as an audience member to put it in text, assuming that I can read. Uh, <laughs> it's it's the Rings of Power Southlands into Mordor thing. Yeah, and yeah. It's so clearly apparent. But no, we also have to relabel things just for the exceptionally slow kids in the back of the theater. But like, my abiding question no about all of this theater. is like, well, no, good point. No actually, there was no one watching it <laughs> except us, apparently. Um, <laughs> but the, the the abiding question is just like, why? Uh, what what about this script? Did you have some pressing need to to turn into a film? And they took ages. This is it the fifth attempt to put it out because coronavirus got in the way, and something else got in the way, and something else got in the way, and they kept trying to release it, and then it failed. They tried to release it, and it failed, didn't work. They kept working on this for ages, and eventually they thought, well, sod it, I guess, we'll just stick it in the cinema, and we'll see what happens. We won't do any serious right, like, real it. advertising well. for it. Yeah, we might as well. It's done now. Um, but just, just like the premise alone should really have disqualified it. I mean, why why do you need to do this? What was the point? Could you not have written literally anything else? It could have been a fun little action movie. If like this movie that's written well with a super simplistic plot where Adam Driver is just dealing with all these dinosaur shenanigans with this chick, that could have been neat and interesting. There's a lot you can do with that simple premise. And nothing neat or interesting was done with this simple premise in this movie. You know for a fact that the creators were like, you know... He has a daughter, and he's stranded with this little girl. You see the parallels, and you just be sitting there like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like, seriously? They're it's like, all you have to offer. It's just actually all you have to offer narratively. And they're like, but that's a story. And you're like, like yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I could, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is that, a story. That is the story. That is all that there is to it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, by the way, so trapped on a planet with dinosaurs with little girls. It's like, oh, we doing... Uh, you know, wolf and cub situation. It's like, well, she can't speak English, so I that really it's not an impossibility, but it's very hampered, unfortunately. Wait, wait, did you say wolf and cub? Yeah, aren't wolf aren't, aren't juvenile wolves called pups? Wolf and or cub puppies? story references like wolf, 
a storytelling thing, not necessarily biology or accurate. Because I I feel like just I feel like that it'd be it would be like a like lion and cub or bear and cub, right? You know. I don't make the rules, Rex. I just follow well, the colloquial someone ones. Someone ought to. The idea is well, oftentimes it's they're not even um, familial. The two. Oh, it's like the idea, okay. right? Like you have a, like a, a lone Mowgli wolf and, and then a Gira. Sure. Well, it's just, that's what you know. That's the Last of Us, Logan, like Children of Men. Like yeah, a lot of the time they are actually yeah. disconnected from different worlds, sort of thing. Yeah. A little little ape and child. Yes. And uh, I quite like it as an archetype. It's always fun and interesting to clash mm -hmm. two very different people in a situation. But uh, it's been said before, I think Mandalorian's probably the best example of fucking it up. It's like, it is a baby. It doesn't add anything. It just goes goo goo gaga. -ga. It's basically cargo. Uh, the thing is, I don't want to say that it's like... And I, I know that's not what you're saying, but to make it clear, to rule out like doing these more unconventional kind of pairings with like a character who can't talk or a character who uh, can't communicate with the other person because they speak a different language or, you know, like one of the characters is like deaf or something um, as like these sort of barriers to communication. Like these things can be leveraged really well. In this case, I think it's done pretty poorly. <laughs> Yeah, or you could just be um, like, shit at it, and we don't well, really learn anything about these case, characters like, ever. Adam Driver, like, consistently forgets that she can't, like, speak English, and that there's really <laughs> no reason for her to understand anything that he's saying, Is but it... often she does. Anyway, I would be fine yeah. with him talking at her or in general, because that's just how he's dealing with the situation, but there are often times where he says something to her, and it's it looks like he thinks she understands what he's saying, and it's like, but you know she doesn't. So yeah, why are you doing then... that? To his defense, she will randomly pick out, like, the important words and somehow sort of know what they mean. It's sort of the worst of both worlds, where you have a breach of communication, so you don't get any interesting, like, back-and-forth story stuff. But then you also get, like, it makes Adam Driver look like a moron in this movie because he's acting in a certain way uh, that you wouldn't if someone was there communicating with you. Because when he watches this movie, you think, oh, like, if I was Adam Driver, what would I do to communicate this? And I, whatever your idea was just now, it's better than whatever was in the movie. I mean, yes. this movie sucks at trying to portray a, you know, an adult, Adam Driver, as being someone who's trying to oh, communicate and, with, you know. Yeah, I definitely didn't mean to imply, like, because on the Wolf and Cub thing, you could even probably run a story where it's a baby and a guy and make it work. Because um, Mandalorian yeah, but... was never in a position where it could never work or anything. Uh, it's just that... There are choices you make. If you're going to hamper yourself in terms of easy avenues for payoffs and development, then you're going to have to work that much harder. And this film makes it so she can't speak English, which is like, okay, if you want to do that, right. you're going to have to do I a bunch of other wanna, stuff. You know they can't, like, talk if you do that, right? Oh, you do know? Okay, well, I'm sure you'll do something interesting to balance mm. that. Oh, you're not? Oh, okay, then. Well, I guess you can just fucking grunt for 90 minutes. That's fun, too. Oh, yeah. I guess that's worth mentioning at some point. Not necessarily not now, but it's an hour and a half movie... And it's fucking long. It goes way too long. long. It feels a lot longer than the Mario movie. Despite Mario being movie's the same like, length. Yeah, yeah, Mario movie's about 90 minutes too. And uh, that by. film was just flying by because stuff was always happening. There was always something to look at and listen to and always a little joke to notice or something was going on. And in this, boy, uh, wow, very little occurs. And, and you'll what never little be... does occur, half of it is a repetition. You'll never be surprised either by this film. Uh, You'll be shocked by how shocked you aren't. Like it is almost like it's working really hard to make you bored so you don't pay attention to it. It's, <laughs> yeah. like it's part of a strategy of the film. If you look closely at the thing, it's even worse. So if it's just sort of boring bad and it stops you looking at, say, creature design, then they've probably done a reasonably good job because at least you won't be picking out the really, really nasty, shitty flaws in the thing. Well, and to give an idea of what kind of film you're dealing with, right, he, he looks down over a, um, like a ledge and he sees some dinosaurs running around. He's like, hmm. And then one just jumps at him, seemingly out of nowhere, just onto him. just going, blah, 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 blah. And then he like, beats it up with the gun. And he's like, is it dead? Is it dead? And he moves real close to it, real slowly, real close. And he goes, blah, blah, blah. And this goes oh, like, Oh, God, it wasn't actually dead. I, it's not, but now it's dead. Okay, we're good. It's such a, like... <laughs> that was exciting, though. It's one of those scenes one where you're just like, man, how many times have we seen that scene? Like a thousand at this point? Thousand, thousand is fucking annoying. Yeah, you just like, oh, there's so little, and I know all of what it will be, and it's still somehow worse than I imagined. Yeah. This is this movie is just like a waste of film, you know? 
yeah, everything involved has just has got wasted, unfortunately, and it's mainly because the script is fucking abysmal. Yeah, script is virtually non-existent to bad. Um, I'm, like, legitimately thinking what I think the best part of a movie is, not counting the lull when it ended. Um, uh, <laughs> some of the CGI wasn't terrible. Oh, we got a funny like Adam Driver yell. Yeah. He but, goes, but, yeah. That was funny. I think that was legitimately the only laugh we got out of the movie. When, and it was supposed was, to be like a tragic, dramatic moment. It was that little device that shows like a digital vision of him in the dinosaur fight, and you, it shows that for a little bit during the fight. And that's that was that was something, right? That would that could have been something that was kind of nifty, yeah. But we were talking about like all the ways that that could have been interesting and better, and memorable. Um, mm. uh, the characters are dumb. Adam Driver's dumb in this. We'll just call him Guy. Guy is dumb, and girl just makes some noises, and she's dumb too. Super They're both dumb. dumb. Yeah. Uh, the dinosaur segments are dumb. Uh, it's it's just what a what a what a shit film. So uh, someone's just that... selectively highly competent though. So she'll be dumb and mute for the most part. But then occasionally the film will need her to do something like I don't know, make a spear and then jab that spear into the eye of a fake dino at some point. So like she's selectively very it's very highly skilled. It was attacking him. Um. Yeah. He was deadly. Yeah. She had to save him. From the dinosaur. We were, felt very, very bad for that dinosaur by the end. <laughs> it's, yeah. He got both You're of his eyes running. taken out and then, like, melted. Yeah. I felt bad um, for the dinosaur. That was the character I felt worse for than anyone else, was the dinosaur. I felt bad for him. I felt mm -hmm. like, oh, he's just being a dinosaur. It's not his fault. Why'd you have to be, like, this much of a jerk to him? You could have just left in your space shuttle. Oh, man. Ooh, oh, nice yeah. The, the plot... Oh, yeah, go Sorry. ahead, go for it. Oh, I was well, going to say what might be more interesting. Probably not, actually, no. But I was going to say what might have been funny if, if the giant, because the film sort of wraps up the, with the the extinction event, the huge asteroid. I wasn't sure if the film was even going to try and do this, but like, is is there a world in which the ship he was on that crashed into the asteroid, um, is actually it knocked the asteroid into the path of our planet? In which case, like, he is indirectly responsible. For oh it. my god, Adam Driver funny. killed the dinosaurs. That'd be hilarious. But it. he's like. God, he created man, kind of, not really, but still. Beautiful. Give us a chance to take over. Uh, yeah, something I wanted to bring up was like, you know, they have all this amazing space age tech and stuff. It's like, they don't have a translator. It's like, they did, it got broken. Oh, no, that would have been so useful throughout the movie if they could, like, have conversations and talk to each other and discuss their thoughts. It's really funny because they have several console type, like, you know, pieces of tech, be it on the ships or in handheld form, but like none of them apparently have a working translator. It's just like, uh huh. Well, the handheld oh, no. all-purpose scanner, so that he falls down into into a cave and it can detect air flows to guide him out of the cave. He can point it at a light in the sky and it can say "catastrophic yeah. asteroid detected." So yeah, it's not the only catastrophe That's I've bad. detected in this film, but it's it's uh, definitely one of them. <laughs> what? Rule. Um. Uh. Yeah, because what, what Rags was saying about him trying to teach her stuff, there are several moments where he is trying to uh, communicate with her, but they're all pathetic. I think the yeah, the, the water flask the, one was one of the really bad ones for us. Just like, oh my god, he could be doing this. Water flask was bad. Eating the berries as a no no is bad. There was like the the mountain when he mm -hmm. makes the little mountain thing. We have to go to the mountain. Uh, like virtually all attempts at communication are done extremely poorly. To the point where I would not blame her at all for not knowing anything. He's being very irresponsible by not telling her you know, that the berries are not edible in a better way. He su Guy sucks. He does, and there's a lot of... Uh, the film's got to nerf him quite a bit a lot of the time because otherwise this would be too easy. And so we'll get like a horde of dinosaurs coming at him in order to make that like uh, something he has trouble dealing with. But you also get like... He climbs up a tree to get a better view of something clearly stands on a on a branch that's like already breaking and it's like the the camera will zoom in on it be like ah see something's gonna happen here and it's like yeah, it's gonna break and it does and then he loses his footing and fucking lands on his arm and dislocates it and it's like you didn't think maybe you should step on something a little bit more sure-footed than that it's like yeah well fuck you we gotta get him in some kind of trouble somehow and yeah it often feels like that's the kind of thing the movie's doing it's just going through the motions until they get to the location but 
oh no, he's broken his arm now, and oh no, there's a horde of dinosaurs that are just about to attack him. You're like, oh. oh. my goodness, but the reason that he broke his arm, he dislocated his arm or whatever, was because he decided that he really needed to climb this one tree. Instead of find, it's like it's a it's a consistent through line with this movie is that he's dumb, yeah. so it it's really tough to feel for him or tough to like sympathize because he's just constantly doing stupid stuff. Um, yeah, I and a lot I, of that wow, shit, we gotta... shit in mediocre films where it, like she run she runs off to hide somewhere and it turns out she's right next to another huge like fucking set of dinosaurs. Like it was just to her right. It's like oh she didn't see them. When she ran into the into the place, the first place, she's like, ugh, um, so fucking funny. It's just, it's, the camera just pads around. It's like, look, <laughs> this swarm. <laughs> wow, know? look, I thought they're swarms. all here. Damn, um, didn't see them. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm really. Uh, I'm really. I'm really proud of us. We talked about the movie this long. Already, yeah. Um, we're, we're like halfway through to... already in terms of timeline. <laughs> so we're getting there. It's close to the end. Um, this movie felt like it was six. Remember how long, years long they did the scene of him oh, trying to whistle to get her to stop being sad? Oh yeah, that God went on for damn, a while. That lasted a long ass time. Jeez, I just wanted the dinosaurs to eat them. Oh my goodness, I was like, I just didn't care about any of them. They were both too stupid to live. None of them were, none of them were interesting. They didn't do anything interesting with the ideas. So I'm like, I don't know, like, just be like a fine dinosaur food. What? What is the insane coincidence that they happen to land on Earth the day before the asteroid hits? It's fucking like you gotta Isn't have that, that moment like, where phenomenal? they desperately escape as the asteroid hits Earth, the very one that wiped out the dinosaurs. You're like, God, you're so fun, aren't you? Like <laughs> you're just having all the fun things happen. Isn't that so interesting? Um, they had the like they hit, so they hit the asteroids on the way into the planet. Mm -hmm. And then, even though that should be, like, what, many years away or something like that, they're just, like, instantly crash landing on Earth, and then the asteroids have to catch up with them, I guess. I don't Which know. doesn't feel like it lines up, but whatever. I'm not really sure what's happening there. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little confused. This is part where they are uh, in a cave, and the big open entrance of it, T-Rex head comes through, whatever fucking dinosaur it is, I don't really care. And he oh, shoots yeah, it in raining. the face, okay. and I think I remember you, Rags, being like, you'll kill it if you shoot that thing in the face. You have a sci-fi gun. Oh well, yeah, it's his, like a laser gun. It shoots, shoots it several lasers. times, and his blood all over it, and its eye is apparently burst by this exchange. And then they're like, ah, oh, run! And they run into, like, the spooky cave and go real deep, and it's like, you were winning. You're, oh, you yeah, do just, that. I'm shocked it survived that. Because remember, the other one, they, like, hit it, and it just, like, essentially dies... I was yeah, confused if it was he a... He one-shots that one, doesn't he? So there's the one later on where he shoots it once in the head and it dies. And then... well, thing, I think it survived, but I was confused. I thought there was a yeah, third T-Rex. I think there was three in total, yeah. was there? Or was there not? I'm not sure. I think there's three. Or I thought it got... Because... So it's... Yeah. It comes back. It got shot in the face by the laser and it got its eye shot out. It comes back for revenge, right? back for more. Which I guess... I mean, maybe he's just curious. He was seeing what was going on in that cave. Mm -hmm. Oh, remember the little proximity things around there that when they slept? He puts the little things down. He does, and they mm. seem... I think they detect way more than where they are, but it's still very strange. It was like, what? what's the idea? Is it detecting outside of the cave? He, or he, the... he puts down these, like, little radar things around where they're sleeping, like little pylons or whatever, and they turn and they say, oh, no, there's danger. Because there was a bug in her mouth, and he, and then, I, I don't know, I, and then he, like, breaks one to, it's, it's, like, yeah. the sci-fi tech in this sucks balls. They could have done something interesting with cool sci-fi tech, like a, like a science fiction survival kit, when, when you have, so in a, in um, oh, what was it, I, was, I think it was, like, the Foundation uh, series that Asimov wrote, there was, um, because, it's a super far in the future, and there's a gajillion planets that humans are on, and they, they go all across the galaxy, and the scale of the, you know, the traversal area is extremely vast. There is, the, there's these allusions to, with an A, um, this, this idea that if you are in a spaceship with your crew, and you're going out from to this planet to that planet, wherever you're going, and you crash land on a, a, a world that's habitable, then your job is to essentially become settlers for that planet. 
And so you all start getting together, making kids, building civilization. And that essentially is part of how humanity spreads, is they, they tell everyone that you're supposed to essentially make this planet a new planet for humanity. And so you'd think they'd have the, these ships that are crossing the galaxy that have these super cool, like, sci-fi survival kits and really neat things that they could have pulled out and used. And he's like, oh, I don't know if they're going to find us. We're X miles from, you know, the last beacon or whatever we sent out. It might be years until they get here. We don't know. They might be. They don't explore any of that. Any of the cool sci-fi elements of this movie are just nothing. If anything, it works against the movie. They dismiss it right at the beginning when he sends the distress message. And his first version says, send help. And then his second version says there's no need for recovery. It's like, but you've just, you know, the film has established that you're a spacefaring civilization that explores other planets. You've just landed on a habitable planet. You don't yet know about the Megadeth asteroid. Uh, you might think that actually there's every reason for them to come and pick you up, regardless of whether you happen to yeah. be alive or not. Because there might, you're there might on be a ship a week world. away, for all yeah, we know. That's true. Or, or like two days to the left or right or up or down or wherever. That's, um, we, don't, we don't know. That's there's, a conflict like, of like different intentions though because i think they wanted us to take away from that that he's just like don't come rescue me i just want to die because i'm sad because of the daughter thing uh that they reveal a little bit later that she died but the, th the fact is like you, you i don't even think they would accept that if you sent a message out to this highly advanced civilization like oh i i crash landed here on this habitable planet don't rescue me they'd be like what i don't, I don't well, know like any robinson crusoe right the that that story is from the perspective of him writing down all the things that he does. Um, and so it could have been like an interesting, I'm sure it's been done before, but fuck it, do it again. It's a neat idea. This premise of essentially Robinson Crusoe in space. I've crash landed on this alien world. How do I live and survive? Do I eventually meet up with people looking for me or just, they just happen to, you know, our civilization is expanding. So any habitable world like earth would be, that'd be like crazy real estate, you know? Um, any, it, any sci-fi element that could have made this really cool and interesting and dare I say world building, mm -hmm. um, is just, it's just, it's not, it's here. There's, there's nothing here that's interesting about it. It's so lame. It could have, it's just guy in the woods with some chick and then they go home. Well, they get end. deep into this cave too and they're like, well, there's no real ways to go further now. So I guess we're fucked. The whole time we were just like, go back, go back, go, go back. back, go back. And then he's like, what if we use the grenades to try and blow a way over? It's like, oh yeah, that can't backfire. There's nothing <laughs> that'll go wrong with grenading the walls of a cave. I don't get it. It's, it's the characters are just, the characters are too stupid for me to care. Like, yeah. I'm like oh, you're not a real person. You're just an idiot. How doesn't he know a... how it can go wrong? And then, uh, if you guys never would have seen this coming, there's a cave-in. There's a oh cave-in, and they get separated and presumed dead on either side, and it's like, wow. Crazy that that would happen. And yeah, you're getting close to, like, the fucking third act at that point, and you're just like, good god, just end. <laughs> like, there's no reason for me to continue this crazy bullshit. Um, but yeah, they... He falls in a... Uh... I don't even know what it is. It's like a... You know, like sand? Like, well, I think so, mud? yeah. It, lo it looked like goo. or was it, uh, mud, uh, mud, yeah, mud, sand, th whatever Ringy. situation. Was it goo? That I, he fell in? I, I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah. It looked gooey, know. but really runny. Yeah. It was yeah. very, very... Yeah, it's are like things a gross viscous? cereal. I forget how it works sometimes. Was it very viscous or not viscous? I think goo is. Do you have viscosity viscous. if you flow more, or do you have less viscosity if you uh, flow more? I forget. I think I it's think... less. I think. Yes. Okay. Because viscosity means like thickness, kind of. Oh, because well, the characters had a lot of viscosity, but the quicksand did not. It mm -hmm. was very gloopy and runny. And he's about mm. to die, and then she saves him, and then he's like, "The comet's about to hit. We're all about to die. Oh my god, it's, it's the worst thing ever." Ah. And they get to the, the this ship that they've been trying to get to to save escape pods in there. Unfortunately, they get it all sorted out, and then fucking two T Rexes arrive, and it's just like, oh, yeah, no. this is this is as far as you went, wasn't it? It was he lands here, and then he has to fight the dinosaurs. That's all you had. Also, yeah, but his daughter noting, though, and you're like, uh huh. Yeah, it's also worth noting how very very convenient it is that the little girl turns up to save him just in time because they're separated in the cave. They come out of different entrances. Mm -hmm. Presumably she has no way of orienting herself. It's just complete potluck that she happens to run off in the same direction as he does uh, at roughly the same pace, even though 
he is much bigger and taller and stronger and just arrives just in time. So he's gone under the, the sinking goo or whatever we're calling it. Um, <laughs> and he is, for all intents and purposes, drowning. And then, yeah, she just appears in time with a huge tree branch and helps him out, which is she very lucky. a tree, like, down into the... The the whole goose sequence is terrible. Sorry, I mean not goose sequence. The whole like quicksand sequence yeah. sucks. Um, because he like falls into this really really. It looks like he should just be able to swim in it, but he he like sinks into quicksand and it goes up over his head, and then she happens to randomly stumble across it and she takes this like is this tree that's really bendy, and she bends it down into the quicksand and he grabs it i guess because he knew it was there and she saves him and then that's done and they move on instead of him probably she should have been terrified that he almost like drowned in mud that would have been a little you know existential bit of terror but i guess it wasn't really and when the two treks attack he like gets his gun it's like well this is gonna be over quick and then the gun is like do not recognize thumbprint do not recognize the thumbprint he's like oh no and it's just sitting like oh, no. fuck off like, of course that's the only way you can make this have any tension. You would just fucking wreck the T-Rex otherwise. And then, like, he gets under a log and activates it through, like, uh, I guess, like, a code instead. And I was just like, why did he do that? The second the thumbprint doesn't work, you do the code instead. It takes him, like, a split second. You have to go boom, 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 and it's open. Why don't you just do that? Well, his character isn't portrayed as being, like, a warrior or a soldier or anything, but he's really good with that gun. When it works. Um... Of yeah, <laughs> it's but that's like the gun's fault, not his. Yeah. in a way. Well, but um, I guess I'm saying he's not very good with a gun if he can't immediately when it's like jammed on the thumbnail scanner to thumbnail thumb scanner. He should uh, just do the code, but you know we needed that gap of of spooks. But um, all he does is unload anyway. As soon as it's activated, need he just the mildest of tension. They even I have to talk about this shit. So they just yeah. the girl distracts the dinosaurs by playing a hologram of his daughter. And he's, like, sad when seeing it. And then they have the T-Rex is so distracted by it, it tries to eat the hologram. And I honestly think that was the creators being like, you see how tragic it is? He has to witness the death of his daughter once again. <laughs> he's crying, and it's like, fucking what? What are we doing? You know, that could have been a really cool, like, an actual setup and payoff if we found out that he had, like, a little moment. It's, like, essentially like a photo album, but a sci-fi version of it. Because, remember, this is a science fiction movie, actually. But he has, like, the photo album thing, and it makes the holograms, and he uses that as bait for the dinosaurs later, where his, his daughter, like, saves him. He couldn't save her, but she ends up saving him. Oh, my God, that's something. That's something. I think... Dear God, that's something. It's, that's the thing about, like, how you portray a thing. I was just watching the dinosaur, like, at a hologram. I'm, just, I'm supposed to treat that as, like, incredibly sad and symbolic of the loss of his daughter. I'm just like, nah. I think it's funny. I'm sorry. And I'm like, oh, you suck. Y'all, this <laughs> sucks. This movie sucks balls, okay? <laughs> yeah. It sucks so bad. I'm surprised we talked about it this long. And I've already said that before. We, I'm we've almost hit surprised. credits because he just kills the two T-Rexes and then the thing third evil one arrives. Oh, we didn't talk about her saving the baby dinosaur and it gets at. Oh, that was that was that was funny. funny. Yeah, that was funny. Hilarious. Sorry, you're right. Let me go back and find it. Yeah, because they're, they're wandering oh around and she spots this cute, happy dinosaur in like a mini tar pit, like going, oh no, I'm dying. Ah. And then she's like, no, and runs to it and he runs to it. And this is like, oh, it's such generically happy, like we got him and he's safe. And he's like, yay, I'm a safe, happy, cute dinosaur now. Then it walks off and gets eaten. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's like a fucking comedy beat. <laughs> but I don't think it was I think it's supposed to be tragic. <laughs> it's like... I think it was supposed to be tragic, but it was funny because they see this large creature in the mud and they save it and it gets eaten by the little ones. And then they have to hide from the little bitty dinosaurs. Even though you Remember? know for a fact Robert that you could does. annihilate them probably without the gun. Yeah, you'd probably well, just kick them and they'd fuck off because he's big and strong. Throughout the film, they give up on, like, food that they already have to expend more energy to hunt something else. That's yeah. a, that's a thing that happens in movies and shit a lot. Yeah. It's like, I know I just killed something, but like, and I've got this free meal right here, but what's that, a little small scrawny thing that's running away into the woods? I better go chase yeah, that. Like, it's, it's, like, they're animals, you know? Like, dinosaurs were animals. They do have self-preservation instincts and, like, a desire to not waste energy when they've already got food, you know? But hey, drama, right? This movie well, sucks. 
Especially with, you say drama, like the fucking, the way they have the bad guy dinosaur show up at the end with the missing yeah, eye, you know? Yeah, like, and then dramatic. I dramatic know you, Adam Driver. <laughs> you took so my eye. Dramatic pauses when it's like, what are you doing? If he wants to eat him, just let him, like, just hurry up. Get this movie over with. They're trying to inspire a sense of, like, truly man versus nature or man versus dinosaur. I'm just like, you did such a piss poor job of that. I really did. Like, I just, yeah. I, 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 I find it, like, really hard to say much about this film. It's so, like... We've almost so like, expended every last moment of it, I think. <laughs> it, it might be one of the lamest films I've seen in a while. This yeah. is a really lame movie that didn't have... It, there's no reason it had to be lame. It didn't have to no, be lame. I, the whole hook was to. a cool factor, and they wasted it. Yeah. Um, as some... They're wondering, it's like, is this worse or better than Jurassic World Dominion? Oh, well, Dominion's we haven't gotta seen it, be... but I'd assume Dominion's worse. I haven't worse. seen it, but I assume Dominion's worse. This is mostly bad because it just doesn't... I imagine I this mean, is more boring. This is definitely more boring than Dominion. Yeah, I haven't um, seen Dominion, by the way. Okay, no spoilers then. It's not very good. <laughs> no spoilers. <but> just... <laughs> Wouldn't want to spoil that one. But, um, just passing badges, though, like, he's about two meters away from the fucking T-Rex at the start of this, and then he manages to outrun it at night all the way to, like, dawn. Somehow. It's like an open field. He's just running. And the, it keeps showing the dinosaur chasing him, but it keeps editing the dinosaur further back every shot. It's that, that old and trope. He's <laughs> so clearly so much faster than he is. Yeah. And it never, just never quite manages to get there. Um, very, Way very faster. convenient editing, that one. Um, yeah, he baits it to the, um, the geysers, and it just one of them hits the dinosaur, and then he's about to get eaten, because it's only wounded it, and she stabs it in the face. In the eye specifically, and then he gets like hardcore fucking melted, and you yeah, can't help but feel bad. Oh, yeah. really bad for him. Yeah, they land in Yellowstone National Park, and Old Faithful spurns him, <laughs> and think, he gets so lumpy. I think what it is I don't like about it is it's like dinosaurs just trying to like survive, and he gets this horrible death, and and like it's punctuated by the fact that he was about to just get vaporized. You know, get a horrible like, death anyway. Oh, yeah. well, no, that would have been instant, right? That well, been yeah, long, depending on where he is, away. I guess, but... It's like he got a horrible end right when the world was about to end anyway. I think that's what's funnier is that where they leave... It's like, like when you're about to win in a video game, but you still have to get that last kill on some guy. <laughs> um, kind of. I'm pretty sure the asteroid like hits right in the area that they were as well, just to add more dumbassery to the whole thing. Like... Where they're lifting off from oh, the asteroid, yeah, like passes yeah. by the them. Asteroid's right there. Like they they miss it by like maybe thirty seconds. Like really, couldn't be, couldn't be like you know they they leave like the day before it gets. To yeah, that <laughs> that shot where it's like, look at that, they're yeah, just right that. fucking next to each oh. other. It's just dumb. And also the fact that he just think about that, right? Like he 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 crash lands right where the fucking thing. <laughs> like is gonna hit. You know, like Earth is Earth's pretty big. It's a big place, um, yeah. Most most of the Earth didn't get impacted specifically by the meteorite. Obviously, the whole world got like massively screwed up because of it, but it just had to be right there. And then he escapes just in the nick of time as the well, they hey, they do know, a skip. Like, he gets into like fucking orbit, and the yeah, the asteroid yeah. moves like a meter. Like it skips mm -hmm. so hard. Just like yeah, look how close it was, guys. Yeah, he and made he, it. If this film showed a bit more restraint. <laughs> If it showed even, like, a modicum of restraint. Like, imagine if, if you had the title show up here at the end, and it's like, ah, see? Yeah, there you go. Without any of the extra text underneath it, just the title. And then hopefully by then, everybody would have figured it out. Oh, that was Earth proper, you know? Mm -hmm. Instead of just putting that at the front with all of the, oh, in the vastest space before humanity. Yeah, by saying before human. humanity, you've already ruined it because we could have assumed that Adam Driver was a human from Earth. There's no oh, reason why you couldn't yeah. have done that. It could have been is. an alien. That would have been neat. Well, yeah, it's but just we don't, a we guy. Don't... They didn't even Nobody... give him the pointy ears or the Star Trek forehead is, bumps like, or anything. They didn't give a fuck. I, got, I gotta say, like, it, I'm getting so frustrated with, like, I like aliens. I like actual, like, aliens that aren't just, like, people or people with, like, blue paint on. Like, I like it when they're, like, like different Feb. looking critters, like, in Mass Effect. You know? Where, like, you've got, like, Quarians and, and Turians and Solarians, even though all of them are, you know, 
they stand on two. They're all like you know, hominids, but there's yeah, they're, they're they're distinctly annoying, but they difference distinct. in their shape yeah. and their like they, their their profiles are I mean, all indi- you know, distinguishable. The, uh, you know, like the Vanar and stuff, like much more critter looking like aliens. Hanar, are, yeah, yeah. I, I, did I say, uh, yeah, Hanar, that's what they were called, right? Yeah. Um, it, I like seeing aliens and I'm tight because we saw it in that trailer for the Marvels as well, right? Where they've gone to like some alien planet, but it's all people. There's humans. I'm tired of it. I'm, I'm yeah, just, like, like I understand why they did this in Star Trek in the 60s. Yeah, you exactly. Know? But like now, but, uh, you have the resources, you know, you have the money to just do the aliens and get all of the incredibly elaborate makeup or just visual effects. I'm, I mean, I'm what so... if? Because the aliens, it's not just the aesthetics, which can be interesting, but imagine them going through this with an alien mindset, like an alien culture, where Adam exactly. Driver plays like he's this is a military ship making just like a cargo run between two outposts and the the ship crashes maybe because they're at war with another alien species you know and then as it crashes he discovers there's this little girl who's a stowaway but he's this hardened battle guy and he doesn't he's no nonsense and everything like that and he's got this big you know warrior honor culture and she's just like a little girl or whatever and instantly you have something that's like like neat and different and you know, I guess not too different, but you know, it's something other than just, oh look, it's some guy. It's I mean, like because this film would probably try and sneak away with being considered like, oh, it's your normal average generic film. It's like normal average cool good generic would be more like what Rags just said, plus like you have engineer character, character who's maybe more comic relief, chill, he was there on vacation character who is the saboteur the one that actually damaged the ship and reduced its abilities to see i don't know fields and different things in order to um he wants to kill someone in that group or something as, as part of some of the drama that has nothing to do with this actual ship but they all crash they all have to work as a team do you know what it reminds me of uh pitch black Ooh, work as a team oh yeah mm-hmm. pitch black mm-hmm. we got to do that trilogy we got to watch sometime. pitch black again at some point so i always loved that film yeah. when i was younger uh, pitch black is neat Premise of that is a big old ship that's carrying prisoners and, um, you know, vacation people. It all crashes on a very dangerous planet and they all have to work together. Very straightforward. That would be where I'm more happy to say, you know, generic, standard, fun, good. Maybe I need to see it again. But this does not deserve that. This film's terrible. Like, it completely mm-hmm. squanders every last piece of storytelling it could possibly have. It doesn't deserve to be called, like, well, yeah, mediocre. Because, like, it's... Its ideas are, frankly, like, not that interesting. The high concept is all right of, like, oh, they're on a planet, but as it turns out, it's actually this place, and that's, like, gradually revealed over the course of the story. But, I mean, that's not worth... Like, that's that's not worth anything if the execution is, like, this feeble. It's like mm-hmm. every... Like, all of the ideas are really basic, and even those ideas aren't executed well. well there's plenty of stupid stuff in it. It's just, I don't know. It's it, I, don't, I don't consider this to be, like, even remotely valuable. <laughs> it's like an experience. Yeah. Um, I mean, some I mean some camera guys got paid, uh, and some yeah, CGI some animators cool, did a half-assed job. There are some cool landscapes. Know, like there are some cool landscape shots. Yeah. Um, oh, and it's also, the soundtrack is incredibly insistent and generic as well. <laughs> yeah, it's got yeah. that, too. It tells you how to feel at every well, every moment. Sometimes I like that we have episodes where we can talk about stuff like this, because this, this will all be forgotten by me, so at least it's now recorded and can be <laughs> played again and again, theoretically, by people if they wanted to know what I thought of this movie, because I will not remember what I think of this movie in about a couple months. Like, <laughs> yep. there was stuff in it. I won't, I, My brain cannot hold on to stuff like this. It's just like, nah. This is just the movie that decays in your mind. Your brain knows to just push this out to make room for something else. Your brain is like, yeah, you could remember this movie, but you might need to know the year of the Battle of Hastings, so we better hold on to that one. <laughs> yeah, we're going to keep that instead. Yeah. I, I only watched it two days ago, I think. Admittedly, there was a lot of whiskey involved in a house party in the intervening day, but I, <laughs> I was forgetting most of this film as we were describing it. So I'd forgotten the cave sequence completely. Um, it's, it's that unmemorable. <laughs> that takes it's, too it's long as of, well, that scene. All of it takes too long. It's kind of like a performance art piece in its own way. It's, it's just like, how oppressively bland can you possibly make a film? So, well, this this is a pretty good entry. Yeah. And I saw someone saying, like, why would Adam Driver have agreed to this? Like, he's he's doing all kinds of movies. Is it, yeah, first off, there's money. But it's second black. off, I mean, this could have been cool. Yeah. And con- yeah, the like, concept of, you know, a, a kind of movie like this, there's nothing about this, which is... I think that the, way, cool. it, the way it was sold to people through, you know, word of mouth was better than the movie. Like, 
you start out with a man who's doing a thing with a ship and it crashes in some kind of sci-fi accident, whatever, ends up on a planet with dinosaurs. He's not human. That's the reveal. It turns out this is Earth from ages ago and he's an alien. So, like, oh, okay. And you just find out, like, that's all the film had. That was it. You find that out in the first fucking five minutes. They tell you what... before you can even understand any characters. They're like, humans aren't a thing yet. You're like, oh. Well, what about the ones where, like, humans aren't a thing yet? Okay. All right. He looks, it looks like Adam Driver, though. But okay. Oh, hey, is this Earth? Is. This is Earth. You're like, this oh. is Earth. <laughs> this was 65 million years ago <laughs> on planet Earth. Earth. <laughs> now go tell your friends. <laughs> okay, it's a great idea you got there. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to tell anyone about this movie. Boo. This movie sucks. <laughs> if you didn't yeah. gather our feelings about this, like, mm -hmm. I'm happy to move on to the the last one now. If you yeah. guys, I'm I'll happily move on. Assuming to, uh, it's not done anything box office wise, and so there's no threat of a sequel. Threat? <laughs> there's no threat yeah. of people talking about it ever again. I don't think. I think, it, I think I had a budget of 45 million and made 55 million. Didn't even get to the 65 million. It didn't even down. get to 65. Oh, no. <laughs> didn't even get there. Uh, uh, did you mention it was written by the guys who wrote A Quiet Place? Which, when you said that, I was like, oh, well, yeah. okay then. Oh, uh, written and directed by the guys who wrote A Quiet Place. Yeah, and uh, I think Sam Raimi produced it as well. Don't know what that means. Don't, don't know what that means, though. Uh, but yeah, yeah. knowing the, the people who wrote A Quiet Place, which once again has its premise and then just fucks up everything going forward. It's like, mm. that doesn't surprise me at all. Oh, not very good. And yeah. uh, Which means we've got one part, one major portion of the scale left to fill Brings with this selection to the, of three. Uh, to the best film out of the three. Tetris. A movie yes. that is not really what people may have expected. You almost want to immediately tell people, no, not a bunch of blocks with a bunch of expressions running around trying to complete lines in the world of Tetris or something in an animated way. It is the story of how Tetris became what it is today. It's how it started. Pretty cool. And it's a story that I knew, I think, from talking to you, Free, um, before this film was even conceived yeah. of. And it always struck me as like, that probably could make a good film, actually. Well, it's, um, I, I love Tetris. Um, I think it's one Who of the doesn't? best videos. Tetris is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I, th I think well, it's like... Do you love Tetris? Actually, no. I have <gasps> never got on with Tetris, but I love Damn. the film. Oh my god. You are human. Well, that's what that's the fuck is wrong that's with you? <laughs> I guess. That's okay. We, we found the one. It's all right. We forgive you. <laughs> um... Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I really like Tetris. Um, like it's, it's at its core, it's like, damn, man, if you want to make a case for a game, it's like you nailed it, you got it. Like it's, it wouldn't change anything. It's like conceptually incredible. Like in, and in, in terms of uh, playing it, like the amount of versatility that the core gameplay loop has. It's like, damn, man, Tetris is, oh, like it's, it's, it's hard to beat that. Yeah, um, and because uh, we're yeah. probably gonna skip around the whole film a bit. Um, but I really enjoyed that we didn't just get a retelling of history. There's a couple points that the film wants to make, I think, broadly, about not just, um, I don't know, the creator or video games or art, but, like, human experience is kind of cool. There's the mm -hmm. sequence in the nightclub where they're all listening to, uh, like, it's the final countdown sort of, yeah, like, sequences with that. And uh, he's like, come on, how could you possibly resist, like, dancing to this? This is, this is just, like, universal. And you start to think about, like, what, what does Tetris represent in this film? And it's the um, it's such a fundamental, fun experience that it's like it it it's transcending borders transcend of culture borders and, and systems, systems, geography. Yeah. yeah, it's something that it's like everyone should have a chance so, to play it. Yeah, and so like what we see is reflected in sort of the characters and their motivations. Is that our protagonist Hank Rogers is essentially he's got the purest motivations of like I love this game, I love what it like is and represents, and I I just want it to get it out there. Yeah. Um, as well as with uh, a genuine appreciation for the work of the creator Alexei Pajit, I'm probably going to miss Pajitnov. I'm probably mispronouncing his name. Like a real appreciation for his work that isn't reflected by basically any other characters in the story, who are like vying for the same thing. And so, yeah, I'd say that's probably like the core theme. Which I don't know if you were expecting a theme from. T you know what I mean? Like I don't know what people expect from like a Tetris. You know, <laughs> a Tetris film. 
um, something about this, its style. It incorporates 8 bit uh, like yeah. filmmaking all the time in terms of. One of the things that struck me when I first watched it was how cool it was to bind uh, primary characters in terms of how significant they are to the story to 8 bit counterparts that they show on screen as like players. Mm. It's just a fun yeah. way of um, connecting that aspect, right? And they make sure that, like, I think they try their best to keep this story as. Uh, limited in terms of the boring elements as possible, because there's a lot of like red tape things that can happen where an audience might get bored. It's like I don't care about, I don't know how things are uh, move forward, license and tax and stuff. But like you, you try your best to format all of this in a way that'll be very entertaining. And you know they take liberties. Is kind of where I'm going with that. They uh, there's a car chase in this that <laughs> we we all assume didn't actually happen, but it makes for a fun scene. And that's why when they say based on a true story. They are uh, definitely heavy on the base on. <laughs> yeah, it's um like it, certain broad strokes about the nature of the complications regarding the the rights and how they were distributed, like all that's there. But like, I don't, I don't think there was a car chase. <laughs> mm, probably not. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that happened. Um, and obviously the time scale is like condensed for more like snappy drama. Mm -hmm. um, of like characters being in the same place at the same time while all the things happening. There's obviously like deviations from from reality, um, but I mean it, it seems like it's all deviations for the sake of like their broader thematic objectives. Um, yeah, that's the purpose to yeah. a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, like it wasn't. Yeah, exactly. It's it was deliberate and it wasn't just like oh well this will be more exciting. It's like well maybe it will be, but like yeah, it feeds into something bigger. Yeah, uh, all the characters are very straightforward and you understand exactly what they're um, invested in. And sometimes you'll have uh, the use of sort of color and style to represent the places they are from or what kind of personalities they have, especially when we get to like the Russian characters. The uh, surrounding Sorry, elements just... or the soundtrack or the way that they dress, it's all very fucking oppressive every time you see them. It's always... yeah, the, color, the color scheme, right? And all yeah. It's always gray <laughs> when they head over there kind of hilarious sometimes i think the 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 place where they monitor calls it's like like black and red i think are the main colors you could actually like identify and just like so fucking evil but of course uh part of what we get of in this movie is the um the fall of of that era of russia as well as um dealing with the rights to tetris that involve america uh japan again it, it, it's all these different characters they're all involved in, pushing around and lying about different rights, different things. And it all just leads to wow. everyone wants the money from Tetris. Except yes. the Except creator for, uh... who just wants to get all this shit over with. Mm -hmm. I think it was one of the more impressive things about it, actually, was the way in which it... Yeah, the, the, the Tetris rights battle is, of course, sort of the hook and the, the thing which the narrative hinges on. But it, its best work is, is done around that, I think. I mean, particularly its characterization of sort of this this collapsing Soviet Union. Um, it, it marries really well as well with the sort of that sort of 70s, 80s sort of tech utopianism or the, the Hackers Manifesto about, you know, the, the importance of free and open source artistic creation crossing borders, um, contrasting that with this oppressive Soviet system, but also sort of foreshadowing as well the, the way in which the worst features of both regimes end up winning in, in the, you know, the Soviet Union isn't saved by capitalism uh, any more than capitalism, uh, the United States would be saved by uh, communism. It's um, you get the worst characters from both. Robert Maxwell, admittedly not an American, is a brilliant villain because he shows sort of the the crony and corruption um, which exists within the supposedly uh, morally superior system. There's no coincidence that he's the one who does all of the backroom deals with the uh, sort of the money grabbers, the proto capitalists of the Soviet Union. Um, and if you chart sort of where the Soviet Union goes after Gorbachev sort of breaks up the Soviet Union and becomes more capitalistic under Boris Yeltsin, you see sort of the, the, the Maxwellification of the Soviet Union, which this film is kind of teasing, is already happening. Um, I think that's quite astute social commentary. It's not just Soviets bad, Americans good. It's actually, you know, the Soviet Union as a system was terrible. The people within it want the same things as the people, uh, 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 words, oppressed in a different way in America uh, would like for themselves. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a culturally sensitive film. It's, it's a very character uh, sensitive film as well. Um, and portraying that that sort of common humanity as against the 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 oppression of the money grabbing classes is, yeah, it was a really really enjoyable watch. Actually, I was I came away from it thinking, yeah, I'm actually glad to have seen something on TV for a change. Yeah, uh, and I was going to say by the way that character you referenced, Robert Stein, the fucking guy, his voice is such a uh, <laughs> hard not to notice when watching this film in terms of um, yeah, I don't I think it's a little bit different compared to his natural voice, I assume, but he's playing such a fucking British guy. 
the um and he's so Roger Allen's character, Robert Maxwell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who yeah. you can recognize his voice from Baratine. Yeah. Um be like, um, don't worry, son, I'll take care of all of this. <laughs> it's just like, oh my god, why aren't you voicing every villain? <laughs> like what? I uh I thought Taron Ed uh Edgerton was great in he this film. Ma um, Maxwell, it should be said as well, is is such a brilliant person to have picked for your sort of your overarching film. He is so fascinating as a, as a figure in history. Um, th this is a guy who worked simultaneously for, for Mossad and the KGB and MI6. He's largely responsible for the continued existence of the state of Israel because he was the one who negotiated with Czechoslovakia, which was his, I think, his homeland, to smuggle weapons and aircraft parts to uh, to Israel just before the the war for um the, the war for survival basically um and th then you know so he's portrayed as the the hero there he tried to cure famine in ethiopia by doing a, a live aid equivalent for games at one point and at the same time he was stealing something like 450 million pounds from the pension funds of all of his various companies um and that the last of those emergency funds set up to refund people was only i think paid off last year so the, he's just he's a, this titanic figure at the center of everything the press Video games, Mirosoft was the largest UK video game distributor by 1990, I think it was, basically the year that he mysteriously died. Um, and it's another sort of fascinating old history is that what would have happened had none of this happened? Or had he remained alive or had Mirosoft not closed down, would the UK have had one of the earliest, biggest video games companies in the world to, to rival a big publisher like EA Today, for example? Um, and and yeah, just, just hinging that on Maxwell there. I think they, they slightly... They made it a bit corny with the shredding of the documents, which is obviously yeah. to, to hint at the huge impending financial scandal that's about to embroil him. That was a little bit too on the nose, but the rest of the, the character work was fantastic. And choosing him with that presence, with that pivotal role, and because he is such a, an international crook and fraudster and also enigmatic, it, like beguiling character, he yeah, he was a brilliant choice. I very much enjoyed him. I think I, I'm now realizing, like, I think I mixed up the names. Was it, was Robert Stein, um, Toby? Fuck, why am I forgetting his last name? Toby Jones. Toby Jones, Robert Stein. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was mixing up Maxwell and Stein. Sorry, my bad. So that may have sound confusing. <laughs> but I think you can follow along from, if you've seen the film anyway, from uh, what was being described. It's a lot of shit's going on. They had to balance a shit ton of characters and events, and they all had, they had to do it all in like two hours, which is pretty difficult. Um, it's, a, it's a brisk film. Um, Something's always it, happening, it, yeah. They don't waste any time. There's always like a it, conversation happening to progress the plot, or we're learning something about characters, or we're learning a little bit about how well, you know people deal with the worlds that the that we're in. Because you get this almost like Western corporate world, and you get the um, you know like the the Soviet you know oppression land, and you kind of bouncing back between those. It uh, it's really efficient, like at the beginning, in terms of delivering a whole bunch of information that is really important, like. And and using like the pixel art kind of style to kind of obfuscate, I'd say obfuscate, but just kind of uh like elevate the exposition and just like introduce to you all of the key players that you need to know about in this story as they all sort of converge, uh on the rights to Tetris as it goes. It's like damn, that's like efficient. Yeah, in terms it's kind of, of um... as well because it's it's a it's kind of a complicated like it's a complicated core thing of like a bunch of different people have different understandings of the of what they own. Are uh, relating to Tetris, and if like you have, sort of. Mm. Um, if you have like a hundred events to give to the audience, they go to like event twenty-five, which is when let's say um, Hank has to get the loan from the bank, and they're like, "Well, why don't we, as part of him trying to get the loan, have him explain the first twenty-four events, and we can play the first event, which is just him, but is trying to sell Go, which is like a fun." Sort of uh, a, a way to introduce Tetris, right? Because like Go is one of the most oldest and classic games of all time, and then it's like Tetris, brand new on the scene, digital as well, and it's like it's about to become one of the most classic and understood, recognized video games of all time. And uh, yeah, and then you have him explaining all of that, and it catches you up and pushes you way further into the story than you know it may have felt natural, right? Because you need to get all of it, find a way to skip past a lot of stuff, but also give what needs its due, its due. Um, well, yeah, we, we need to establish pretty clearly what Hank's, like, interest and investment in the game is, and that his his investment in the game is beyond that of any of the other characters that we see, mm -hmm. or, except for except for Alexi, right, the creator of, like, because I think he says, like, you know, when yep. I go to sleep, I see blocks in my dreams. It's like, yeah, he, he loves this game. Um, and it comes through in, in his, like, desire to actually make sure that Alexi, like, gets something for his work and contribution 
Because it's kind of something that looms over the whole thing is he's not going to get anything, is he? Not only is he not going to get anything, but he's also going to, like, suffer, essentially, in the process of uh, trying to get this game out there in the world uh, for people to play and enjoy and, like, have it be disseminated broadly. But then, it, you know, at least it sort of culminates in, in, like, a happy ending of him coming over to America. They found the Tetris company. He actually gets his dues, makes a lot of money. <laughs> um... It's kind of like one of those rare instances of, yeah, like the, the good guys really prevailing in terms of like, you know, getting getting something for the work that he did for his creation, especially when you've got all of these people like converging in just to get as much money as possible out of it. Yeah, and uh, we have so many different players of significance, but they still try to intertwine a little bit of like characterization comedy drops here yeah. and there. I was one of the ones, by how um, funny this film was. yeah, yeah, got got me laughing at a couple of bits where I really didn't expect to. Yeah. Uh, is uh, Kevin Maxwell right? He's clearly like in way over his head, desperate to prove to the world that he's ready to take over his father's business, but at the same time, like nobody quite treats him that way, and it frustrates the hell out of him. Um, overcompensates, Boy. but at the same time, will uh, actually ha he still will like you'll go to Moscow, he'll try and do the deals. He's trying, but it's never quite. Uh, you know, it always falls short. He even says, like, because credit to him, right? Like, he he refuses to do bribes. Uh, a piece of integrity his father doesn't have, like, who tries to grease the wheels, so to speak, of everything that happens. You know, you didn't have to do that. You have a lot of uh, movies, especially ones that are about, based on true events, that try and just have the character and be like, this is what they did, this is their role, and then they're out. But they try to characterize the ones that are, take up a lot more screen time, which is... Uh, Fun. One of the guys I quite liked, I forget his name, but the one that they're mainly dealing with for Elorg, um, who's... Oh yeah, the, um, uh... I don't remember his name, but yeah, uh, he was yeah, entertaining. I quite liked him because... This, uh, his something P? Or his M? primary motivation was to, uh, for the good of the country, right? right? So he wanted the best deal the best that brought deal. the most amount of money to the country. And that was at odds with some of his superiors who recognized that the USSR was falling apart and wanted theirs, you know, wanted to get out with as much as they could, yeah, which exactly. is commented on in the movie. A lot of people are starting to just grab whatever they can before everything falls apart, um, which is really interesting, right? Like, in terms of motivations from everybody in this movie, he ends up being what is almost a good guy because he sees that the deal with uh, Hank is actually the most profitable one. Um, well, it's the, it's the most generous deal. Um, yeah. It's the deal that, because it's like a deal that includes royalties, like payments on every single, uh, but like game sold on Game Boy and a bigger upfront, I think as well. Um, it's like, yeah, it's like a crazy good deal, but you got these other guys who's like, well, I'm going to be cutting my own deals, right? So now, because you have it with the uh, KGB girl, Sasha as well, where it's mm -hmm. like her own interests are conflicting with um, the big bad KGB guy who's just trying to get as much as he can for himself. It's like, yeah, like, you've got... There's a, there's a... It feels like sort of all of the different perspectives that there could be on, like, Tetris and who should get it and, like, how it gets disseminated and who should get what. Like, the every single kind of angle that you could have on that is uh, explored to some degree. I like the, the moral nuance of it as well, isn't it? It, it doesn't just portray the Russians as this, this mono-evil block of people. Um, it, it's it's clever to, to portray essentially the most honourable of the Russians they're dealing with as the people actually most ideologically committed to a Soviet Union, which we all know to despise. Um, and it's the emerging oligarchical class which you see growing in this film, the ones who are just in it to get money for themselves, which are really cast as the villains, um, which is not something that you usually get. Normally depictions of, of the Soviet Union are much more sort of quite absolute than that. Uh, it's normally just that Soviet Union bad, if you're committed to the Soviet Union, you're evil. Um, but this, no, this film's quite clever with that. It, it does portray them as being honorably wrong, as opposed to morally wrong. The morally wrong people are the, the money grabbers. Uh, some of it, I guess, an interaction I really enjoyed, how it evolved over the film, was when he first meets with Ilorg, it's very straightforward that he has no idea what Hank is saying until the translator comes in and he waits for each of the translations before responding. And... You know, everything's working in terms of communication as you'd expect, but as the film goes on and the stakes raise and more lies are exposed sort of thing, he um he gets faster and faster with his responses until he starts overtaking, like, the translator. And we hear him say stop at one point until eventually he uh, he's shown the comparison. He says, this is a console, this is a computer. Um, The reason you, you've been screwed over is because this is considered the same by a lot of people. And then he just goes like, but one has a keyboard. And then uh, Hank goes, yeah, one has a key. You could speak English? 
Exactly. He's been hiding his power levels. Yeah, it's a it's a fun thing that clues were given to the it, stuff like that. Is it doesn't have to be in the movie at all. It just shows a bit of a talent for not only like script writing but characterization, and um, it creates a bit of dynamism in how people interact with each other instead of a more dry portrayal of how everything works. Uh, well, they they seize a lot of opportunities to have comedy and build character in a story where. It's like, that's not necessarily the expectation that you would have um, of, like, a biopic on the origins of, like, Tetris getting on the Game Boy, you know? Yeah, I think that the changes they've made to history for, because I don't even know exactly what they are, are probably for the best to make an entertaining story. Uh, well, it's, uh, I believe that, uh, like, because I think Hank Rogers and uh, Alexei Pajitnov were, like, talked to about it, like, for the film, but then eventually it got to the... Yeah, um... Like, uh, there's a quote where I think, yeah, Hank says, they tried their best to accept our changes when they had to with authenticity, but when it started getting to creative flourishes like the car chases and all that, it was like, okay, now it's all them. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Um, he says, it's a Hollywood script, it's a movie, it's not about history, so a lot of what's in the movie never happened. Uh, but some stuff did. Um, so, like, for instance, apparently it was uh, Hank Rogers convinced Nintendo to bundle Tetris with the Game Boy instead of Super Mario Land. So there's, like, aspects of it that are true, and then broad things that, you know, and then deviations, mm -hmm. and significant ones. I guess that might even still play against it in the long run in terms of viewers, though. I mean, I, I think it does a really good job of blending sort of the history and, and artistic license. But if the impression is given that this is, it's a video game movie about the history of video games for video game fans or video game nerds, then it will be a shame if people are put off because they think that's all it is, as opposed to a much broader story, and a, and a compelling and a fun story as well in its own right. Even if you're not particularly interested in the well, yeah, origins if, of Tetris, it's still a really enjoyable film to watch. If this was all mm -hmm. fiction, I think it makes for a good movie. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely, and... it does. It It's just so... I didn't expect anything like this from a movie you know, like Tetris. You know, this wasn't... This turned into like a Chernobyl light political drama and i was like what the dang we got like characters and car chases and we got this wonderful style to it and this is not at all what i was expecting but they, in a very good way they do a good job as well of making you feel like hank isn't quite safe whenever he's in russia um everything's everyone's watching listening and uh lots of threats are made until the point where you literally like have one of the villains in the film he's dropping pennies off a bridge and he's talking to um alexi's children and he's like, which do you think would fall faster if I dropped them both? Just like, this is uncomfortable because of how badly it could end. But obviously, if you have any benefit of the knowing how this story ends, then you'll know it works out eventually. But it still follows like a three act structure. The second act low point comes in exactly what you'd expect. The, you know, there's a stress of his work versus his family life, the main character. There's a lot of stuff. It just it hits all in all beats. And it's like an easy recommendation. I can't see why anyone wouldn't enjoy it it's pretty straightforward very yeah film. it's got a lot of um it's very approachable by all kinds of different people and it does as well it does capture the, that sort of the the magic of that era of technology which was always going to be the, the big question to ask is that you know in, in a world where everyone can play ps5 or xbox whatever the most recent one is or get a really you know expensive computer brilliant graphics how do you recapture the magic of of the game boy when you put put that on the screen which seems so basic and simple and commonplace to us but i i think i think the film actually does a really good job of, of doing that by all of the storytelling it does around those props so the game boy itself is is made slightly more like a, a religious icon because of the story that is being mm. constructed around it and if because i'm lucky enough to be doing some work on on judas at the moment and if you get ken levine talking about this era of video games that magic and the excitement of it really does come through like everything is so bold and new and experimental and you've got so much creative freedom and there's all so much risk involved as well because of that great creative freedom it's it's a germinal industry it's a time when you know arcade machines were driving video game in, uh, in innovation as opposed to handheld consoles or homemade consoles um this film actually conveys some of that magic as well i think and and it's that that sort of bold experimentation and all of the risks that the characters have to go through because of their sheer love of the art that they're creating it's a video games it's art movie as well and it does convey that pretty well there's a there's a reverence for tetris and video games in general in uh in this film for sure yeah the way that they talk about it the way that it's you know well because it's so primitive to us you know but well you know, at to the them, time, yeah the exactly way... at the time i was on the forefront 
But then there was, um, because there was the scene when Hank and Alexi were just in his apartment, just messing around with Tetris, and it was just like, that was where everything sort of melted away, and it was just the love of the craft of like, you know what, maybe you should make it so that like, four, four line, you know, rows disappear instead of just one at a time. And like, that's one of those moments where it's like, yeah, you peel back all of the stuff about rights and, and uh, differing political systems and ideologies and everything, and at its core, it's just like humans sharing and creativity. Yeah, that's where I really felt like was the, the deepest core of this movie was uh, ain't it fun that we can get to make things and experience stuff together? And yeah. That, um, a lot of different systems can prevent that, and that's like precisely what the two main guys, they're just trying to get this game out there. That It's their tenacity, and they win in the end. They do. Because, yeah, in the end, they consolidated all the rights to Tetris, and they founded the Tetris company, and, and that company to this day is still just overseas and is responsible for the licensing of Tetris. Um, because, uh, yeah, like Alexi, he didn't get anything. And then eventually it took, like, it took a while, but, yeah. Tetris. Kind of funny, it took really about the good. same time to talk about that movie as it did 65, but for very different reasons. <laughs> oh, absolutely. There's, the funny thing about this is, really like, there's loads we haven't covered, well. but you should go see it. Yeah, uh, like, absolutely. You, you there are... It. It's got great acting, a wide cast of characters that all feel very different. Um, they do such a great job nailing the vibe of that time, both in yeah, America and in um, you know uh, the USSR. Um, one thing I really like about this is that it uses like CGI and things like that to essentially accent a story uh, instead of it doesn't like use it as a crutch that it has to lean on. It's just extra a bit of extra world building and things. Um, so if you want to have a if you want to have like a like a Soviet city, it's like well, there's only so much you could do there. Or or if you want to have like a, a Soviet you know military parade, it's like well, that's beyond our budget to actually do. But we can sort of have that thing be you know well done in CGI because it's accenting and it's adding to an already existing you know story and set of characters that we're invested in, and it just helps it feel all the more real as a result instead of doing the opposite that a lot of the times happens when a CGI is used. Um, I just remembered, by the way, before we forget, because uh, we mentioned it, best of all of the film. I need a hero shows up in this film. Yes, but I have it uh, with with Russian lyrics in the end. During in the Japanese. Yeah, it's like There's, hey, we had we had the, we we heard this song three times yesterday in three different languages, and luckily it's a good song. And in the in the um, the Russian and Japanese versions of it, I think the Japanese version is done by Ren Arian, but. Uh, I don't know who does the, the the Russian version, but they're all distinctly different enough to where it's like, oh, this is interesting to to hear this kind of, you know, take on it. Um, and it doesn't take you out of the world either in the way that the use of these in Super Mario does. But we we've already have established in Tetris this this love of the music of the time period. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's it's it just works much better. It's not distracting. It, it's not counter immersive. It's something. It's kind of believable. It's it's not diegetic, but it is still of a place with, with the scene that's depicting, as opposed to just, hey, this is a cool song, let's put it in this film about a cartoon. No. And also, um, I, I had to step away for a moment, so sorry if I'm retreading old ground, but the, the Tetris theme that is used as the light motif that is uh, spread throughout the movie is really well done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There cool is... Yeah, it, different moods and such, uh, kind of, you know, the, the Tetris theme is used to... You know, it's sad and somber here, or over here it's kind of upbeat and interesting. So that was really nice to hear, and I think it's really uh, clever that they did that. And it worked really well. well there's so like there's a lot of slightly well, stranger well. things you feel about some of the soundtrack, I think, in, in this. It might just be a coincidental sort of use of heavy reliance on synthesizers, but I thought, yeah, the, the use of the Tetris theme was probably the strongest element of the soundtrack. There were bits of the rest of it which I sort of stopped noticing i think like it, the soundtrack isn't as great as perhaps it could have been but it's functional it's never worse than functional i suppose which is a, a good sign mm. um a fun ride and an unexpected fun ride on apple tv <laughs> which is mm. is anyone subscribed to apple tv out there i don't know yeah it's like what's that I like... think uh, Apple. I think Apple are now going to be releasing films theatrically uh i think amazon did it too because uh Air, I believe, was Amazon distributed that one because I remember when I was watching it, like it had Amazon Studios pop. I'm like, I don't feel like I've seen that logo ever before. Um, so yeah, I think uh, 
I think that Apple TV is now like looking towards theatrical releases, which is probably worthwhile to do. Like I, uh, cause I don't think, cause I think Netflix occasionally does theatrical stuff. Um, very occasionally. It seems like it's just an opportunity to make some money. What else can you say? That's the that's the current state. We got a video, a movie about a video game, a movie adapted from a video game, and then sixty five. I don't know how that fits in. I think it doesn't. We just yeah, it's just it. not. <laughs> I don't care about that film. No, uh, but you know, video games they just seem to be uh, clawing their way further and further into cultural relevance as time goes on, and they deserve mm -hmm. their due because they've been fucking doing great for ages. They have, um, and I mean, at this point, it's like they make so much money that <laughs> it can't be ignored, right, by mm -hmm. by Hollywood, <laughs> for better or worse. For better or worse. Because, uh, yeah, I, I just wasn't expecting um, what I got from this. That's, that's, that's the straightforward way of putting it, and hopefully we get more of these as time goes on, just movies where you're like, oh, shit, that's good, though. Well, I mean, I feel like you could make, you could easily make some biopics on some of the key figures at Nintendo. Like Miyamoto or Wada and the like. Like I feel, I feel like there's plenty of stories there. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure that there was a. I think it was. Uh, I don't know why I'm forgetting. Is Harry with Harry, Harry Potter, Daniel Radcliffe, right? I mm -hmm. think he was in a biopic that was about the creators of Grand Theft Auto that came out like some years ago. Oh, I didn't even know that. Um, yeah, I think it was like on BBC or something. I uh, but yeah, I figure that there's because there's plenty of those types of stories to be told about. The uh the creation of a lot of these games because there are plenty of interesting stories, some to do with the technology, you know, development rights and and stuff like that. Yeah, heaps of stories to be told. Well, anything else you guys want to say about Tetris? What about does go it watch they, it? Go watch go it. Go watch yep. it. Absolutely, that's a big recommendation from me. Which uh, wraps up our trifecta of talking about new movies that popped out. Uh, one recommendation, one absolutely not recommendation, and then one recommendation with the star next to it. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to fulfill the categories in order to have the recommendation Asterisk. apply to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because a star, might, people might think you're making some kind of a Mario thing. Maybe oh. I am. Maybe I am. A star next to it. Yeah. Because I still, um, by the way, overall yeah. agree with uh, Platoon's sentiment on his video. Demand better. I agree. Wish they'd do that yeah. for Marvel as well. <laughs> so a lot of there, people are still is, very happy with those films. There really is no reason that the Mario movie couldn't be as good as like the best of Pixar or DreamWorks or Disney, you know? Best, yeah, you best of Pixar needs to be said, yeah, because they're not doing so great lately. Yeah. Um, yeah, saying I mean, demand yeah. more does not mean that you think the thing is utter garbage. It's just that, okay, you can still enjoy it. You can still be okay, but, you know, it could be so much more than that. So even if you kind of liked it, if you acknowledge that it could be slightly better even, it's worth demanding that. There's, you're not allowed to have moderate takes. <laughs> it's either going to be <laughs> extremely positive or extremely negative. I suppose that's an interesting thing about the Mario movie. We, we felt like, as you guys just heard, that's, that's a pretty middle-of-the-road take, wasn't it? Like, um, yeah. yeah, it's the most... Because I don't see a lot of middle-of-the-road takes on it, it seems. I'm just like, eh. It seems like it's a much more, uh, well, I wouldn't even say divisive. I think most people are pretty positive about it. It's very easy to like. It's very easy yeah, to like. That's that's right. On that but will note. anybody love that movie? That's the question. In the same way that they love, you know, classics. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really people interesting to track it all. See how it all goes, you know. Wow. Well, yeah. You get, you know, three months down the road. We'll see, you know, what the discourse is around it. If everyone flips for whatever reason. Well, will it be like what happened like with meme power and stays alive and is referenced a lot? Will it be what happened to Sonic 2, where everybody just kind of like moved on and forgot about it? Did anybody remember Sonic 2? I'm pretty sure none of you guys watched it. I didn't, no, know. I didn't see the first one yet. Yeah. Because um, I remember Sonic when... the Hedgehog and, and Tails and, the, and Knuckles. Uh, Tales and Knuckles the, the Echidna, and yeah. he's going to have his own spin-off show on Paramount Plus, I'm pretty sure. Yay. <laughs> wow. Wait, Paramount but Plus? I... Great, we got to get our subscription for Paramount Plus so we can catch Halo Season 2. Woohoo! Oh, well, a few people remember Sonic 2. There you go. It's just, it's just <laughs> interesting because now that Mario's come out, and it's kind of like... Because I'm pretty sure Sonic 2 was the previously like biggest opening for like a video game adaptation 
one of the most successful ones, I think, financially. Um, but Mario made that money in a week. So it's uh <laughs> it'll be interesting to see how that may influence um the third one. Because the impression I get is that they're gonna nudge even further towards getting closer to being more like the video games. That's the era that we're entering into, I think. Um, and with that, are you guys all right with us uh, checking out some of the Super Chats? We've still got a bit of time, I think, to do so. So why sure. not? Yeah, sure. Sounds good. Uh, first one up says, a lot of people really hate the new Super Mario Bros. series. It says, I kind of feel like they're being unfair to the games. The new... Oh, you mean... Oh, the new Super Mario Brothers. I think the reason why is because they're just like... You compare, like, new Super Mario Brothers to, like, Galaxy or Odyssey. This is not very interesting by comparison. They're, they're good games. They're definitely good games. But they're not, like, mind-blowing or anything. Fair enough. Um, super hype for the Mario talk. Lost all interest after the trailer, and now everyone, except Shad, is raving about it. Big confusion. Also, high rags. Hello. Yeah, uh, that's, that's the thing. It's definitely, at this point, it's going to be overrated. I don't think it can escape that fate because it's yeah so popular. Um, but, I, you know, I've seen a couple of people, like, willing to throw on praise and and uh, criticism. I think what's happening, though, is that everyone was surprised by it. A lot of people are expecting this to be much worse. So it's like... It benefits immensely from everything around it, as yeah. opposed to having significant qualities of its own. Yeah. Uh, shame about the new Crobcat video. Misleading editing. Change title description due to backlash. Apparently deleting comments. Oh, I hope that's not true. Uh-oh. Not a good look. Shame. Unfortunate. Uh, don't want to make any claims further than just the screenshot comparison, and even that can be done for several reasons. So, mm. you know, I, I'm not too... Hopefully it's just a hiccup, you know, misunderstanding sort of stuff. Just move on. It... We'll make a better video about how Resident Evil 4 Remake is uh, lacking. Why not? Let me know how you feel. Throw a commentary in it. Has he ever done that? Does he have a voice like, of any kind? I, I don't think he's ever done commentary. The, the most that you've gotten is a bit, of a, a bit of text on screen to sort of explain things occasionally, and that's very rare. Uh, to those who hate the fact I like this movie, you love the minions, so why don't you shut up and enjoy the movie instead? Some Twitter user on TLJ. Oh. Do I love the minions? <laughs> I'm trying to think of it. I don't think I've... How many of those are there? Are they, are they more than one? Uh, there's, there are, I think, three Despicable Me movies and two Minions movies. Well, Minions and Minions, The Rise of Gru. <laughs> I think I've seen Despicable Me 1. I can't remember if I've seen 2, and I don't remember being upset by them. I thought they were fine. Oh, that's I mean, that, I, I, I don't know that anybody's going to get really upset about any of those films. That's kind of, it's kind of like the benefit and the problem with like Illumination generally. Mm -hmm. uh, Hail Longman, I was happily surprised by this movie. Glad to have seen it. Also, High Rags. Hello. A Fringo, how's the goo? Um, I mean, I don't know that the goo is like how is it? I guess it's it's just it is it is goo, you know. Behaving, yes. Not causing a ruckus. But you said that, not me. I did. Just Discussion. want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. uh, Lou Albano is the one true Mario Rip. I'm guessing he... Who is that? I don't recognize the name. Me neither. I do mm. not know who that is. Um... Italian American professional wrestler, manager, and actor who performed under the ring stage named Captain Lou Albano, who was active as a professional wrestler. Um, oh, there's some images here where he looks like Mario. Maybe he played him in something. I'm afraid I'm not familiar. Uh, Mario was an intellectual movie. Was good rat. Bowser had some rhino milk and tries to take the dawn. Nothing could save the McMuffin, the cosmic chicken. That's a lot of memes and references in there. Not sure what the point was, but I approve. Very dense. I, I, I understood those references. Mm. Going to watch this after? Might go see the movie tonight. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess, I don't know. Is it worth seeing our assessment of it before deciding whether or not you want to see it? In terms of, like, the I guess Mario it would spoil movie? it at that point, but I don't know. Um, I don't think you need to. I think as long as you're a, a sort of a Mario kind of fan, or you like Mario, um, I, I think you'll... 
come away positively from this and probably and you can watch us afterwards talk about it oh he played mario in the super mario bros cartoon show fair enough and uh yeah oh, as okay. for if you're a mario fan it's, it's like worth the roll of dice i guess that's probably what i would say it's like you might not like yeah. it but you also might uh my gf and i fell asleep to your videos every night thank you for the countless hours of entertainment oh hey you're welcome <laughs> Happy to do no that problem. You. I'll take it. We'll take it. Hey guys, thoughts on Better Call Saul? The very well made TV show that uh, I think is actually longer than Breaking Bad in totality, right? Six seasons versus yeah, five. Yeah, six seasons. Well, but season five was split. Yeah, it is more episodes, I think. Um, something I think I find interesting about Better Call Saul as of now is that um, I don't see it referenced very much. And a lot of people, I think, sing its praises, and I'm not sure how many of those very people. Uh, either have seen all of it, or I don't know, feel very passionate about a lot of what happens in it. Because um, mm. it kind of seems to just have slinked away. You know, even though it recently ended, and it was quite an explosive finale, it even adds on to the ending of uh, Breaking Bad. Like, goes further than that show did. Wow. So, um, but I would recommend it, especially for Breaking Bad fans. Give it a shot. It's uh, I, I'd be interested to know what Vince Gilligan's going to do next. I haven't checked his uh... IMDb, but, you know. Well, yeah, because you figure that at this point he's probably done with Breaking Bad, right? He's spent like I would hope he well is, over yeah. a decade, well over a decade on it. Yeah, I really wonder how they'll make relatively serious franchises like Metroid or Zelda if they're as shallow as Mario. I can imagine more discourse then. Yeah, uh, you've got a lot is... of room to work with when it comes to like Zelda in particular. All you have to have is like a, a very is it just a generic adventure and then add all the, the Zelda stuff in there? You know, the items and the, you know, the green tunic and everything. Well, but you Zelda's got kind of interesting in that it's, it's a, a hodgepodge doesn't work quite as well. you got to pick something to yeah, hone in on. Yeah, you kind of have to stick you know? to one of the is series. Is it Ocarina? For... Is it, you know, Breath of the Wild? Is it mm. Link to the Past or Wind Waker? You know, like, what would you, it'd probably be like Ocarina would be my guess if they were going to, they were going to pick one to adapt. Yeah. One of the first ones, the classics. And as someone just mentioned, do you let Link speak? Uh, I, you know what, I, I, yeah. Um, I, it's gonna I be, I, I think it might be tough to do a whole Legend of Zelda movie without him talking. Well, my assessment would be that they will definitely make him speak, Illumination slash Nintendo in, in their adaptation, but uh, I, as for whether or not it's the best decision, I'm not sure. I don't know if, I don't know if Illumination, do you think Illumination makes a Legend of Zelda film? Oh, I don't know. Possible. It could be that they they could be drawing up. <laughs> I'm I'm curious to go in so broad as to say like Illumination. We uh we want to buy your studio fully. We want you to just work nonstop on Nintendo shit. And the amount of money involved may not even be a bad that idea. That would be that'd be a big yeah big check. But maybe yeah, totally that's... might be worth it. I I don't know I don't know if our like Legend of Zelda movie has as many jokes or is uh that kind of tone. I think, people I think you could do all kinds dramatic. of things with it. Uh, you could, but like I'm thinking about what people would expect and want from it. I think people would want it to be because there are like oh, there are plenty of moments of levity in like Zelda games, but there's more of a I guess a headiness to it. Uh, dramatic yeah, weight. Yeah, it time, can be like with Ganon and everything. A a more lighthearted, but yeah, it, hmm not too serious in either direction maybe it sort of straddles that middle line of what he want, it wants its tone to be doesn't push too far in either direction we have a a decent amount of you know i guess appropriately you know dangerous peril like oh no a lava pit but i grabbed the ledge so i'm okay it, like almost like mario level but a little bit more um i i would say i i get the impression that people want it to be pushed a lot more than that i think uh I think that people would want it to be um, more dramatic, like quite dramatic. That did come through in the comments under my video as well, which is that even people who like the Mario film said, no, this is fine for a Mario film, but what I won't be happy with is if they do it to Zelda. Like, I would yeah, want something exactly. more from that. Yeah. Um, I, 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 can, I can see the argument. Yeah, I mean, it, it, but I think, well, I think there should have been more to Mario, but yeah, definitely with, with something like Zelda, if it's just a kind of a lighthearted caper through a reference gallery, then people might get a bit kind of tired of that. I think people have higher expectations for Zelda, Metroid, if they ever... Metroid in particular, people would have high expectations for that. Um, and even like Star Fox, people would probably want it to be more dramatic. 
Yeah. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see yeah. how they tackle those sorts of challenges. But I mean, yeah, Star Fox is pretty ripe because um, it's got a lot of it's got a lot of beats that you can just keep one for one and translate over and expand on, like the whole thing with James and what happened to him as like a driving force. Anyone who says that feathered dinosaurs can't be cool or intimidating are fools who haven't seen the Uteranosaur... Uteranus? Uh, look it up. It's rad. 65's Dino's Bad. They were pretty generic like and lame, the ones in 65. Yep. And they're like the... I'm pretty I like sure the they weren't even feathers. supposed to be... There's a couple of ones that were quite clearly identifiable. The raptors, I think, being obviously of their proper size as well, unlike Jurassic Parks, which like... It, bigger than they should be but i thought they from about halfway through they sort of given up on creature design completely and it was just like well we've got a t-rex head asset which we can stick on i don't know a, a big four-legged vague animal looking thing and that's mm -hmm. a dinosaur now yeah no I, 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 there was nothing of um I'm, I'm waiting for the film that can one day do justice to dinosaurs after 93 you know maybe yeah, 65 we get another it. another stinker mm-hmm uh, this has probably been asked before, but would you ever have Thor Skywalker on? Sure. I don't see why not. I think he's sure. like a yeah. commentator for Star Wars and media and stuff. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I don't like Bowser's song. Not for the song, but it felt it took the chance to have... It felt it took the chance to have the character. Bowser was disappointing, to be honest. Oh, you think well, he's disappointing? Oh, okay. I think I can understand people wanting him to be more... Maybe more consistently aggressive and intimidating and wiping out the um, the lovey-dovey aspect entirely. But I mean, uh, it just it feels weird being someone who's uh, played through campaigns where he is that, just being like, oh, you didn't want... Because, like, you know, I quite like Bowser's design, which is not, not even something we got to talk about, really. It was just, like, the fucking design of the characters from Nintendo translating over easily to an animated world because, of course, they're just... So fucking They're very refined looks <laughs> yeah. at this point. Um, like everybody the and the distinctive silhouettes of Mario, Luigi, Peach, Bowser, like everybody's got they they all they're not to be confused with the other, you know? They're and all so very distinct. Maybe I, I can understand people wanting more of a just Bowser fiery, punchy, angry, take over the world. Like his motivation is just to take over the world. I could see people wanting that, but um you know, this uh, it's different different approaches with the different Bowsers, and I, I quite like I, this I one. I find that interesting though, because uh, I now I could be wrong, but I thought everybody really liked the whole Bowser having a wedding in, in Odyssey. I thought everybody found that like really entertaining. I really liked it, like Bowser there in his stylish tuxedo, <laughs> having a wedding on the moon, yeah, with his big hat. Like I love that. That's cool. Hey, if they adapt Sunshine in any way, shape, or form, they better bring in his bathtub. Okay. I'll be upset. And well, they, what, each what, on a little rubby ducky situation, you know. And what what was it? What was the name of the toad in that one? The what was? Oh, damn it! What was it? Professor? Was it Professor Toad something? Oh, the old Toad dude. He's in more yeah. than just that, though, right? Or was that his introduction? I don't. I feel like he, he doesn't show up anymore because it's it's Captain Toad is uh essentially the the main like defined character Toad that you see. I like the old Toad dude. You Toadsworth. Know. Toadsworth. Toadsworth. That was his name. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. Uh, who wins opening weekend? Dune 2 or the Marvels? Gotta be Dune 2, right? Dune 2, right? Gotta be. Probably. Probably. I know Are that like not the whole the world weekend? goes to see Dune 2, but no way the fucking Marvels beats it out. No. Are they yeah, opening the just... same week? If they are, that's... They feels... are. I think they are. Good God. Like, damn, Dune, Dune you have one job, okay, and it's to murder the Marvels. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you've got to do. That's very brave. That's, It'll uh, be interesting I, with Dune because, like, I, I really I liked part one. I've read most of the books, and obviously there are changes, um, but they don't really, from what I can see, harm the narrative going forward. The, but I'm I'm not sure how well Dune one has kind of stuck in people's collective mm, consciences. There's not mm, been a huge yeah. amount of talk about it or about the upcoming second part. From what I've seen, maybe I'm just missing it, but I haven't seen a huge amount of sort of hyper expectation. I think it has a little bit of that, almost like Avatar in a way, where. Um, but God. maybe to lesser of a degree. A big theater experience is what the the first film was. It's like a huge spectacle that was made for the big screen. That might be that might be a big driving force behind it. I'm not sure. Yeah, um, oh, actually, little platoon. How much money do you think the Marvels is going to make? 
um uh i think i don't know it won't make a billion i think that's quite safe to say what what, what did ant-man make in the end ant-man made i believe just shy of 500 million it was like 470 million it's, it's under yeah, last wish which is like so that. fucking cool it is under the last wish yeah i could see it i could see it doing something similar to that maybe slightly less given that there's not really any recognizable or likable character in it I think... So I think um, mine was 500. I think it's going to be 500 million. And I think Mola and Rags, you're at like 350, something like that. 350, 400. Mine was 400 to I 500. Think... I thought you said it's higher than 500. I, I'm i pretty sure it's 500. 500 million is where I think I'm at on that one. Because mine, mine on uh, Real BBC was that. But I remember you going like 700 something. I I'm doing... Maybe, maybe a while ago, but we talked about it recently on like one of my streams. Um, oh, okay. I think I, think, uh, I'll, I think I said like 500, yeah. I think I'll go a little higher and say like 380, um, but I, something in me is like, I just don't know about this one. I, I mean, there's no Shazam real and name Ant-Man, recognition man. It changed in everything. It. Ant-Man changed Shazam it, man. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, and of course Shazam ending its... Well, I don't know if it's ended its run yet, but I think it's it's about... It's going to be about 130 million on like a oh. $120 million production budget, and... Probably a decent marketing campaign. It is the lowest grossing DC EU film. Um, I'm pretty sure the only DC film that would have made less money was like Catwoman, Halle Berry, Catwoman, <laughs> back in 2004. <laughs> That's so funny. Like, you don't want to be compared to that, even though it's probably better than uh, the It Marvels. probably is. Like, that's, that's, well, it's just where we're at now, right? Where it's like old, bad movies. Yeah. It's like, hey, well, at least they didn't break time and space, right? Yay. Birds of Prey? No, Birds of Prey was about 200 million, so, uh, yeah, Shazam is, uh, down there, right at the bottom. I'm probably not gonna be seeing Shazam 3, or even that character for a long time, would be my mm -hmm. guess. Uh, if you've seen it, thoughts on Darth Maul's death scene in Rebels? Thought it was the best scene of the whole show up to that point. I've seen it out of context, and I thought it was pretty neat. Um, yeah, it seems, uh, it seems neater than what... I would expect from that show based on everything that I've heard. Yeah. It's, it's like remarkably restrained for something that was created by Dave Filoni. <laughs> oh, we got so much more to come from him too. It'd be great. Yeah. Uh, glad to catch y'all live. Have you set up a PO box yet? My kid wants to send you something he's made y'all. That is adorable to know. Um, no, I don't think we've got that in any way set up, but it's definitely on the to-do list. Um, so, yeah, I fun. actually, I had one. I need to double check and make sure that it's still active. I'll probably go and do that. Well, today, yeah, I'll probably do that on, uh, Monday, go in and take a look. I need to sort of make sure I've got one up and uh, set up and active. Would Illumination be tied to every future Nintendo film? I'm not sure they can handle more serious titles or if the animation should stay consistent. So like I said, I... I believe that uh, there is, there's like a Disney, that, not Disney, um, I'm thinking of Disneyland because Universal's got like a, uh, like a, a theme park, mm -hmm. and I believe that there is a Nintendo theme park like there, and I, I'm pretty sure that collaboration was what essentially got this started, of the collaboration between Nintendo and Illumination. So my guess is that Universal is going to want to pounce on this and, like, fully get their hands on, like, as much Nintendo stuff as possible. And it's worth remembering that DreamWorks is owned by Universal. And DreamWorks have done licensed films before. Like, I think they did the Peanuts one. Uh, Captain Underpants and stuff like that. So, like, it wouldn't, um... It wouldn't surprise me if that's a possibility that DreamWorks might be making a Nintendo film. Mm -hmm. That is some of the, the more interesting stuff that goes on in the background in that, you know, Universal, it, it has the Super Mario Land anyway, but it's also, I believe, making substantial investments in its theme park. Um, and it's also got Harry Potter, and of course Harry Potter is coming back on HBO. Um, at the same time as Disney is, you know, its theme parks haven't recovered from coronavirus. It's locked in this unending battle with Ronda Sanders. It's not doing particularly well as a company financially. Um, so Universal sort of capitalizing on Disney's travails would be absolutely looking to push out as much Nintendo product as possible, certainly now that this film has proven to be a huge success. Um, because exactly. it triggers investment in every other area of the company, including and particularly its theme parks. And I think um, it's, you know, Nintendo looks at this film and like, oh, Universal, like you made the Mario movie and it made a lot of money. Let's make more movies. I could easily just see them going like, well, might as well stick with them. You know, they did well for us once. Let's uh, give them another try rather than, I guess, going for anybody else. And I'm... 
I'm not even sure because um, I I remember this. I now I don't know if this is true or not, but people in chat might know. I believe that Microsoft went to Nintendo to offer to acquire them, and they laughed at them. Um, <laughs> like when they were creating the Xbox. Um, I don't believe like Nintendo is ever like the kind of company that would be getting acquired by one of these like big, uh, like studios. So I imagine it would always remain like a collaborative thing, which means that I imagine Nintendo retains a lot of leverage over these sorts of projects, which feels like a good sign, right? Of like collaboration rather than one company owning it and then basically getting to do whatever they want. Because we kind of saw what happened with uh, Marvel <laughs> under Disney. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what we'll just have to see how it all pans out. 65. Go ahead. I was saying it, it will be interesting to see how it all uh, turns out. What happens next? 65 was mid, probably a 3 to 4, which is a surprise from two of the th three writers from A Quiet Place. It really says something about that third writer, John, also high rags. Hello. Um, I'd be willing to go no further higher than 3 for a, yeah, a movie, I guess. I just, yeah. What brings it higher than a 3? What element of the movie is in any way something you know i just feel it it fails at pretty much everything it's trying to do and it's ultimately so simplistic that it it doesn't get any credit for trying to do anything grandiose yeah like to fail at something that simple is really bad compared to something that's really high scope awesome thematically could have been incredible you know and it's like damn oh well i guess you know yeah. Like, you tried, you know, like, you tried and failed compared to having something that was not very interesting to begin with and then not succeeding. I'd commission a fringy video on Shovel Knight. I feel like, I, I get the impression that a lot of what's to be said about Shovel Knight would have been said already. I do love that game. Um, Shovel Knight is cool. Have any of you played it? Yeah, I've, I've not, but I've heard you. many, many good things about it. Yeah, I'd recommend it. It's a really cool 8-bit inspired uh, platformer um, with a fun assortment of characters. Awesome music. I really like the music in Shovel Knight. So I found out today that I live on the same street as Wings of Redemption when I ran into a gas station wow. nearby. Really weird to see a IRL. Yeah. Wow, that is very strange. You live in a very... Uh, quite the club. Hmm. Not a lot of people on, uh, yeah, oof, wow. Do not abuse that. Don't go bug, do not bug him or anything, but that's interesting to think about, but he's, he's out there. He, well, he, not walks, but like he is among, he lives among <laughs> us. Uh, Crowcat lied about the remake in his video for some reason and is trying to cover his ass by acting like being tongue in cheek about it will recover this. It won't. Uh... I don't it's, want to jump to. I wouldn't say lie. Disingenuous yeah. is where I'd rather go in terms of the choices of clips he played and what he did. Um, and it can happen so easily when you have a particular mode of thinking. I, I just give some benefit of the doubt. I guess is all I'm saying. Mm. The guy's done yeah, great yeah. work. That is very honest as well. So um, yeah, you know, a lot of like his stuff said, is really really good. Can be seen as a miss, and uh, just keep an eye on him. See what else he says. I don't know if he has like social media or anything, but a little bit unfortunate. Um, alas, ye sexy men, I can't stay, but have a couple bob from me, and well earned it is. Also, hi, Rags. Hello. Thank you very much. Yes, the Scott thank Pilgrim you. EFAP? Really expected on that front. Uh, uh, I don't think. Probably not. You know, have you seen it, Rags? No. I know that uh, myself and Fringy have, but I've never th mm -hmm. thought about it in like a way of like what a great movie that needs coverage sort of thing. It's more so a curiosity to me. An interesting film. But yeah, not much interest in Scott Pilgrim as an IP either. Yeah, I'm interested in reading care. the the graphic novel. I'm interested in checking it out. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the fact that I haven't gotten around to it in like over a decade, <laughs> probably, you know. Yeah. Hi all, great to see Platoon again. Hello. E. Um, SF6 is in RE Engine, meaning Chun Li mods, but. Well, yeah, go for it, I guess. The modding community is alive and well. We do all kinds of things. Uh, Bowser just needs a, to go to Toad to poke him. I don't think. Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure you're getting that, but. 
Are they poisonous or something? Go to Toad to poke him. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. Hey crew, today was my last day working at my first job and I wanted to thank you for helping me get through my shifts for the past three years. Appreciate you all massively and Don bless. Hey, uh, I guess, uh, I'm assuming that's like because you're moving on to a different job, which, awesome. Good luck, best of luck. Uh, mm -hmm. Glad to provide any and all entertainment in any way. Hello, my fellow Ewoks. Through the power of autism and boredom, I went from episode 1 to 227. May the dawn help you digest your small person McDonald's meals. Also, organized chaos is a mega troglodyte. All right. Um, it's also a reference. Mega troglodyte. The McDonald's thing again the other day. Still, you read it again, the tweet about the small amount for a normal <laughs> person. It's, it's just like, how? How? Why did crazy. you say that? <laughs> Um, Crowcat didn't do a video about The Last of Us PC port. Pretty sus. That's a bit strange. Well, I mean, he could be busy, I guess. Maybe he didn't play it. Yeah, I don't think it says anything necessarily. It's just uh, The reason I'm saying that's pretty strange is because um, it's such an easy dunk, I guess, in terms of a car yeah. comparison. Yeah. And an easy way to be like, this is fucked up. Stop. I thought we were past, you know, treating PC like it's worthless and not porting properly, but I guess not. Um, howdy all, still playing catch up, so currently on EFAP 76, having a blast. Wow. Rags, Mordhau was free on Epic Games. I played it. I suck at it, lol. Also, hi, Rags. Hello. Yeah, it's a tough game to get into. There's a lot of mechanics, and they, they work really well together, and it's super tight. But uh, yeah, it's you gotta kind of learn that game. But once you do, it becomes very, very, um, very uh, satisfying to be well at it. Um, anyway, God bless y'all. If I may, may I recommend the YouTube video Why the Mandalorian Season 3 I Actually the Best Season Yet by Siege of Clones? It's an experience. Best season, huh? <laughs> Damn. Alright. I'm assuming that was a hard. joke video, right? There's no... You can't make a serious case for that. That's impossible. Oh no, it was uploaded yesterday, not April Fool's. Well... <laughs> Who knows? Could oh, still be a parody. That means it's real. Uh, Grace Randolph said she loves Illumination and that Mario was the only bad film they've ever made due to Nintendo's involvement. The woman is a vegetable. <laughs> what? <laughs> Did you say that? Apparently. I need to... I've heard so many quotes what? from her that I need to go check out. How many... Like, has she got oh. one video about it or several? We need to do what? the great... We need to do, like, Grace Randolph versus, like, AI-generated... <laughs> of course, something like that. The only good, <laughs> the only bad Illumination movie. <laughs> like, the only bad Illumination one, and it's Nintendo's fault. <laughs> no way they actually funny said as that, fuck. right? We all, I'll go look into that and see if, it's, if she's actually said all this crazy shit. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there's a strategy FPS game called Hold Fast. They modded a server where you can play as an Aussie and the other team are emus. It was horrific experience. Oh no. Hopefully fun though. Uh, I really hope they take Nintendo franchises seriously after this. Fox in Space is a great example of how these stories could be. I don't know that we would ever get a Star Fox adaptation that is in yeah. that tone. I, my guess is that if they, uh, if they did a, a, a Star Fox thing, it would be like the, uh, the animated short film that they did to accompany Star Fox Zero. Um, it would be like that kind of vibe, which I'd be okay with. Um... Yeah, I don't think they'd ever adapt it like Fox in Space, but hey, at least we have a Fox in Space, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, what video game do you want to see a movie adaptation of, and who do you want to direct? Well, um, uh, I want to see Bioshock uh, in the form of a TV show or movie. As for who should direct, that's very complicated. I wouldn't mind giving it to Mike Flanagan. Actually. Yeah, he wants to do it, so... so yeah, that. either him or the, the Andor crew could probably do a pretty good... Uh... What do you think about uh, Quentin Tarantino doing Dead Space? Um, I, don't, I don't know what I think about that. I'm not I sure that that's very... I like the idea of Quentin Tarantino doing a Grand Theft Auto film. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but when it comes to Dead Space, I don't know. I just don't see that 
you know, like gelling with him. It would it would certainly create something, but I don't know how I feel about that. Um, no, not Zack Snyder. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. We're not letting him near anything that we care about. No, uh, no, 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 no. I'm just trying to think about like what I would. Um, hmm. Tempted to I give mean, I... Bieber a chance to do a Metal Gear film just because he's wanted to do that clearly for such a long time. Like get him to actually direct like a film. Yeah, just end his, his permanent frustration at not actually being a film director and give him I... Metal Gear Solid. That 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 I would probably watch that. That'd be interesting. Um hmm. I'm trying to think about I mean, I do like the idea of a Metroid film. I, I like that idea a lot. Um, I think I'd want that to be animated though as well. I, I like, I'm really, I'm really fine with, uh, th those sorts of, uh, like adapting these things as animation. I think I would have preferred Halo. Well, I would have preferred Halo if it was good, but if it's an animated series. That could be neat. Hmm. I, hmm, actually, I like the idea of an infamous film. Um, that could be neat. I don't know who I'd want to direct it though. <laughs> You do like Planet of the Apes, but with Pikmin. Yeah, I don't know who that's an that. idea. Yeah, all of my lands on Maniac. She blew it up with like <laughs> I don't know what would be what would be a figure of his culture. I don't I don't know that much about Pikmin. <laughs> I feel like a Pikmin film could be really interesting and experimental. The, the, the potential's limitless for them, but we'll have to see just how Damn, limited it becomes. Pikmin by Oddman. Like an Ardman adaptation. That would be cool, yeah. That could be cool. That's the one thing I'm... Of, of the few things I'm interested in in Star Wars is their visions short that they're doing for, uh... With Ardman. That could be cool. Uh, well, yeah. Good selection, I think. Yo, yo, yo. So. Love the coverage. What do you all think of the Back to the Future trilogy? Well, uh... I wouldn't. I I remember liking it, but I haven't seen it in a long time. So I would need to see it again before I make really any statements. That's pretty much where I'm at. Actually, it's been a long time since mm. I rewatched that, but always remember loving it. It's been a while since I watched two and three. I'm pretty sure I watched the first one more recently, but that's still years ago. So that'll be worth rewatching. They're gonna I think remake I was too young it at some when point. I first watched it. I don't. It, it never really stuck in my mind in the way that it does seem to for so many people. I've, I've watched all of them. I think I just it, they never really did anything for me. But I don't think I was probably like six when I watched them. So I need to see, re see them. Uh, listening to Evat whilst running has increased my long powers. Used to be wiped running five k in thirty minutes. Now I can comfortably do six k in twenty five. Cheers, lads. Well, that's all you, I'd say. But hey, good job, sir. Glad we yeah. can be of company while you're doing it. Uh, Ray is back. Ahsoka is back. Jedi boredom. I, I mean, Order is back. Star Wars is back, baby. I'm very proud to be a Star Wars fan. Also, Fringy, COD 4 versus Remake. Oh, yeah, like guess, Call yeah. of Duty 4 over Modern Warfare. I, I, yeah, I like Call of Duty 4 more than Modern Warfare, but I was surprised by how much I enjoyed um, the reboot. But yeah, I prefer Call of Duty 4. As for them all being back and Star Wars is saved, yeah, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep an eye on it. Don't, or do, don't you worry. Uh, question for all. If you were to encounter an adult who'd never played a video game before, but came to you wanting to play one, what would you recommend? Uh, Tetris, Super maybe, Mario yeah. World, uh, or Super Mario 64 maybe, to introduce into like 3D games. Um, yeah, because the idea is you kind of think something simple and introduces them to the idea. Um, maybe if you only had one, something that could achieve that, and then the more complicated side, maybe Minecraft. Minecraft is a really good one um, to introduce them to. I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about like, would it be worthwhile to introduce Metro Prime? Uh, is a, is a really good choice to introduce somebody to video games. One of the of things, life. though, that um, I think that should be kept in mind is someone who's never played a video game. I think they might have a lot of um, the like the first time you ever play a, like a first person shooter where you're moving with one like essentially hand and you're looking around with the other and operating in a three dimensional space. That might because it's odd. It's like I'm trying to imagine myself as a completely different person, but that might be really difficult for someone to do as their first experience. Um, because I know it's that why, 
I've given like like adults if they've I've been been around like adults who've tried to play like a video game like Call of Duty or something, and they just they it really is difficult for them to grasp like oh this thumbstick moves the character in the space, and then the other one looks around and changes where you're looking, and that's tied on you know where your character is, and it's like a really difficult thing for them to sort of get. So starting them some with something very simple like um like a two D uh, like platformer. The, is yeah, there an 2D argument platformer, move even left, for like move right. Mario Party or something, because it's got such a, a wide variety of incredibly simplistic mechanics that you're getting kind of you're, you're touching That's base with a load of different choice. games. Things. Maybe um, mm -hmm. I wonder if yeah. you want to give them a decent amount of time with something slower paced that they can work with to get you know c so that they can. Cause remember, if someone hasn't played a, you know any games like that. This element of you have all these buttons and they correspond to something happening on a screen. So giving them like Mario as a platformer. Give them and then saying, all right, you can have all this time to move left and right, and you can see what the jump does, and you can acclimate yourself to this very consistent thing instead of a new game. And then by the time they're like trying to grasp the game and the controls and making things happen, it's a new game, and now you have to do another new game, and it's a whole different set of rules. Pong. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> Pong, Tetris, uh, like maybe Super oh, Mario, oh. stuff like, like that. Or something. You know, like a fighting game, one-on-one -on -one sort of thing. That might be worthwhile, too. Fuck it, give them Dark Souls. Yeah, get them right in. <laughs> Throw them in the a racing end. game yeah. might be pretty good. Like a, sim a, a sort of simple racing game where it's very clear what you're trying to do. <laughs> like Press this to go forward. It's really only left and right, you know? Move left, avoid the obstacles. Pretty, you know, pretty simple kind of stuff. Civilization, maybe? If you want to, if you, if, if somebody's like, no, I know what Mario Maybe. is, but like something else, you know, like, I know what a platformer like a, is, like, yeah, a let's. turn-based game, that might not be a bad idea, because they have all the exactly, time in the world. Exactly. It's not based off of, like, your ability to, like, hand-eye coordination, which they'll pick up over time. A but, you know, cerebral. click this to do this. Yeah, like, you know, anyone can play, like, Solitaire on a computer, you know, that's super easy to get. Uh, because you're just clicking on icons, essentially moving cards around, and it's a rule set that you already understand. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it is getting people used to the idea of moving around a character, especially if it's in first person, looking around, moving around. Uh, it can be very strange, maybe a bit daunting at first. It's hard to imagine it because I'm so used to it, you know, what it must yeah. be for someone who's never done that before in their life. Uh, the first Star Wars movie was also quite simple. Very easy to, uh, like, follow along as a storyline, yeah. You can sum it up pretty quickly. Simple stories can be overlooked sometimes when people are prepping to release something. It's like, it's gotta have more things in it. It's gotten pretty tiring for Marvel, right? Like, they've got some of the most insane and complicated plot lines going. Um, but you might be better off just making things a little more simple. Yeah. Mm. I would absolutely adore an EFAP movies on the original Super Mario Brothers movie. Probably already requested, but worth stating anyway. That'll be on the way. Um, yeah, I'm interested in seeing it because I've heard of it, but I've never, I've never seen it. I've seen like screenshots, but I can't imagine that that movie in motion. Yeah, it's been interesting to check out. Little Platoon's omnipresence continues to impress. Uh. Uh, thank you, I guess. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I'm actually half present today just because, yeah, last night was not expecting to be to be up until six o'clock this morning, but this has been a really nice way to sort of recover from the hangover. So nice and chill. <laughs> yeah, uh, I do cross paths with you a decent amount, double because of uh, open bar and stuff. Mm. You been on FNT yet? Have they dragged you on there? They have not, I don't think, no. Only a matter of time. Always available. If I remember correctly, Miyamoto has considered Mario's story elements to be secondary for a while, so it's possible they didn't get much pushback from him on playing it safe with the narrative. I guess um, they mean secondary to mechanics, but that's the thing. There aren't mechanics in the, f in the film, you know, game mechanics, so... I would imagine that Miyamoto might have been talking to them about trying to capture almost an amount of game feel through the animation. Um, I could see that for yeah. sure, like in terms of timing and, and um, framing, pacing, animations. I did hear quite a lot of people were saying that the story's the sort of very, very simplistic structure is it could well be because of him. Apparently Miyamoto has a reputation for not liking or for discouraging 
extensive plot in video games. I don't know enough about him to know whether that's true. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys know more. I think Miyamoto, me as I understand it, Miyamoto was uh his like perspective on what should be like in Mario and stuff can like differ depending on what it is. I believe um because like I said, I think Paper Mario Thousand Year Door is one of the games that gets highlighted of like wow, there's like a actually a pretty good story in this game. And then for whatever reason, when Paper Mario kept going, story started to just get pushed to, to the side more in favor of like leaning into it being a Paper Mario thing of like what like stickers and coloring in and and like and uh and like cardboard cutouts and stuff like that like that gimmick. And I believe it was because of like Miyamoto's perspectives and stuff on on like narrative in Mario. Um, or that maybe like the Mario and Luigi games kind of like lean into narrative and comedy, so like it shouldn't be in um as much for uh the mainline games. I'm not sure. I the impression I get with the mainline Mario's is they need to be like really approachable. And that in his view, approachable means like the story is really easy to grasp very quickly, but not particularly like involved in and uh and detailed. It's just a hook to get you to, you know, start playing the game. But I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not sure what he would have thought in a lot of ways on this film. I really like Peach in this movie. Not like the game, but she gets yeeted into the stairs and loses her power up same as the boys. She's valid. Also, hi, doggy. Hello. Um, yeah, I don't know. I thought she was like the weakest one. <laughs> like, kind definitely, of all characters, so. uh, yeah, definitely the weakest. Or was that one about Peach? Yeah, they said they like that she lost her powers the same way as everyone else does in terms of like mechanics. She's like, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, I mean, like I, I think like Peach is an active participant in the story. I like that everybody works together and that everybody has contributions to make in in you know like the battle. Yeah. Like you know, like they don't succeed without Peach. They don't succeed without Donkey Kong. Uh, they don't succeed without Mario or Luigi. Like everybody's active and working together and and part of it. I just think that. Even even for as uh, even for as I guess not super developed and fleshed out as all the characters are, I felt like she had the least going for her in terms of an arc. She's pretty static, which isn't a problem. Um, but yeah, what we had wasn't very interesting. Yeah. It was yeah. Uh, it, it's just Mario was determined, so was Peach. It's like, but Mario was also some other things too. And it's like yeah, I feel like we just need a little bit more for Peach. Um, I don't know how much this is true, but what if it's like a safe proof of concept thing to see if it works and then they expand on it with more movies or something? Also, hi, Rex. Hello. Because we'll have to see. It could be that this was like, they get this done and then they're like, all right, now we can expand. And Yeah, uh, this could be the first movie we see. I'll have to wait and find out. Not an ounce of her cute bubbliness, just another generic female character. Um, I'm inclined to agree like that they're... she's generic. There are aspects of it, like, um, like, I like that they have the, if she uses her dress to, like, glide down after she beats the, uh, the level, that's, like, a very quintessentially, like, peach move. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think, I think I would have preferred it if they played up, uh, they played up more of that aspect of her character. Um, yeah. There was a missed opportunity to frame Peach as a sheltered, pampered princess who has no confidence or experience with warfare. Uh, it would have made her turning to Mario and the Kongs make more sense. I, th I think there's an angle just to go with the whole, like, she's in way over her head when her role actually has to be the role instead of it being for fun. I think that was the angle you could have gone with. The, you know, princess. Mm. Just telling a basic story. I mean, it was kind of critical of Dungeons and Dragons when it came out for being very safe, but it was, it did some things quite well and it, it gave a sort of a mini three act structure to each one of its individual sort of core cast of characters so it wasn't just you have the main character who has the three act arc and everyone else sort of helps him along with that every single one of them had sort of set up set down pay off at the end um and it's, it's simple simple stuff but it, it did actually it improved the film i think from what could otherwise have been an incredibly generic fantasy blockbuster um it was simply slightly less generic as a fantasy blockbuster with with mario it would have been nice to see something more like that i think you can give peach some sort of three-act structure within the broader three-act structure of the thing to actually give her a fleshed out character who suffers significant setbacks which can parallel mario's in some way it would just make the film feel fuller than it does i think and slightly more memorable and there's, there's more reason to invest in peach as a character as opposed to peach's plot function 
Having not seen Mario yet, I will ask if this turns out to set up a deeper and more complex sequel. Now that this one has gotten its foot in the door with a safe, simple story, would your opinion of Mario 1 improve thereafter? No. No. Mm. It would not. It would just... Yeah, it just wouldn't change yeah, our opinion of it. If not they, mine. If least, they bounced you know. off the first movie really well and made a sequel that we all consider great, and they used everything in the first one, it wouldn't make the first one better. Be the good job yeah, on the make second, the second one. one I'm wondering better. if... Yeah. Uh, they they set up the whole Peach backstory thing, but we haven't really done anything with it yet. I'm wondering if that's like a thing that they're leaving because they want to do it in the sequel. Probably. That'd be my guess. Yeah. But but what might I get the impression that she actually won't be from Earth. It'll be like somewhere else. Um because that's like that seems like the obvious choice. Maybe it'll have something to do with like, I don't know, um some other some other realm or land. She does have yeah, a line, doesn't she, about there being loads of, like, a vast yeah, multiple of galaxies. Lots of galaxies. Those. That's where it's like, hmm, are we gonna try and tie that into, like, Super Mario Galaxy? Because I could see them having Rosalina show up in the next one. I don't know if they're gonna have Daisy show up. I actually think they'd just go to Rosalina. Um, yeah, maybe. Maybe, maybe because it, it almost feels like Peach is kind of uh, encroaching a little bit on, uh, on Daisy's sort of uh, territory. The EFAP panel, yeah. panel is wrong on this one. The story is focused on the Mario Bros. Weird that you would start with that we're wrong on something and then repeat something we've said. Yeah, in fact, that was like one of the big things we complimented. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> I'm going to be honest, a little lost on you there because that's something that we think, but <laughs> very well. I wish this movie had Black Panther Wakanda Forever runtime or somewhere close to that. I feel as though there were some scenes missing, like Donkey Kong and his father's relationship. DK's father thinks all his son can do is smash things. I'd love to see a DK flashback of that. I'm not actually against that for once. I think that if we had more scenes to flash out, more stuff with more characters, like that Luigi Toad theoretical scene, or mm -hmm. um, more with DK and his dad, or more with even Peach, yeah. I, I actually think it, it's, it's rare, because I'm so fucking happy for movies to be shorter these days, but it's like, you know what? Probably squeeze a bit more in there, maybe, yeah, actually. I think uh, a lot of animated films, like family-oriented animated films, end up being about 90 minutes. So I, that, I, they probably never even thought yeah. about pushing it to be a bit longer than that. There's some simple little connective stuff you could add without really boosting the film's runtime like significantly. I think one of the things that I noted was that so you know Bowser is always given sort of very convenient plot relevant information at precisely the moment the film needs him to do the next thing, but it's never really established how Bowser's getting all of this information about Peach's plans about where they're going. Like a simple little connecting thing with a little what's the little guy who dangles the camera from his cloud in Mario Six? Ah, uh, Lakitu. Lakitu uh, acting as some kind of spy, and then it's just like one <laughs> connecting scene. He's watching them go down the Rainbow Road. He reports back to Bowser, and you know exactly what's happened just then. But it's it's a little thing, but it might have been nice to see a reference that's actually useful as opposed to just a reference existing for the sake of referencing. But Lakitu is a lad, though. So he can be a lad and a spy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, remember the blue shell as a suicide bomber? Yeah, pretty much. I don't think he made it. <laughs> well, maybe he did. I don't know. Uh, now that the doors are open, I'm hoping for a James Gunn-style Star Fox. Any thoughts and experience with Star Fox? Hi, rags and mools. Hello. Hello. Uh, my experience with Star Fox is Star Fox 64, Star Fox Assault, and that's it. The only two I've played. I played bits of a lot of them, and then a lot of like the Smash crossovers and stuff with him and him. He's always been pretty cool. Well, for me, it was a uh, <clears throat> sixty-four, uh, mainly sixty-four, and then I also played Star Fox Zero. Um, and I like Star Fox. I I would like for more Star Fox stuff in general. I would like for new games, and I think that that's like. It's probably one of Nintendo's better things to translate to film. Um, yeah, I really like Star Fox, conceptually. Alrighty. And yeah, James Gunn doing a Star Fox film, I think that could work. Do I not? I'd be down with that. Could be fun. Mario hating mushrooms is kind of meta-funny too, since the Sonic movies make fun of mushrooms. Kingdom Hearts cinematic universe. Let's go to the Olympics. Why don't we make that movie? <laughs> 
Special Olympics. Can't believe they Chris Chan Bowser at the end. He'll he'll be back. They shrink him? I <laughs> did Chris Chan get shrinked? No. Um oh hey. Okay. Thoughts on Ratatouille. Rags, go. I love Ratatouille. Why Rags specifically? Did he recently watch it, rewatch it? No, oh, he's always sung the praises no. of Ratatouille. No, I really, really like Ratatouille. I think it's a great story about, you know, cooperating with other people and following your dreams. It's got great music. It's got a wonderful ending. And of course, it's got wonderful animation to it as well. I like the cast of characters and it's funny. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I really dig Ratatouille. I haven't seen it in a long time, though, so I should probably uh, refresh myself. It is one of Pixar's best films. That's uh, Brad Bird again. <laughs> Delivered a, a classic. And then, I don't know, he hasn't made much interesting stuff lately, unfortunately. So that gets me a bit sad. Because uh, he, he did mention Impossible 4, Ghost Protocol. I remember enjoying that, but I haven't seen that like since it came out, I think. And then it was, I think it was something called Tomorrowland that didn't do very well. And then Incredibles 2, so. <laughs> uh. um, absolutely unrelated to Mario, but have any of you massives watched Succession? It's been getting a ton of praise as of late. I kind of want to because of what everyone's been saying yeah, about it. Yeah. I'm curious. Not... Yeah, I've, I've heard good things, but I don't know anything about it, really. Apparently. Uh, the recent episode that you were talking about that everybody's raving about is like the second episode of TV to get a 10 on IMDb. The only other one is Ozzy Mandis. See, that's oh, wow. why I want to mm. see this show because I'm like, what's everyone talking about? I don't know. <laughs> I want in on it. Uh, have you guys considered having Yahtzee from ZP on for game discussions? RE4 Remake would have been a cool opportunity. Also, Cat's RE4 video was bad. It was. Um, yeah. As for Yahtzee, we'd happily have Yahtzee. him on whenever he wants. I don't think he does podcasts, though. Uh, probably not, but hey, doors open. Hey. Yeah, that's right. The invitation is there. We'd love to pick your brain. Have you seen the Pikmin shorts that Nintendo made? They're a fun little watch. I haven't. No. No. I think I have. I remember uh, Nintendo made these little uh, stop motion uh, shorts for Yoshi's Woolly World. They were, they were great. Uh, did you guys recognize slash appreciate that Bowser's Peaches song was a riff on Jack Black's song Fuck Her Gently? I've, I heard Gary say that as well. I don't know, as someone who's heard a shit ton of Jack Black's songs, it just sounds like it fits in with a lot of them rather than being a riff on specifically Fuck Her Gently. But if it is, like, because I don't feel them matching more so than a lot of different songs that he's sung, then um, that's hilarious. But uh, uh, in any case, like, I just enjoy hearing him sing, because he's fun. He's a fun dude. Tenacious D is underrated. Go check out Pick a Destiny, okay? Everybody, it's fun. Fun movie. Wherever I clear a theater, someone hums a Mario tune. It's catchier than the pop songs to the audiences. I would have thought so. Yeah. You now remember Pokemon Detective Pikachu the movie. Well, I don't remember it. I haven't seen it, so... I haven't seen it either. Ryan Reynolds is Detective Pikachu. Yeah. That's an old... I'm, I'm pretty sure that Detective Pikachu has, like, more of a, a gruff, kind of grizzly voice. But they're like, hey, Ryan Reynolds, can you be Ryan Reynolds but Pikachu? That's my guess as to the general tone of that film. How did that one do that one? Because it completely passed me by. I remember seeing it when it was, well, I remember seeing the adverts for it when it came out and thinking, yeah, if I have time, I'll, I'll get around to it and just never did. I, I assume it didn't do like incredibly well because it's not sort of still uh, at the forefront of people's minds. Was it any good? I, it made, it had a budget of 150 million, so on cheap, and it made 433 million. Mm -hmm. uh, second highest grossing video game adaptation behind Warcraft. Um, but I don't know, I don't know, like, I, I don't think I've seen anybody talk about that film. I don't think it made much of an impression. Uh, people getting upset and triggered about four grown men doing a detailed critical breakdown of a kid's movie are entirely missing out on the fact that four grown men doing a detailed critical breakdown of a kid's movie is hilarious. Comedy gold. Keep it up. Oh, all right, then. Why not? If you can get anything out of it, enjoy it. I just happen to find storytelling interesting on all forms. I suppose it would probably get a bit weird if we were to review, like, Teletubby stories. 
But I'm sure there's some fun to be garnered from that too, I'd imagine. Mm. Some of the best films with the best stories are not specifically kids' films, but they are family films. Um, yep. there's, there's a reason we remember all of these. There's a reason that they are memorable and a whole host of other kids' films are not. And that, that's because there's a qualitative difference between something like Up or something like Incredibles and something like, I don't know, any given generic kids' film that's left absolutely no impression on anyone ever. And it's interesting to find out what the difference is and why one is remembered and one is not. Um, hey, Mabel, Frong, and Midget Platoon, did you see EFAP get a mention on Timcast IRL where Destiny called it every frame of painting? <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> <laughs> you sure he wasn't talking about the actual channel every frame of painting? Well, every frame of painting. Because it's so funny yeah. how that got that happened with uh, Hassad as well, mixing those up. Oh, well, uh, man, I, I do love that it was just like, oh, EFAP talked about you, and then he was immediately like, fuck those guys. It's like, you don't even know if it was positive yeah. or negative. It was negative, but you didn't know. <laughs> you didn't know. <laughs> like, yeah, we could have promoted him, you know? Could have worked out. But um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I've seen that, so I'll have to check it out. I'm assuming this is more recent time with uh, Tim Pool. I think he went on there recently, yeah. Also, hello, Ragules. Um, he would have said hi back. He's currently on the phone. But a different phone, not this phone. It's too bad that it's not Nintendo and DreamWorks. Hey man, it's not too late for that. That might happen at some point. Uh, will you masses be checking out the System Shock remake? The progenitor of all the shocks might be neat. Hi, Rags. Um, I'll probably check out the System Shock remake, but I'd be very tempted to go back and see if I can get through a playthrough of, like, the originals. They might be- they might have aged out of my preferences, though. I'm not sure. Uh, Riot CEO says he recently saw Arcane Season 2, Episode 3, by the way. Oh boy, they're- they're making progress, they're getting there. If that means they're 3 out of 9, or whatever, done, it's just like, whatever it takes, guys, just whatever it takes. I'll wait to see it when it's done. Oh, time. I mean, my guess would be that they are- they are working on all of the episodes concurrently. Probably. Um, it's just strange to say that he's seen specifically episode three, I guess. Is episode maybe, three wrapped maybe up? Maybe I don't further know. along on the production timeline. Perhaps. Uh, the Fallout series will probably be bad. Bethesda can't even keep the lore consistent in between games. Watch Kretosis' video on it for more context. I think it's safe to say any will probably be bad, but that we can have pleasant surprises here and there, depending on who's in production, who who writes, who directs, who stars, who cares, is the main thing. Yeah. So yeah, don't get your hopes high based on the reality of the situation, as in, like, this thing is getting adaptation. It's like, mm-hmm, dot, dot, dot. A lot of fans for Star well, Wars are super excited about Thrawn getting his mentions, and it's just like, why, guys? I don't know why. Yeah. Wait. Gotta wait a sec. Yeah, there was a time when that might have been exciting, and now it kind of fills you with dread. Yep. So, uh, the parts where Adam Driver pulls his something, it's just starred out and argues with it a pretty intense and Oscar worthy IMO. I agree. <laughs> pulls his what out and argues <laughs> with it? It's starred, so like, it's, it's four <laughs> letters, whatever it is. Possibly Did? Dick, could be something else. I don't remember that scene, but I'll take you. Oh, it was a great it. scene. It might have not, you might have not seen the deleted. The uh, scene version, you know, or the director's cut, yeah. <laughs> um, do y'all have a favorite romance relationship project for class? Hmm. Um, Ooh. well, to cite a classic, I, I love the, the Han and Leia in Empire. It comes across as super fucking realistic and uh, natural. There's a couple in the Buffy verse that I would probably cite as favorites. Uh, favorite romance relationship. What else we got? To think of like all the different oh, right. ones. Blind Sorry, Anna was pretty good. The, uh, yeah. Famous romance or relationship? Yeah, famous favorite romantic relationship from I guess media. Uh hmm. <laughs> so was it Adigan and Bad Bay? Adigan's <laughs> <laughs> Bay. Um. Hmm. God, romance. Oh, it's got to be Elrond and Galadriel from Rings of Power, right? <laughs> mm. No, maybe not. <laughs> um, Elrond and Durin from Rings of Power Elrond as well. And Durin from, well, yeah. He's, uh... uh, boy. Gosh. I... 
it's weird that I'm drawing a blank because I've seen a million of them, but I'm just trying to think of ones that like stick with me because I'm not a big like romance guy. Um, someone else can give their suggestion while I'm thinking, I guess. Well, I threw in Han and Leia, and um, I think Fringy mentioned mentioned Bly Manor. I think. So. Yes. That's so, a really strong one. There's a couple I want to be vague on from the Buffy verse, but if you're familiar with that show, then you'll know. Then uh, again, there's like <laughs> fucking yep. 17 in that show, so you might not know. You might not know which ones I'm referring to, but that's fine. Um, Bella and his sparkly vampire, of course. So, um, yeah, what about you, Platoon? You got any? I'm struggling with this one a lot. Because I know there are some, but then none, nothing is coming to mind, which is really annoying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just not. I don't know something about it. Just doesn't stick with me. A lot of good romances. I could name like a gajillion, but I'm I'm trying to think of ones that are like, oh yeah, of course this one really is. It's you know it's it's really meaningful for me, and I love it so much. That's of like a romantic connection. Um. Ah, uh, ba 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 ba. I I am drawing a total blank here. I feel like I should have an answer for this, but I just don't. In, in books, as a left field suggestion, Alexander and Hephaestion in Mary Reynolds' historical trilogy is pretty sensitively done and quite good. Um, I don't even know why the hell that one came to mind first, but that's a yeah, that's the only one. That's the only one that came to mind. It was a Barbier God door. <laughs> Um, well, hopefully, hopefully they only needed a couple examples for the projects. So. Perhaps it'll work. Uh, high rags. Hello. There was another two high rags that came in while you were uh, you were away. Hello to both of you. Sorry, I missed it. No problem. Uh, they they said I need a hero. Oh, um, I don't need any more because I've <laughs> we've I've got, got quite a few. Got plenty that day. Uh, at least M Knight had the balls to wait to reveal the planet was Earth and After Earth. This seems like the thing uh, to do. I know. But then, yeah, right, like, yeah. I'm to more also, surprised if it isn't Earth. And, but then to also do the whole, like, 65 billion years ago, he landed on Earth. You're like, oh. <laughs> the planet Earth, where you are right now. Uh, thoughts on The Last of Us 2 being split into two seasons, said by Druckmann, Hi Rags, Hut Cream. Oh, hi. Um... I don't know what to make of it. I, I mean, it's interesting, but I, think it makes I guess there's sense. either a lot of stuff that they want to do or a lot of stuff they're trying to set up so that maybe the stuff in the game works better. Last of Us is a longer game. So I it guess is. like in strict like time, like yeah, sure. I guess it makes sense. You're gonna do two seasons, but you know, like I got nothing to say about that until I see it. Uh, <laughs> I don't have high hopes. Yeah, yeah. I just don't know. It can is be there any way that they can they can do what the game did but salvage it so people don't hate it? Is Not that... impossible, but you have to change so much that mm. I just don't think to they'll the do it. To the point where it's like, yeah, um, the amount of work and restructuring that you have to do if you really want that ending to be the thing that you do. Yeah, if we broaden um... it out to Abby kills Joel and is sympathetic by the end, it's like, you can do that, but <laughs> you can't do people it the way you already... did it. You can't yeah, people are already time. super primed against that, even just conceptually. Yeah, they've already um, wasted their shot once, and so now people are going to hate it no matter what. Like, they're in definitely. a bad position. Don't have her say, you don't get to rush this as she beats him to death. That would be that would be a bad idea. Don't have no, Manny spit gonna... on his corpse, please. Uh, no. Um, d d yeah, damn. Like, d I was about to say, like, d you gotta... Because I was just thinking about how bad the dialogue is in that game. Um, that might be one of the few cases where I felt that the swearing was actually ex uh, excessive. Everybody swore all the time, and it felt like, ah, that's mature, isn't it? Character swearing, yeah, super that's something mature for a mature game. That's something I'm 50-50 on in even the first Last of Us. Um, Ellie swears a lot. Also, Does know, she? Like, yeah, she says fuck a lot. Huh. And, and, and Yeah, like I said, I, I, I'm of two minds about it. I'm not sure how I feel. Um, woo, TLP, he needs to come on more. Well, I mean, if he wants to. <laughs> Anytime you like. Depends how much shit there is that comes out. All good things. <laughs> we can talk about good things. We've talked about good things. Some things are good, sometimes. Um, I want Zach Hadel to guest on Best of the Worst so bad. Sure. 
I like any guests that come on there that are different. Fun. Someone give us a little bravo emote. You, oh, you well, much. bravo. Thank you. Super Mario movie oh. is an Sorry. isekai. What's that again? Isekai? isekai, I think, means you get transported to, like, some crazy world. Ah. Like, that's what it is. Well, I mean, it's a bit of that. Um, Assassin's Creed show each season a different ancestor. I mean, that would be cool, but I don't know if they're even going to try with Assassin's Creed, because they did that film, right, with Michael Fassbender that nobody watched. <laughs> I did watch true. it and then promptly forgot everything about it. I was going to say, I so... saw it and forgot it as well. I haven't seen it. Um, I never got around to it. I think that was at the. I think that film came out when I was like hyper apathetic towards Assassin's Creed. Like it had just totally diminished to the point where I'm like, ah, I don't care anymore. But I wonder if they'll give it a try because Ubisoft certainly. Uh, that's like one of their few remaining like franchises that they can reliably make money off of right now. Mm -hmm. What's the last Ubisoft game that any of you guys played? Oh, Fringy, you can't be asking us these incredibly difficult questions. Um, yeah, legitimately, right? Um, I don't know. List. It might unironically be Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, list of Ubisoft games. I think the last one I played was Odyssey. Same, I think. It, it um, might have been a I'm Rayman game that. for me. Oh, they, they have, Rayman Legends came out in 2012, so... <laughs> that might be it. That's what I'm, what I'm saying. What, do you play Far sure. Cry 3? Oh, oh, the wow, Far Cry wow. games. Those are Ubisoft, aren't they? Um, yeah, Far Cry the last one I played New was Dawn. Five. That's 2019, I think. So I years. think so. I'm looking through because I didn't play Six. Oh, I didn't play no, Valhalla. Rayman, uh, Mario and uh, Rabbids, smaller. That would be ah, the last one. Ah, there played. you go. That's what. That's yeah. the recent one. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Tom Clancy's The Division Resurgence. Uh, yeah, a lot of these are just. Track Mania, Skull and Bones, Rocksmith 2, Mighty Quest 2, Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. That's not out yet. That's upcoming. Uh Valiant Hearts. Yeah, I think I think it's Far Cry New Dawn. Yeah, see, I feel like I feel like a lot of people are in the same boat where it's like, what's the last Ubisoft game you play? <laughs> it's like, oh, except for Rainbow Six. A lot of people still play that, but like otherwise. Yeah, I don't yeah know. they play Siege. I think Siege is pretty popular, but yeah. I, I think what they're trying to do is trying to get that for all it's worth, because they might not have you know... They might I'm not pretty have sure a lot, Ubisoft lot of options is legit upcoming. in financial trouble. I think so, yeah. Um, uh, they've been... Yeah, that popped up in the news uh, a while back. They might legitimately have some well, I think issues. I think it was something that they got in trouble for, because they sent like an open letter to employees about how they needed to like step up or something, because Ubisoft was in a difficult position. Um... I mean, it makes sense, right? I feel like you don't hear about Ubisoft games much lately. <laughs> I don't know when the last time you did. I mean, whenever I hear about Ubisoft in the news, it's never anything good. It's not because they're doing no, great or well, they made an NFTs, amazing game. NFTs, right? Have you guys heard of NFTs? <laughs> it's just, it just reeks of... It's its just digging your own grave, isn't it? <laughs> but it's working at Ubisoft. <laughs> Someone at Ubisoft thought, you know what? This will save us if we make an NFT thing, game, whatever. This will be the thing. This will get us in the black. Oh, yeah. Super off topic, but Avatar 2 shows that adopted orphans truly cannot be loved as much as biological kids, lol. Yeah, it does. That's, that's a message in that one. Uh, well, also, we just thought that Nateri was going to kill him, apparently. And yeah, maybe that's the message. Nateri's just fucking nuts. Ship, you know? He has to swim his way back. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, oh, you're here. All right. Yeah. Okay. It is one of those films where I'd have been really happy to see all of them die and not just the orphan. Yeah, I'm fine with nuking the whole thing. <laughs> Nuke the franchise. Also, play DDLC, Dumbos. Perhaps one day. Who knows? When and what movie is y'all's next EFAP movies? Because they're hilarious. That's a great question. More information on that will present itself eventually. For now, EFAP TV shall be the uh, new releases. But don't you worry. EFAP Movies is on like a hiatus, but it, it'll come back and in full force. I look forward to explaining just what I mean by that when I get around to it. Uh, ever thought about having Sheev Talks or any of the Ecom hosts on? We're pretty much in a position where like fucking anybody could come on depending on different situations. The, the, the one thing about uh like messages i get in terms of like how how do i i've I've had plenty of people say like how do i apply how do i get to the point it's just like 
Never going to be a thing that works that way. It's all very strange. The best way I can find to be fair and uh, and um, consistent, I guess. But to be honest with you, we haven't had a lot of new, new people on as of late. And I'd like to try and um, get that going. Like Robert Meyer Burnett we had on. That was fun. Yeah, that right? was fun. Jurassic that was Kong. very fun. I like it. Legendary film. Um, so yeah, you know, you never know who is and who isn't going to turn up at what times. But hopefully we can keep uh, keep things spicy. Different ways. Uh, hey guys, have you considered revisiting the old X Men movies to see how they hold up? Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, yes. Uh, I like how Rise is like, no, it's like definitely I'm interested. Okay. In you, I, I'm not, I'm not speaking for anyone else. Like, I hadn't considered that. The actually was if I, I believe him. I believe it, Rise is not considered. No, 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 no. I had I, never I, considered I watching. Not considered it. But now I would. Kind of I, I would totally I, I, do I it. I, I would. I also if you guys, have. If you I, uh, messaged me tomorrow and said, Rags, clear your schedule tomorrow. We're doing an X-Men marathon. We're going X-Men mode. We're going to watch all the X-Men movies. I'd be like, yeah, sure. I'm totally fine with that. I, but I just never considered it. I'm actually, like, super interested in in, uh, in revisiting those films because, like, I, I like a lot of those X-Men films. I'm curious about how good they are. <laughs> and, uh, I'm curious about the things that I'm specifically going to be uh, excited and interested about. It's the second one that's generally considered to be the best of the three, right? Yes. The X first one is two okay. Two this one's okay, two is like, great, three is bad. That's what like. people... Yeah. Three is bad. And then Origins Wolverine. It's, Very bad. It's, then it's the movie. Wolverine, some people try to defend uh, it, say well, it's okay. You first Class, which I remember liking a lot. I remember actually quite liking First Class. There's that too, yeah. The, There's the, First Class days they're, they're honestly... Path. It'd be kind of cool to do like a big old uh, thing through them all and rank them all. Um, yeah, because I I think I wonder how people might find some placements interesting. Would be, of I course, guess. Hey, they would. That's, that's what happened with our DC EU rankings, and that blew me away. That surprised though. even <laughs> us. That surprised me. Um, and because uh, I was going into a lot of those movies for the first time, but based off of what I'd heard, I was surprised by how it kind of ended up being. And if we ever do, like, uh, I don't know if we like a strong MCU complete watch through retrospective, whatever. But I bet those will continue to surprise people for quite a while. Hmm. What I, I uh, what, said so far stands uh, good. Stands well. What I think I'm most interested in with the X-Men films is how much of it is elevated by like incredible casting decisions, you know, like getting, getting uh Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen, you know, like as, Charles and uh, Eric, respectively. It's like, damn, man, that's like perfect. And then they kind of mm. did it again with like James McAvoy and Eric Fa uh, Fassbender. Michael. Wait, why did I say Eric? Michael Fassbender. Has, like, that was another one where it's like, damn, man, like, it's really important that you get the casting right for like these two characters. Mm -hmm. Like, and they, they nailed it both times. And then they're going to nail Jack it again. Uh, damn. Um... The, the problem is, uh, go for it. I was because they didn't Patrick Stewart recently say that he didn't think he or Ian McKellen were yet finished with the X Men. So <laughs> what? Did he, um, what is, I, th I thought, I thought he said Logan he was, was meant to be yeah. the end. Yeah. I could have sworn I read an interview where he said that he thought they might go back. I, I could. I might have just made. Oh, that dude, up. I'll, I'll take a sure billion hours of Ian McKellen's Magneto. I don't care. He can be literally in a wheelchair, being like, uh, <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I love if, that if, man uh, as I Magneto. Just, I just hope he doesn't get like injured on the Picard sets, and we don't get any more like. Oh, acting oh from see, him. I deliberately yeah, did not yeah. say I want more Patrick Stewart because I'm fucking tired of seeing him get killed and be weary. Yeah, I'm just like leave him alone. Yeah. Maybe We're I'll feel that way about Ian McKellen too if I saw yeah. more of it. But ugh, I love the I, power behind Ian McKellen's performances. I feel like whoever gets cast for those two characters, it's like, damn man, like the fact that you nailed it twice makes me think that you're not going to nail it a third time. Yeah. <laughs> like you gotta. You gotta make a, a grievous error, but who knows? Maybe I feel like they recognize how important it is to to get the casting right for those two characters, and of course the poor f the you know I feel a great a great swell of pity for the poor fool who has to play Wolverine after Hugh Jackman. It's like damn man, that's uh yeah, that's those damn. are big shoes to fill. We'll give him that's a fair uh... shake here on EFAP, but again, big shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. Um. Though I think I've said that if with re if they uh, the problem I don't want to build up any expectations for like the MCU X Men because I was about to be like it'd be interesting if you know focus more on like Scott and stuff or or like uh, Rogue and and the like and it's like uh, why am I even why do I bother like it's gonna it's gonna be bad <laughs> whatever they end up doing 
Surprised there was no chain chomp scene. Yeah, you think you'd see a chain so many things I haven't done yet. And It'll there's so fine. many things that they've just alluded to, or like they're never gonna not be able to use piranha plants, you know, or bullet bills. Those are just mainstays. Those will always and be around. And Coopers, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing is, uh, do we start to see? Because we already saw a bunch of like the enemy oh, characters yeah. from the series, so yeah, there's there's not as many left now. But I imagine that because there's plenty that you could pull from Super Mario World, like Dinosaur Island. I we think, yeah, there. people forget, and I'm not like a big Mario guy. I haven't, I'm not just, I'm not in general a big Nintendo guy. I haven't really played a lot of Nintendo stuff of late. Um, but the, I think people forget the breadth of what Mario is and everything that's yeah. underneath that massive umbrella. Mm -hmm. It's everything from Mario Kart, all the stuff in Super Smash probably counts uh, to a degree. There's the, there's the thousand year door and the paper stuff. There's the RPG with him and Luigi. There's, of course, the typical platforming. There's the, the galaxy. There's so much stuff that's out there. I mean, the sunshine. It's just, it's a vast array. It's just like Star Wars, all the kinds of things that you could pull from and create. It's even more expansive, in fact. You got so much fuel to work with. It's just up to you to turn it into something worthwhile. Binner into gold. If Bowser is poked, you'll go back to normal because he got hit. Oh, that's what they meant by the poke thing. Yeah, if, if anyone can oh. get to Bowser and like push him or punch him or whatever, he goes back to normal. Which is probably what's going to happen when he's released. Like some someone will release him, push him to the floor, and you'll go ah, pfft, and then you go boo doo 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 doo. You're like yeah, yeah, something will happen. There'll be a magical thing. It, it's, it's it's. I think all of these Mario movies are going to be magic bullshit, and that's going to be the plot. And yep. we're just kind of we're going to be along for the ride, and. Like, I want the stories to be good, and I want the plots to be good, and I really want the characters to be good, but there's a part of me that's kind of consigned to saying, you know, if it's just, like, fun and entertaining and visually interesting, and they do enough with the characters to make me like them, I'll probably just consider that a big win. Um, but, I mean, fingers crossed, they always do more than that, of course. Zelda would be better as a show. Possibly. Yeah, um, maybe. I think so. A really long adventure that allows them to explore so many different places and ideas and things. I yeah, think, I think it would well. like dedicating like one episode, you know, like special episodes to each of like the big cultures of that world, like the different, you know, groups. Cultures or like, dungeons. That could be yeah. Well, yeah, because I could I I think I I think I agree. Um that that might be better suited for a, a TV show, but I'm not sure if they do a show or a, a film. I'm not sure. I, I think I I would be surprised if they didn't do a show because shows are getting you know they they're a big deal. I That's mean, true. So uh, I mean, Star Fox. We've been talking about that. I mean, that game is basically segmented like episodes. Um, different planets, different scenarios for combat, different encounters. Um, it, it would be really cool to get a Star Fox show and see all the cool things that they could do. You know, you get our water, you get the under, you the, the submarine, and then you get the tank, and then you get flying, and then you get the flying, the, oh, but there's a dust storm, or oh no, there's a monster, or, or we're on foot this time, or maybe we get it out like a semi-spooky episode in the dark. I, all sorts of stuff you could do. It's, the, my imagination's the limit. Um, oi, Morley, I've returned from training in the mountains and opened my third eye, and I finally understand the genius behind Iron Man 3. Morley prays? No. The way that he says, <laughs> when someone says third eye and Iron Man 3 in the same sentence, I can't, I can't not think of someone's butthole. It's <laughs> just like, man, that would be. It's, uh, it's a, it's a great film in terms of how it's about it family. Achieved, in terms of destroying destruction. So, yeah, you know, video someday, I'm sure. Well, hey, Mahler, we watched a video, a half-hour video the other day that spoke very positively of Iron Man 3, so you better watch it. There's Iron Man 3 fans out there. there they are. probably couldn't tell you much about it. Oh, if I put out a video shitting on Iron Man 3, I will, I will piss off a lot of people, I think. But that's okay. Is that really like a beloved... Um, it's, it, there's Some plenty of people, people who love it quite a bit. Stand for it, yeah. Some people would like mm. say it's like one of the last good movies in the MCU because it. <laughs> like, you think they're on that like surface level, like level one engagement? Like, oh, look, he's sad. That means he's absolutely. sad. Absolutely, they said like, yeah. it, look, it had like reasonable and actual consequences for the trauma, PTSD. And it's just like, wow. That's a huge, yeah. That's a huge thing we see a lot of the time with like Star Wars and Marvel in particular, like level one engagement. And what you mean by that is you take the film for exactly what it says. 
don't. Yes, it's like I recognize what I'm being told and I am accepting it. There's no like critical thought going on. It's just recognizing essentially. Uh, Shovel Knight is a nine point five out of ten. Fight me. No, I like Shovel. I mean, Knight. I would. I would <laughs> heard a lot about, of good like, things about Shovel Knight. Shovel Knight is really great. Bringy's cousin is in Shovel Knight. Oh, there that's was cool. a there was a plague. I'm pretty sure they got their own like little DLC story, the Plague Knight. That's cool. Yeah. Let the me... um, Fringy, you will be thrilled to know that this uh, season three, the current season of Deep Rock Galactic, the final reward for the season pass is a Plague Doctor mask. Yeah, it's the I it's the like... ultimate level 100. This is the last well, item well. cosmetic you unlock for the season. It's oh, all boy. leading to that. Oh, wow, look at it. he's even green. Yeah, yeah. He, well, I I think it's it's mainly the green is from like the lighting a lot. Of, no, oh, it is green, but like it's often hyper emphasized green because mm -hmm. of course green lighting and a lot of it very dramatic. Yeah. Do you have a bird staff? Do you have a staff with a bird's head on it? I don't you have to a command staff. the birds. No, I, I don't have a staff. Do you hold it up? Flock to me, birds. And then I come. don't. Ca -ca. No. No, not really. No. Worth asking though. Be, Dude, I love Plague Doctors. Plague Doctors are so cool. I love the aesthetic. Uh, More and Rags, what's your favorite guilty pleasure game? We got a question for Fringy as well, but we'll do that one first. Um, so, Guilty pleasure game. Hmm. So I assume this means a game that we know isn't good, but we play it as to just enjoy ourselves. Hmm. Oh, wow. That's actually a tough question because a lot of the times if a game is bad, it's not like bad. It's it's not like a movie like Batman and Robin, right? That's like the ultimate guilty pleasure movie. It's terrible, but I love watching it. It's so corny and, and just magical. But when a game is really bad, you kind of feel it in what you have to play. Yeah, and it makes me think of a um, game that I return to as well, not just like enjoyed when I played it and then... Guilty Oof, someone said game. Bloodborne and it's so funny because it's like... Oh, don't say that. <laughs> So much wrong with Bloodborne, <laughs> but I absolutely um, adore it. Wow, that is legitimately a um, good question. Yeah, because you don't often have guilty pleasure games. If the game's bad and you have to play through the bad game, then it kind of makes it, you know, to where you don't want to play the bad game. There might be, um, it, I might go to, I might say something along the lines of Seven Days to Die, which has a lot of, like, it's like the best worst game, as I've often described it as. There's a lot of things in there that are just kind of weird and don't work, but the combined package, the sum total of all those things working together, is kind of a fun, um, neat little experience. So I might say that as a, a, as a starter kind of an answer, mm. because not a lot of things are really coming to mind right now. Um, uh, so I mentioned Battlefront 2 as well. It's like there's a lot of very badly designed bits in that, but that's true. I yeah, do Battlefront 2 is kind of, yeah, Battlefront 2 is kind of a guilty pleasure game. I'd actually say that game is really poorly designed in a lot of ways. Um, uh, let's see. I of course I of course have my my bi monthly replay of Amnesia Rebirth that I always go through because I just I love it so much. It's so fun. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, typically mm. I yeah, games that are like five out of ten, lots of good, lots of bad, or some of their, you know, parts kind of games. Um, yeah, those are those are the kinds of things that come to mind. I you know, I might even you know, this might be controversial. I might even say Dead Space 3. I have played that game through probably about four times total, less than any of the other Dead Spaces. But it's really not a bad game. It gets a lot of bad rap for reasons we've discussed um, before. But that's sort of on the list of guilty pleasure. Like, I'm not, I'm not miserable when I play through that game. Uh, but sometimes I'm just like, yeah, I'll play through, you know, the Dead Space games that I'll go through. And I'll do the, I, I guess now it'll be I'll play the remake, then I'll play Dead Space 2, then I'll play Dead Space 3, perhaps. And the question um, for Fringy is uh, what do you think of the current civil war in Myanmar and the impact it had on the sale of Burmese teak in the uh, market overall? I don't oh, know yeah. anything about that. Oh. No? All right. Well, I guess that's, I guess that's fair. Mm -hmm. um, good question, though. It is a good question. Uh, what do you guys think of Apple TV Foundation? Mm -hmm. 
it wasn't it as there. bad as I thought it was going to be, but it's um it's the adaptation of, of Asimov's. I think it's oh, a couple wow. of years they old now. That? I think. Yeah, they've got um Lee Pace. No... Is it Lee Pace? Playing, it's the guy um... from uh. Wasn't the guy from Chernobyl? Uh, that British guy he was in it, right? Oh, sorry, I found back. Lee Pace is uh. You talking about the guy who played in, in the Hobbit and Ronan the Accuser? Yes. Lee Pace? Yeah. I believe he plays someone whose name I can't remember. Well. Um, but does a fairly good job. <laughs> Jared it, Howard. It, 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 it's okay. a it's a well produced thing. I mean, it looks very slick um, and impressive. It does play fast and loose with the original story quite a lot. Um, it wasn't as terrible as I was expecting it to be. It's also probably not great. Um, mm. I would have to rewatch it to be more definitive. But I think probably just okay is a baseline reaction to it. Uh. Who would you guys fan cast for the God of War show? I think Liam Cunningham as Mimir would be perfect. Dude, I think you can just cast um, Alistair Duncan, the, the voice actor for him. He's, yeah, might as well. He's definitely someone who could pull it off, especially if he's just a head. <laughs> like, he'll be all right, I think. Uh, as for the rest of it, like casting all the characters, not actually sure. Um, in the case of someone like Odin, for example, you could just keep the, keep the same guy. Um, I need to see the build for the, the Thor guy in real life. I'm not sure. If you need someone else for that, um, and you probably need someone new for Atreus. Yeah, and Kratos is a super difficult, complicated one. To yeah, nail. that's uh, a tough that's one. That's a hard one. Seth Rogen as Brock. No, <laughs> please. It's oh. kind of a. I do. Um, I do find it interesting that in the case of something like God of War, it's like you do have to sit down and figure out, like, could you actually get Christopher Judge for that, or would you have to get someone new right like how do you how do you yeah, it, like what do we do on that one Whereas with white Halo, face, just like... do it well i mean you can whoever's playing the role will be in super makeup totally white because <laughs> it's the ashes of his dead family yeah so oh, yeah um i i'm on board with using judge i just don't know um i'm okay with it too yeah I almost want to do it just for respect, to be honest with you. I guess if he, does he want to does he want to do it again? You know, like oh, he's super on, on board. <laughs> I think he's expressed he's super he? on board yeah. doing the live action Kratos. Yeah, I I, just, I guess I just find it interesting in that case where it is kind of like you need to sort of figure out like what your objectives are and how to work, how to like what you want to do. Whereas with Halo, it's like you could have just gotten Steve down to like do the voice, but you didn't because you, you there was never even on the like, that stroke. We don't need to. Yeah, you, know. you got some guy and he, he kind of sucked. I, I don't. Uh, the problem is, like, I don't know even know what the direction is for that character. Like, I guess that's like, true. Yeah, was he just doing what he was told? Well, so here's, was, here's, the, know... here's the problem. Like, like John Halo, who is he? Like, what does he even believe in? Like, He's that's a real jerk. question. I don't think you could. I don't think you would get the same answer from like anybody if you asked them who he was. And I think most people would even struggle to tell you who he is and what he values. It is like one of the most scattershot characters I've ever seen. Like, in terms of just back and forth, doesn't believe in anything or value anything beyond his own, like, selfish goals. <laughs> and it's totally at the whip of whatever the writers need him to do. John Halo. That show. God damn it. Um... Yeah, he's that, he's that, um... He's like that Elrond slash Durin sort of character who constantly flip-flops between, like, two completely different people based on what the scene sort of needs to happen for a yeah. plot to occur. Well, they're it'll just, be they're like, just walking contradictions. You know, like, he'll be like, we gotta focus on saving humanity, and then, like, ten seconds later, it's back to himself and his own shit. It's, it's incredible. It's just like, yeah, no, I really care about protecting humanity. Do you, though? Is that reflected any of the choices that you make? Sorry. <laughs> back to Since back to Super Chats. Cranky Kong was the original Donkey Kong, confirmed in DK64. What do you think about a DK prequel where Giuseppe saves Pauline from a younger Cranky? I, I don't know if they're doing that. <laughs> I don't I know if I need that. Obviously, it could could be a fun movie. I just, uh, yeah, I don't expect them to do that. Yes. Well, uh, just, maybe they'll do uh, it down the road. Maybe. I don't, well, I don't know if they will, right? Pauline was, the, the like, the mayor of, of New York, right? So, I don't know, like, if there's any history between her and Cranky Kong. But yes, Cranky Kong is original DK, and Donkey Kong is Donkey Kong from Donkey Kong Country. His son. Wait, his son or his grandson? Isn't there a... Because there's um, Donkey Kong Jr. Do you remember that character? Well, go ahead and get out the, the Donkey Kong... The Kong family tree and just pull I, it down. And we'll... Maybe it's on Wikipedia. Um, almost certainly. 
Because because there was Donkey yeah because there was the original Donkey Kong is Cranky Kong, and then there was Donkey Kong Junior and and then the, and then there's just Donkey Kong. Oh yeah, so Donkey Kong Junior is is DK's. So okay, so Donkey Kong. When we're talking about Donkey Kong, we're talking about with the tie. All right, main Donkey Kong who shows up in all of the games and spinoffs and everything. Donkey Kong Junior is his dad, and Cranky Kong is uh is uh donkey kong jr's dad would maybe the, was uh, Do you know why that's confusing to have his dad be donkey kong jr well and then to call the son of donkey kong jr donkey kong yeah like, it was donkey kong and uh, then donkey kong jr which is like of course you would think that jr is the son of course you would well he is, is that was that like a they they look all right oh, wait, i thought you said donkey later. I thought Donkey Kong was the son of Junior, and it was flipped. Or maybe I missed. So the, 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 the order, the order is Cranky Kong, Donkey Kong Junior, Donkey Kong. Okay, yeah, that's confusing. It's I got because, it now. Uh, but, it's because yeah. the the Donkey Kong who appears in Donkey Kong Country, the one with the tie, like the mainline Donkey Kong, as opposed to the one who showed up in uh, the original game Donkey Kong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope All that right. clears it up. Yeah, definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. A user named Hypercharge made an interesting critique on Mario Odyssey. It's 55 minutes, and I'd recommend a watch. Fair enough. Hypercharge. I really like Bill and Franks, and I'm a straight guy. I don't. You don't have to be gay to like a gay relationship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you got past being straight, though. Good stuff. And uh, yeah, it was good shit, so... Uh, I've always wanted to play as Merc's characters in Campaign of the OG. Oh yeah, we were talking about that at the beginning. Yeah, I, yeah. Be cool. Mercenaries characters in the campaign. Uh, watch Dead Sounds Dinosauria on YouTube. Hi, Rex. Hello. I'm not sure what that is, but very well. Uh, thoughts on No Country for Old Men. Love Excellent. it. Excellent. Amazing I movie. Seen it. I haven't seen it. We gotta. That's a. That is a top tier movie. Very good. It is indeed. Uh, watch Rodrigo Souza's Playground on YouTube now. But maybe at some point. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, drag it around to it. Please do a deep dive review of Blue's Big City Adventure 2022. Like Blue, the of Blue's, the Blue's fame. Yeah. Don't know. I don't recognize um, that one. Or is it Bluey? Okay. Bluey. Oh, you know, that's Drew. Australian, Bluey. Australian doggo. Uh, boom, boom, boom. What happens to a fringy when he gets hit by lightning? Same thing that happens to everything else. Oh, that's uh, a storm. One of the yeah. worst <laughs> fucking quotes. <laughs> that's okay. Good. That's okay. It's not <laughs> that bad. Nah, what? I think it's shit. It's absolute <laughs> shit. Doesn't even make sense, <laughs> Rags. Not everything How actually like... does react that way when hit by lightning. Yeah, but maybe, like, they're setting up this, like, idea that it's gonna be a particular answer, but it's like, nah, just, you know, lightning stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Fireflower That's not good. That's not right good. There. I'm not defending, That's I just, I, I don't think it's good. Bat cave. Yeah. <laughs> Fireflower Peach has no ponytail, zero out of ten. You know what, let's fail. Uh, is that, I actually don't remember what the, is that, does she normally have the ponytail with the, oh yeah, she does, doesn't she? Oh yeah. I don't, I, that, what, does, that does negatively have, affect the entire movie, I agree. Could have apparated like a ponytail. <laughs> like a... <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, when my six-year-old nephew said Mario, he said he liked it, or saw it, sorry, uh, but I didn't get why Mario got small and got big again, but when Bowser got small, he didn't get big again. I said, that's what we call a plot hole. No, you have to. You got to get a mushroom. You got to get oh, hit out of the, being small. Hit out of yeah. exactly. And you, like Bowser's put in a cage, he doesn't get hit out of it. He will be hit out of it when he's released. Don't worry, it'll happen. Yeah. They should put him in a padded cell. He's yeah, constantly he trying to hit himself, <laughs> like punch himself. <laughs> yeah. To to get big again. <laughs> Uh, I don't think Crobcat was saying RE4 Remake was bad. He was saying it's lacking unique details. A good example is original Total Recall versus Remake. Hi, puppy. That's still wrong. Hey! Yeah. It, um, the, it's very clever of the comparison to show all of the details it didn't carry over and then not show any of its own unique details, isn't it? For example... The, the title was very clear. Soul versus Soulless. Absolutely. And you have... Um, the detail of Luis being with Leon in several elements of adventure, 
all the little interactions they have, but also if you defeat the two gonna, um, El Gigantes before he can get the, like, dynamite to you, he says, like, oh, shit, man, you didn't leave any for me. It's like, that's a cool detail that's not in the OG game. Guess which one's soulless now? I'm saying I mean, it's a very death unfair scene comparison. Oh, so good. <laughs> yeah. How do you look at Luis's death scene and be like, yeah, this is soulless? I don't know. I don't know. I don't I get it. it. It's crazy. Uh, what movies why have you all on? walked out on and why? I've never walked out on a movie. I've never walked out on a movie. Neither. The closest I ever came was Where the Wild Things Are. The uh, closest I came was Interstellar, I think. Ooh. Oh, wasn't it John Wick 2? No, John Wick 2 is like number two, I think. <laughs> I don't know I if I've ever... If there's a film that is so bad it makes me want to walk out from it, the odds are I'm going to spend more time with that film than anything else. Like Avatar The Way of Water. It took me four days to watch that film. <laughs> Didn't want to, but did it. <laughs> took us two days to watch Interstellar, right, guys? <laughs> yeah. It was good times. Oh, it did. Shit. Yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can imagine watching Avatar 2 over the course of four days being like, oh, maybe something will happen today. Maybe. Um, and it, and it, 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 well, when it did, it was it made it all worse. But hell, it produced a very long script, so it, there's that to be indeed. said for it. Uh, have you? Oh, have you seen slash? What is your opinion on Babylon Five? I assume I'm the only one who's seen that here. I haven't seen it. I uh, have not. I've heard it's pretty good. Yeah, I'd say it's an excellent show. It does a lot of really cool stuff. It's seminal for a lot of. It probably inspired a shit ton of media going forward. Very good stuff. If you're craving for a long form. A uh, sci-fi show that covers a whole bunch of characters going on significant journeys that has like big old politics and uh, social issues having been dealt with. That's that's the show for you. Go check it out. Full recommendation. I have only saw it through the once. I probably should go again. Some the complete thing to say. If an MCU movie had a character acting out of character, but then the next movie revealed to be a scroll in a way that made perfect sense, would the score of the first movie retroactively go up? No. That needs to be within the story being told as is told, that movie would still lack that kind of context, right? Instead of uh, them as... What you would say is, the is movies this... together make a make a score slash package, but that movie on its own lacks components. In the same way that you're like, you know, um, bonus information to explain something in a particular... Because each of these movies still They're have a start, tweet. middle, finish. Even, even like Lord of the Rings, uh, each of the individual films still have beginnings and endings. So... Um, yeah, if it like fucks the entire narrative to not know a piece of information that then gets added in, there's still like an element of it would, like I said, it makes the overall story smoother, but that one when it's uh, watched on its own would still have that problem. Yeah, you you essentially create scenarios where, like, films could always be made really good, like retroactively by just adding extra information onto it. By the way, I'm not against doing it, though. Like, I would do the fuck out of that if I was making newer Star Wars movies. Yeah, not necessarily bad at all. Try and, try and repair, you know, recontextualize. A lot of the time, though, you're trying to not do it in a way that you, like, completely change everything with no hints. You try and try and blend it in a bit. Try and be like, oh, it was, it was actually kind of this. And if you think about this, 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 yeah, you kind of... Mm -hmm. your, your parents were actually the grandchildren of Palpatine. There so you go, makes sense. that, yeah. Um, I know someone working on Apple Foundation review. From what I know, it's pretty bad with some glimmers of good. All right. What are your fondest memories of Batwoman season one? It might be. Is it episode two where she goes down and swims down to the van and it explodes? Oh, that's really high tier. Um, that was funny as fuck. We've got that that underwater explosion. Her getting hit by the truck on the motorcycle. Mm -hmm. We have the. I mean, the highlight you? would be when she kills Flanders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the one good scene in the entire show with yeah, Luke that. and that one guy before the plot sniper shows up. <laughs> um, a lot of the skin creepy skin man scenes yep. are kind of funny and memorable. Um, oh, like anytime we're Alice out of gets cream. captured. Rat of cream, yeah. And, and we're, he, Kevin ran out of jelly beans. <laughs> that was the fucking. That was the old lady after she Kevin fell down the stairs. Beans. He ran out of jelly beans. Oh, that's is that second season? Because that's think, Ryan getting. Yeah, I think that's right? that's not that's not Kate Kane's. So there you go. <sighs> Plenty of good um, moments. Yeah, I think the cream thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of funny moments. 
Unfortunately, I think I think shoot the bats. That was in second season, right? That was started. I second think season? that was second season. That's another legendary moment. Yeah. yeah. Oh, shoot the bats with the shotgun. Shoot them bats. Oh man. Uh, the new Lego City Adventures is honestly the best official Lego show that's come out. You should watch the first episode. It's really funny. Huh. Hmm. Maybe. 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 Uh, love you guys. If channel recommendations are not allowed, don't read the next donation if they are. Thank you. Everyone should watch Lackadaisy. In this age of just garbage from the mainstream, these indie projects deserve the money and time. It already hits its goals. I'd recommend supporting the Patreon. Um, their three-year journey working from home to bring the amazing pilot to life and hopefully the comic. I hope they get picked up by A24. Well, they, uh, if, it's uh, like a... An animated 1920s um, anthropomorphic animal kind of movie. It looks oh, okay. pretty neat. I haven't seen it, but yeah. I know I've seen it. some of it. The animation and art looks great. Um, yeah, it's another one of these cool, like, independent animation projects. Sounds cool. Uh, I mostly wanted to mess with Fringy, so I'll ask him now. Favorite guilty pleasure game? Mine is Sonic Adventure 2. Okay, so yeah. Favorite Fringy. guilty pleasure game? Um... Hmm... Um, I'm just thinking, uh, I don't know. I don't know what that would be. I don't oh. know. Well, if you I, think about it for a little bit, we can do, uh, cause that's the I, last uh, one, so we can do some outros while you think about it. I mean, I enjoyed Modern Warfare 3, and I played that a, a fair deal, and I don't think that game's particularly great. Maybe Modern, War Modern Warfare 2 doesn't feel like that, though, because I really... Like, <laughs> I, uh, maybe shit. Modern Warfare 3. Huh? The multiplayer of Modern Warfare 2 was, like, abysmally bad, but... Yeah, but I love it. That just sort of become its <laughs> thing. Like, it, it, we all know that this is, this is horse shit, and we're just in this grinder together. There's a reason why, like, <laughs> nothing from that game, like, came back. They changed so much about everything. Yeah. Like, Commando Pro, it. we're not doing that again. One Man Army, not doing that again. Guns with, like, no recoil. <laughs> nah, oh. Like, all, so much got changed. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love it. I love it, though. Maybe, yeah, maybe Call of Duty broadly. But then again, I haven't played Call of Duty, like, much over the last how many years. Mm -hmm. Nah. Um, anyone looking forward to Barbie the movie? Also, High Rags. Um, kind of. I'm curious. A vague interest. Yeah. Vague interest, yeah. Could be interesting. Um, and on that note, that kind of wraps up the podcast. But first, hey. I should say thank you so much, Lil Platoon, for joining us this yeah. wonderful adventure. Thank Why you so you much for having me back on. Absolutely. Sorry I was a bit sleepy, but I'm starting to wake up finally. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it was great fun. Would you like to tell the audience what it is you're up to, what's come out since you were last here, and what they should go and watch right now? Oh, goodness. Um... Yeah, go go watch uh, Tetris right now, obviously. But mm -hmm. of my things, um, I don't know. But God, loads of rubbish came out since I was last <laughs> on. So there, there's stuff on the channel. At the moment, um, I've started a live show on Monday nights uh, with a guy called The Movies In It, who's really nice. Um, so that's sort of 10 p.m. my time. Uh, that's like 5 p.m. Eastern. All of you guys are more than welcome to come on if you ever find yourself with a spare evening. Um, Video-wise, I'm working on a big Mandalorian season three thing. So, oh dear. yeah, <laughs> uh, another couple of weeks of pain, and then then that will be out. But it is quite good fun. It, it's an entertaining watch, I think. I no, I've been entertained. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it um, brings us joy. Absolutely, and yeah, and you've got you've got breakdowns for uh, Avatar and uh, Ant Man. Um, yeah, Ant Man hmm. was the penultimate one. So, yeah, Mario is the most recent one. Ant Man before that, I'd actually remember what the one before that was. But yeah, Avatar is, is probably the longest one, I think, that's on there. And then just, yeah, and any other given thing that might be there. It's all on the channel somewhere. I've just lost track of where I am. Oh, yeah. Um, link in description, plenty to check out. Full platoon, always a pleasure. Much obliged. As for EFAP, you've got yourselves more Mando on the way. Um, next one shall very much be soon enough. We've Very decided sad. to halt Gotham Knights until Mando's done, and then that'll come out after that, and then after that, and so on. More updates as time goes on, but yeah, we don't we don't want everyone to get confused with the two <laughs> complex plot lines of Mandalorian and Gotham Knights running side by side. It's you gotta take one show at a time, or you'll get lost. It's very intricate and complex. 
I mean, the real truth is we just give him some more time for editors to get work done, you know? Because <laughs> I was going to say, meanwhile, all that's happening. Work is being done for videos. Lots of yeah. things yep. on the way. Yep. Can't wait to tell you all about them. Um, I'm tired. <laughs> but other than that, I suppose, that's, that's, that's about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Last one says, a coin for Super Mario. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed the uh, little chat we had about three of these movies. Go check out one of them. Maybe check out one of them. And do not check out one of them. A fun trifecta. Uh, thank you so much for keeping us company. Thank you for the kind donations and the messages. As for now, though, we shall bid you good night. And see you next time. Good Bye. Goodbye, yeah. everybody. Bye. Toodaloo. Woohoo! Yahoo. <laughs>